Preface of The Story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2021. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole, Professor of Arabic at Trinity College, Dublin. He who hath not seen Cairo hath not seen the world. Her soil is gold, her Nile is a marvel, her women are as the bright-eyed houris of paradise, her houses are palaces, and her air is soft, with an odour above aloes, refreshing the heart. And how should Cairo be otherwise, when she is the mother of the world? Preface Cairo is in the fullest sense a medieval city. It had no existence before the Middle Ages. Its vigorous life as a separate metropolis almost coincides with the arbitrary millennium of the middle period of history, and it still retains to this day much of its medieval character and aspect. The aspect is changing, but not the life. The amazing improvements of the past twenty years have altered the Egyptian's material condition, but scarcely as yet touched his character. We have given him public order and security, solvency without too heavy taxation, an efficient administration, even-handed justice, the means of higher education, and above all to every man his fair share of the enriching Nile, Chrysoris in the truest sense, without which nothing else avails. For all these, and especially the last, the peasant is grateful in his way, when their merits are pointed out to him, but not so the Kyrene. The immediate blessings of the irrigation engineer are not so prominently brought to bear upon his pressing wants, and for the other reforms of the Phyrengi he cares very little. I should be sorry to draw any discourteous comparisons with the Ethiop, but whatever time and association with Europeans may do for the comely, and to my taste not too swarthy, skin of my Cairo friend, I am convinced that he will keep his old, unregenerate medieval heart in spite of us all. Happily for purposes of study, I am not treating of ethics, the East changes very slowly, and the soul of the Eastern not at all. The Cairo jeweller who will chaffer with you for an hour over a few piastres, though he mixes reluctantly, shrinkingly, in the crazy, bustling twentieth-century life of Europe that rushes past him, is not of it. In his heart of hearts he looks back longingly to the glorious old days of the Mamluks, to which he essentially belongs, and regrets the excitements of those stirring times. What good, he asks, comes of all this worry? Justice? More often a man had need of a little injustice, and a respectable tradesman could usually buy that from the Cadi before these new tribunals were set up. As to fixed taxes and no extortion, that is chiefly a matter for the stupid Felachin, and after all, the old system worked beautifully when you shirked payment and your neighbour was bastinadoed for your share. Then, all this fiddling with water and drains and streets, what is it all for? When Wilcox or Price Bay have put pipes and patent traps and other godless improvements into the mosques, Will one's prayers be any better than they were in the pleasant, pervasive odour of the old, fetid tanks? The streets are broader, no doubt, to let the Firenges, Allah blacken their faces, roll by in their two-horsed Arabias and splash the faithful with mud, but for this wonderful boon they have taken away the comfortable stone benches from before the shops, and the Cairo tradesman misses his old seat, where unlimited caif and the meditative shibuk once whiled away the leisure of his never-pressing avocations. No, pure water and drains, and bicycles and tram-cars, 
and a whole array of wretched little black-coated effendies pretending to imitate the kafirs may be all very well in their place but they are ugly uninteresting things and life at cairo has been desperately dull since they came in in one of the suggestive essays in his delightful book on asia and europe mr meredith townsend has shown how interesting life must have been in india before england introduced order and all the virtues the picture might have been drawn in cairo with trifling alterations life undoubtedly was interesting in the old unregenerate days there were events then something to see and think of and possibly fly from plenty of blood and assassination perhaps but then you could always shut and bar the strong gates of the quarter when the mamluks or the berbers or worst of all the black sudanese were on the war-path now the gates are taken away and there are no cavalcades of romantic troopers beautiful to behold in their array to ravish your household and give colour to life in those days it was possible for any man of brain and luck to rise to power and wealth such wealth as all cairo could not furnish in these blank and honest times promotion was ever at hand and the way was open to the strong the cunning and the rich what were a holocaust of victims an orgy of rapine even the deadly ravages of periodical plague and famine in comparison with the great occasions the gorgeous pomp the endless opportunities the infinite variety of those unruly and tumultuous but never tedious days this is what the true kyrene meditates in his heart his ideas for good or ill are not as our ideas they date back from the middle ages like his dress his religion his social habits his turns of speech his calm insouciance his impenetrable reserve his inveterate negation of worry outside the official class he is still the same man whom we saw keeping shop or taking his venture to see in the faithful mirror of the arabian nights even his city preserves its medieval tone much has been destroyed by time or innovation but the european fringe is still a fringe and the old muslim city for the present defies western influences it has been rebuilt time after time and every fresh rebuilding will take away more of its charm but enough remains to show us what cairo was five hundred years ago the crowded streets of the old quarters the immemorial character of the houses and markets above all the historical monuments carry us back to the middle ages the aim of these pages is to close the vestiges of the medieval city with the associations that lend them their deepest interest many of the buildings of cairo especially the later mosques of the mamluk period are exquisitely beautiful and may be admired as works of art without regard to their history but there are many more ruined courts crumbling arcades mere fragments of walls or inscriptions which appeal rather to the archaeological than the aesthetic sense and must be almost meaningless until their story is revealed in tracing the growth of cairo i have tried to surround the remains of its buildings with the atmosphere of their historic associations mere topography has charms for the antiquary alone it is only when the material growth of a city is interwoven with the life of its people and the character of its rulers that topography acquires an interest for all at the same time i have sought to keep closely to the subject the growth and life of the city this is no general history of egypt and many things are passed by because they bear no intimate relation to the development of its capital the authorities upon which i rely are sufficiently cited in the footnotes the greatest arabic source is of course the elaborate kitat of el makrizi frequently referred to as the topographer 
who wrote in the early years of the fifteenth century but used various topographical and historical works of much earlier date many of which are not otherwise accessible the remarkable accuracy completeness and research of his detailed description of cairo need no praise of mine they are universally recognized other writers such as el masudi nasir e kusrau abd el latif ibn gubea the extracts from whom i owe to the kindness of my friend mr gilu strange the historian of baghdad and our most learned authority on the geography of the caliphate ibn said ibn dukmak es suyuti abu el mahasin el ishaki el gabarti fill up the picture and add valuable personal and contemporary touches lane's cairo fifty years ago has the merit of presenting an account of the city as it was in eighteen thirty five before the europeanizing movement begun by mohammed ali and carried to the extreme by ismail had had time to work much change in the characteristic aspect of the town in archaeology i am especially beholden to the researches of m max von berchem raves and casanova one exception i must note to the generally full references to my sources there is something repugnant if not to modesty at least to the sense of propriety in frequently citing one's own books writing constantly on the subject of cairo its art its monuments and its history for many years past it was inevitable that i should sometimes repeat what i have said before indeed when we have written what we have to say in the best shape that we are able to devise it seems mere affectation to try to seek a different form of expression i have therefore quoted but sparingly from my art of the saracens in egypt published for the committee of council in eighteen eighty six my cairo sketches third edition virtue eighteen ninety eight my history of egypt in the middle ages methuen nineteen o one and any extracts to which no footnote is appended must be understood to refer to one of these books generally the history i trust i may be permitted to say that for a more complete account of the history than would be possible or desirable in the present volume the student should consult the last of the three books above cited were there any other work in english of similar scope i would gladly substitute its title for a much more detailed narrative of the history of the copts than could be here included the reader may turn to mrs butcher's story of the church of egypt two volumes smith elder and co eighteen ninety seven a work full of sympathy and appreciation for a neglected and persecuted community though open to criticism in its mohammedan relations i have not troubled the reader with an elaborate system of transliteration of arabic names an acute accent is used merely to show where the principal accent falls not necessarily to indicate a long vowel the vowels are to be pronounced as in italian and the letter g is employed to represent the arabic consonant that in cairo is pronounced hard as in get but elsewhere usually soft as j in jet those who are curious to know the exact transliteration should turn to the index where every arabic word is given in roman letters with diacritical points and distinction of the long vowels the illustrations have been chosen with a view to showing the medieval city as far as possible before it suffered its european change nothing could be better for this purpose than the drawings made between eighteen twenty six and eighteen thirty eight by robert hay of linplum and by his companion owen b carter about eighteen thirty the originals of which are preserved in the print room of the british museum and some were lithographed in hay's illustrations of cairo these represent the medieval remains as no modern sketches could depict them but mr j a symington has skilfully supplemented them 
when no older drawings could be obtained in conclusion i should wish to draw attention to what i have said in the last chapter on the subject of the commission for the preservation of the monuments of arab art to its vigilance and unremitting labors during the past twenty years we owe the fact that the mosques and other remains of saracenic architecture are secure from demolition and as far as the conditions admit guarded from decay never in the history of cairo have its monuments been in such safe keeping and every one must be grateful to each member of this invaluable committee in the last five years since lord cromer used his influence to improve its financial position the commission has been enabled to undertake very comprehensive works of scientific restoration and all who visit cairo should make a point of examining the results of its labors and inspecting the collections gathered under the care of its chief architect hers bay in the museum of arab art stanley lane pool trinity college dublin january thirty first nineteen o two End of preface Section 1 of the Story of Cairo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole Section 1 Chapter 1 The Two Cities Part 1 there are two Cairos, distinct in character, though but slenderly divided in sight. There is a European Cairo, and there is an Egyptian Cairo. The last was once El Cahira, the victorious, founded under the auspices of the planet Mars. But it is now so little conquering, indeed has become so subdued, that one hears it spoken of as the native quarters, or even in Indian fashion as the bazaars. In truth, European Cairo knows little of its medieval sister. Thousands of tourists, mounted on thousands of donkeys, do indeed explore the native quarters every winter, but these do not belong to European Cairo. Birds of passage they are, not inhabitants. The true resident who has his cool shaded house and breezy balcony in the Ismailia quarter surrounded by hundreds of similar comfortable villas, does not by any chance ride donkeys, and is only dragged to the bazaars, rarely, and with obvious reluctance, by the importunity of some enthusiastic visitor. But even in European Cairo, there are signs that another Cairo, an Oriental, Muslim Cairo, exists not far away. Let the English colony keep never so closely to itself and ignore the native quarters, except as objects for just government and wise reforms. It cannot walk abroad or even open its ears in its own chambers without becoming conscious of the true oriental world in which it lives but of which it is not. Go to the post office, a few minutes' walk from most of the hotels, and you are at once in a medley of east and west. A German nursemaid, accompanied by the little daughter of the family, is asking for letters at the arrivée window, and an old sheikh in a kaftan and turban is negotiating a money order or a registered letter at the next bureau. Over the way a row of public letter writers sit at their tables on the sideway, gravely imperturbable, awaiting illiterate correspondence. In the streets, omnibuses and tram cars rumble by, blowing strident horns. But the passengers who sit on the seats beneath the awning are not Europeans. They are Egyptians, Effendis, clerks, shopkeepers, sheikhs, often simple fellahin, come to town on business, and driving in from Bulak or Kash and Nil. On the footpaths, always uneven and often muddy, in curious contrast to the roads, which are kept clean by circular brushes of little girl scavengers, the European element, Greek, German, Italian chiefly, is intimately blended with the Oriental. Sudani women, closely veiled with the white burko, 
which sets off their swarthy brows and black eyes to advantage. Egyptian girls in blue gowns and black veils hanging loose and allowing the well-formed neck and line of cheek and chin to be seen, whilst concealing the only part a woman scrupulously hides in the east, her mouth. Horrible, blear-eyed old harridans, veiled with immaculate precision, squatting in rows against the house fronts. Bedouis, striding along in the roadway with their striped kufiya wound round their heads. String of camels tied together, laden with Bersim, the rich father of Egypt, and driven by the smallest of urchins. Petty government clerks or effendis, clad in Stambouli and Tarbouche, hunched up on donkey back. All classes and ages and sexes mingled together in a jostling, perspiring, but good-tempered crowd, and everywhere the pungent, pervasive odor of the East. Even in the European quarters, you still meet the veritable eastern sights and sounds. As you look out of your hotel window, you will see a native musician sauntering by, twanging the lutes of the country. Then a sound like the tinkling of baby cymbals informs you that the Sherbetli is going his round, with his huge glass jar slung at his side, from which he dispenses, to the unwary, sweet sticky drinks of licorice juice or orange syrup in the brass saucers which he clinks unceasingly in his hand. Late at night sounds of eastern life invade your pillow. The rumble of a distant drum tells you that a wedding party is perambulating the streets, and if you have the curiosity to sally forth, you will be rewarded by one of the characteristic sights of Cairo, in which all the new are oddly blended. Probably a circumcision festival is combined with the wedding to save expense, and the procession will be headed by the barber's sign, a wooden frame raised aloft, followed by two or three gorgeously caparisoned camels, regular stage properties hired out for such occasions carrying drummers and leading the way for a series of carriages crammed with little boys, each holding a neat white handkerchief to his mouth to keep out the devil and the evil eye. Then comes a closed carriage, covered all over with a big Kashmir shawl, held down firmly at the sides by brothers and other relations of the imprisoned bride. Then more carriages and a general crowd of sympathizers. More rarely, the bride is born in a cashmere-covered litter swung between two camels fore and aft. The hind camel must tuck his head under the litter and is probably quite as uncomfortable as the bride, who runs a fair chance of seasickness in her rolling palanquin. In the old days, the bride walked through the streets under a canopy carried by her friends, but this is now quite out of fashion and European carriages are rapidly ousting even the camel litters. But the Kashmir shawl and the veil will not soon be abandoned. The Egyptian woman is, at least in public, generally modest. She detects a stranger's glance with magical rapidity, even when to all appearance looking the other way, and forthwith the veil is pulled closer over her mouth and nose. When she meets you face to face, she does not drop her big eyes in the absurd fashion of Western modesty. She slowly turns them away from you. It is annihilating. As soon as you have turned your back on the European suburb and the hotel region and escaped from the glass shop fronts and Greek dealers of the Muski, the real Eastern city begins to dominate you. It is quite easy to lose oneself in the quaint old streets of Muslim Cairo when only an occasional passerby reminds one that Europe is at the gates. A large part of Cairo is very little spoilt. It is still in a great degree the city of the Arabian Nights. In that stall round the corner, who knows but that the immortal barber is recounting the adventures of his luckless brothers to the impatient lover on the shaving stool. At this very moment, the three royal mendicants may be entertaining the fair portress and her delightful sisters with the story of their calamities. And if you wait till night, you may even see the good Harun al-Rashid himself, though it is true he lived at Baghdad, coming on his stealthy midnight rambles with prudent Gafar at his heels 
and Black Masrur to clear the way. A few streets away from the European quarters, it is easy to dream that we are acting a part in the moving histories of the Thousand and One Nights, which do in fact describe Cairo and its people as they were in the Middle Ages, and as they are in a great measure still. In its very dilapidation the city assists the illusion. The typical eastern houses falling to ruins, which no one thinks of repairing, are the natural homes of ifrits and mischievous jinn who keep away good-fearing tenants. But if in its ruined houses, far more in what remains of its glorious monuments, does Cairo transport us to the golden age of Arabian art and culture. Among its mosques and colleges, and the scanty remains of its palaces, are the purest examples of Saracenic architecture that can be seen in all the once white empire of Islam. Damascus and Isfahan, Agra and Delhi, Cordova and Granada, Prusa and Constantinople, possess elements of beauty and features of style which Cairo has not, and they enlarge and complete our understanding of Arab art. But to view that art in its purity, uncorrupted by the mechanical detail of the Alhambra, unspoiled by the over-elaboration of Delhi, we must study the mosques and tombs of Cairo. The blessed conservatism of the East has happily maintained much of the old city in its beautiful, ruinous, and progressive disorder. There are, of course, new houses and rebuilt fronts and even glass window sashes. The exquisite mashrabiyas with their intricate turned latticework are nearly all gone to make way for Italian persienne, and the stone benches in front of the shops have disappeared in deference to the modern exigencies of carriages. But the general aspect of the streets has not seriously altered in recent years, and the people who press through the crowded lanes or sit in their little cells of shops at the receipt of custom are unchanged. They dress as their ancestors dressed ages ago. Their ideas and education are much what they always were, though the new schools are gradually infusing more modern notions. They are still as calm and easygoing and procrastinating as ever. The only conspicuous change is the dethronement of the time-honored shibuk, the long pipe of meditation and stately leisure and asphodel and moly, and all that is implied in the ineffable dreamland of Kaif, in favor of the restless, undignified cigarette. But nargilas and coconut pipes for hashish are still in full play among the lower classes. The tradespeople are the conservative element in Egypt as everywhere else. The upper classes are becoming every year less oriental in outward appearance and habits. They dance with quote-unquote infidel ladies, wear frank clothes, and delight in the little French pieces played in the Esbekia garden. Even their national coffee cups are made in Europe, and save for the red tarbouche, and certain mental and moral idiosyncrasies difficult to eliminate and unnecessary to describe, the Egyptian gentleman might almost pass muster in a Parisian crowd. It is the tradesman who recalls the past, keeps up the old traditions, and walks in the old paths. The course of the world runs slowly in the working east, and the Kyrene shopkeeper has placidly stood still, whilst the Western world joined in the everlasting move-on of modern civilization. We shall find this standstill mortal in one of the main thoroughfares of the city. Leaving the European quarter behind, and taking little note of the Greek and Italian shops in the renovated Muski, we turn off to the right into the Ruria, one of those larger but still narrow streets which are distinguished with the name of Sharia or thoroughfare. Such a street is lined on either side with little box-like shops which form an unbroken boundary on either hand, except where a mosque door or a public fountain or the entrance to another street interrupts for a brief space the row of stores. None of the private doors or windows we are accustomed to in Europe breaks the line of shops. For a considerable distance all the traders deal in the same commodity, 
be it sugar plums or slippers. The system has its advantages, for if one dealer be too dear, the next may be cheap, and the competition of many contiguous salesmen brings about a salutary reduction in prices. On the other hand, it must be allowed that it is fatiguing to have to order your coat in half a dozen different places, to buy the cloth in one direction, the buttons in another, the braid in a third, the lining in a fourth, the thread in a fifth, and then have to go to quite another place to find a tailor to cut it out and sew it together. And as each dealer has to be bargained with, and generally smoked with, if not coffeeed with, if you get your coat ordered in a single morning, you may count yourself expeditious. In one of these little cupboards that do duty for shops, we may or may not find the typical tradesman we are seeking. It may chance that he has gone to say his prayers, or to see a friend, or perhaps he did not feel inclined for business today, in which case the folding shutters of his shop will be closed, and as he does not live anywhere near, and as if he did, there is no bell, no private door, and no assistant, we may wait there forever, as far as he is concerned, and get no answer to our inquiries. His neighbor next door, however, will obligingly inform us that the excellent man whom we are seeking has gone to the mosque, and we accordingly betake ourselves to our informer and make his acquaintance instead. Our new friend is sitting in a recess some five feet square and rather more than six feet high, raised a foot or two from the ground. And within this narrow compass he has collected all the wares he thinks he is likely to sell, and has also reserved room for himself and his customers to sit down and smoke cigarettes while they bargain. Of course his stock must be very limited, but then all his neighbors are ready to help him, and if you cannot find what you want within the compass of his four walls, he will leave you with a cigarette and a cup of coffee, or perhaps Parisian tea in a tumbler, while he goes to find the desideratum among the wares of his colleagues round about. Meanwhile, you drink your scalding aromatic coffee and watch the throng that passes by. The ungainly camels, laden with brushwood or green fodder, which seems to threaten to sweep everything and everybody out of the street. The respectable townspeople, mounted on gray or brown asses, ambling along contentedly, save when an unusually severe blow from the inhuman donkey boy running behind makes their beasts swerve incontinently to the right or left, as though they had a hinge in their middle. The grandees in their two-horse carriages preceded by breathless runners who clear the way for their masters with shrill shouts, Shemal, ya walid! To thy left, O boy! Yaminik, ya sit! To thy right, O lady! Efta hainak, ya am! Open then eye, O uncle! And the like. The women with trays of eatables on their heads, the water carrier with goat skin under arm, and the vast multitude of blue-robed men and women who have something or other to do which takes them indeed along the street, but does not take them very hurriedly. In spite of the apparent rush and crush, the crowd moves slowly like everything else in the East. Our friend returns with a desired article. We approve it guardedly and with cautious tentative aspect demand... How much? The answer is always at least twice the fair price. We reply first by exclaiming, I seek refuge with God, from exorbitance, and then by offering about half the fair price. The dealer shakes his head, looks disappointed with us, shows he expected better sense in people of our appearance, puts aside his goods, and sits down to another cigarette. After a second ineffectual bid, we summon our donkey and prepare to mount. At this moment the shopman relents and reduces his price, but we are obdurate and begin riding away. He pursues us, agrees almost to our terms. We return, pay, receive our purchase, commend him to the protection of God, and wend our way on. But if, instead of going on, we accompany our late antagonist in the bargain to his own home, 
We shall see what a middle-class Kyrene house is like. Indeed, a middle-class dwelling in Cairo may sometimes chance to be a palace, for the modern Pasha despises the noble mansions that were the pride and delight of better men than he in the good old days of the Mamluks, and prefers to live in shadeless route number 29 or thereabouts in the modern bricklayer's paradise known as the Ismailia Quarter. And hence the tradesmen may sometimes occupy the house where the great bay of former times held his state and marshaled his retainers when he prepared to strike a blow for the precarious throne that was always at the command of the strongest battalions. But all Kyrene houses in the old style are very much alike. They differ only in size and in the richness or poverty of the decoration. And if our merchant's house is better than most of its neighbors, we have but to subtract a few of the statelier rooms and reduce the scale of the others to obtain a fair idea of the houses on either hand and round about. The street we now enter is quite different from that we have left. We have been doing our shopping in the busy, cheap side of Cairo, and in full view of the lofty facade of the mosque of the Mamluk Sultan al muayyad Its two minarets stand upon a fine old gate called Bab Zawila, or commonly Zuwayla, which people nowadays generally prefer to call the Bab al mutawalli because it is believed to be a favorite resort of the mysterious Qutb al-Mutawalli, or Pope, for the time being, of all the saints. This very holy personage is gifted with powers of invisibility and of instantaneous change of place. He flies unseen from the top of the Kaaba at Mecca to the Bab Zuwayla, and there reposes in a niche behind the wooden door. True believers tell their beads as they pass the niche and the curious peep in to see if the saint be there. And if you have a headache, there is no better cure than to drive a nail into the door, while a sure remedy for the toothache is to pull out the tooth and hang it up on the same venerated spot. Perhaps pulling the tooth out might of itself cure the ache, but the suggestion savors of impiety, and at any rate it is safer to fix the molar up. The door bristles with unpleasant votive offerings of this sort, and if they were all successful, the Qutb must be an excellent doctor. The street thus barred by the Babzuela is for Cairo a broad one, and shops, mosques, wikalas, or caravanserais, and fountains form its boundaries. In complete contrast, the street we are now to enter, as we turn down a by-lane and then wheel sharply to the left, has no shops, though there is a little mosque, probably the tomb of a venerated saint at the corner. Its broad bands of red and white relieve the deep shadows of the lane, each side of which is composed of the tall backs of houses, with nothing to vary the whitewashed walls except the closely grated windows. On either hand, still narrower alleys open off, sometimes mere cul-de-sac, but often threading the city for a considerable distance. In these solitary courts we may still see the mashrabiyas, which are becoming so rare in the more frequented thoroughfares. The best lattices are reserved for the interior windows of the house, which look on the inner court or garden but there are not a few streets in Cairo where the passenger still stops to admire tier upon tier and row after row of mashrabiyas, which give a singular picturesque appearance to the houses. The name is derived from the root which means to drink, which occurs in sherbet, and is applied to lattice windows because the porous water bottles are often placed in them to cool. Frequently there is a little semicircular niche projecting out of the middle of the lattice for the reception of a kula or carafe. The delicately turned knobs and balls by which the patterns of the lattice work are formed are sufficiently near together to conceal whatever passes within from the inquisitive eyes of opposite neighbors, and yet there is enough space between them to allow free access of air. A mashrabiya is indeed a cooling place for human beings as well as water jars, and at once a convent grating and a spying place for the woman of the harem, 
who can watch their loveless through the meshes of the windows without being seen in return. Yet there are convenient little doors that open in the latticework if the inmates choose to be seen even as they see, and the fair ladies of Cairo are not always above the pardonable vanity of letting a passerby discover that they are fair. In one of those by-lanes we stop before an arched doorway and tie our donkey to the ring beside it. The door is a study in itself. The upper part is surrounded by arabesque patterns, which form a square decoration above it, often very tasteful in the case of the older doorways. Sometimes the wooden door itself has arabesques on it, and the inscription, God is the Creator, the Eternal, which is a charm against sickness and demons and the evil eye, and also serves as a memento mori to the master of the house whenever he comes home. There is no bell, for the prophet declared that a bell is the devil's musical instrument, and that where a bell is the angels do not resort, and sometimes there is no knocker, so we batter upon the door with our stick or fist. It generally takes several knockings to make oneself heard, but this is not a land where people hurry over much. Did not our Lord Muhammad, upon whom be peace, say that haste came from the devil? So we conform to the ways of the land and console ourselves with the antithetic text, God is with the patient. At last a fumbling sound is heard on the other side. The doorkeeper is endeavoring to fit a stick with little wire pins arranged upon it in a certain order, into corresponding holes bored at the end of a deep mortise in the sliding bolt of the door. These are the keys and lock of Cairo. The sliding bolt runs through a wooden staple on the door into a slot in the jam. When it is home, certain movable pins drop down from the staple into the holes in the sliding bolt and prevent it from being drawn back. The introduction of the key with pins corresponding to the holes in the bolt lifts the movable pins and permits the bolt to be slidden back. Nothing could be clumsier or more easy to pick. A piece of wax at the end of a stick will at once reveal the position of the pins, and the rest is simple. Within is a passage which bends sharply after the first yard or two, and bars any view into the interior from the open door. At the end of this passage we emerge into an open court, with a well of brackish water in a shady corner, and perhaps an old sycamore. Here is no sign of life. The doors are jealously closed, the windows shrouded by those beautiful screens of net-like woodwork which delight the artist and tempt the collector. The inner court is almost as silent and deserted as the guarded windows which overlook the street. We shall see nothing of the domestic life of the inhabitants, for the women's apartments are carefully shut off from the court, into which open only the guest rooms and other masculine and semi-public apartments. After the bustle of the street, this quiet and ample space is very refreshing, and one feels that the Egyptian architects have happily realized the requirements of Eastern life. They make the streets narrow, and overshadow them with projecting mashrabias, because the sun beats down too fiercely for the wide street of European towns to be endurable. But they make the houses themselves spacious, and surround them with courts and gardens, because without air the heat of the rooms in summer would be intolerable. The eastern architect's art lies in so constructing your house that you cannot look into your neighbor's windows, nor he into yours. And the obvious way of attaining this end is to build the rooms round a high open court and to closely veil the windows with lattice blinds, which admit a subdued light and sufficient air and permit an outlook without allowing the passing stranger to see through. The wooden screens and secluded court are necessary to fulfill the requirements of the Mohammedan system of separating the sexes. The lower rooms opening directly off the court are those into which a man may walk with impunity and no risk of meeting any of the women. 
into one of these lower rooms our host conducts us, with polite entreaty to do him the honor of making ourselves at home. It is the guest room, or mandara, and serves as an example of the ordinary dwelling room of the better sort. The part of the room where we enter is of a lower level than the rest, and if it be a really handsome house, we shall find this lower part paved with marble mosaic and cooled by a fountain in the middle, while opposite the door is a marble slab raised upon arches, where the water bottles, coffee cups, and washing materials are kept. We leave our outer shoes on the marble before we step upon the carpeted part of the room. It is covered with rugs and furnished by a low divan round three sides. The end of the wall is filled by a mashrabiya, which is furnished within with cushions, while above it some half-dozen windows, composed of small pieces of colored glass let into a framework of stucco so as to form a floral pattern, admit a half-light. The two sides, whitewashed where there is neither wood nor tiles, are furnished with shallow cupboards with doors of complicated geometrical paneling. Small arched niches on either side of the cupboards and a shelf above are filled with jars and vases and other ornaments. The ceiling is formed of planks laid on massive beams and generally painted a dark red. But in old houses the ceilings are often beautifully decorated. There are no tables, chairs, or fireplaces, or indeed any of the things a European understands to be furniture. When a meal is to be eaten, a little table is brought in. If the weather be cold, a brazier of red-hot charcoal is kindled. Instead of chairs, the Kyrene tucks his legs up under him on the divan an excellent method of getting the cramp for Europeans. There is often another reception room, raised above the ground, but entered by steps from the court, into which it looks through an open arched front. And frequently a recess in the court, under one of the upper rooms, is furnished with a divan for hot weather. A door opens out of the court into the staircase leading to the harem rooms, and here no man but the master of the house may penetrate. Harim means what is prohibited to other men and what is sacred to the master himself. The harim rooms are the domestic part of the house. When a man retires there, he is in the bosom of his family, and it would need a very urgent affair to induce the doorkeeper to summon him down to anyone who called to see him. Among the harim apartments... There is generally a large sitting room like the mandara called the ka, with perhaps a cupola over it. And in front of the ka is a vestibule which serves as a ventilating and cooling place. For a sloping screen over an open space on the roof of this room is so turned as to conduct the cool north breezes into the house in hot weather, and here the family often sleep in summer. There are no bedrooms in the Mohammedan house, or there are no rooms furnished as bedrooms. For there are plenty of separate chambers where the inmates sleep, but not one of them has any of what we conceive to be the requisites of bedroom furniture. The only fittings the Kyrene asks for for the night consist of a mattress and pillow, and perhaps a blanket in winter and a mosquito net in summer, the whole of which he rolls up in the morning and deposits in some cupboard or side room whereupon the bedroom becomes a sitting-room. There is another important department of the harem, the bathroom, not a mere room with a fixed bath in it, but a suite of complicated heated stone apartments, exactly resembling the public Turkish baths. It is only a large house that boasts this luxury, however, and most people go out to bathe if they care to bathe at all. End of section 1 Section 2 of The Story of Cairo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole Section 2 Chapter 1 The Two Cities Part 2 The inhabitants of a house, such as that described, lead a dreary, monotonous life. Fortunately, however, they are not often conscious of its emptiness. 
The master rises very early, for the Muslim must say the daybreak prayers. A pipe and a cup of coffee is often all he takes before his light midday meal, and he generally reserves his appetite for the chief repast of the day, the supper or dinner, which he eats soon after sunset. If he is in business, he spends his day in a more or less irregular attendance at his shop, smokes almost incessantly either the newfangled Turkish cigarette or the traditional shibuk, with its handsome amber mouthpiece, its long cherry wood stem, and red clay bowl filled with mild gebeli or latakia tobacco. If he has no special occupation, he amuses himself with calling on his friends, or indulges in long, dreamy hours in the warm atmosphere of the public bath, where the vapor of the hot water tanks and a dislocation of each particular joint in the shampooing and a subsequent interval of cooling and smoking and coffee are all exceedingly delightful in a hot climate. When he goes out, a man of any position or wealth never condescends to walk. As a rule, he rides a donkey, sometimes a horse but the donkey is far more convenient in crowded streets. Indeed, an Egyptian ass of the best breed is a fine animal, and fetches sometimes as much as a hundred guineas. His paces are both fast and easy, and it is not difficult to write a letter on the pummel of one of these ambling mounts. While their lord is paying his calls or attending to his shop, the women of his household make shift to pass the time as best they may. In spite of popular ideas on the subject, Mohammedans seldom have more than one wife, though they sometimes add to their regular marriage a left-handed connection with an Abyssinian or other slave girl. Efforts, however, are being made to put down the traffic in slaves, and if the trade be really suppressed, as it already is in law, the Kyrene will become monogamous. The late Hadith himself set an excellent example in this and in most other respects, and the better sort of Muslims are, to say the least, as moral as ordinary Christians. Facility of divorce is the real difficulty. Men will not keep several wives because it costs a good deal to allow them separate houses or suites of rooms, and plurality does not conduce to domestic harmony. But they do not hesitate to divorce a wife when they are tired of her, and take a new one in her place. It is said the Caliph Ali thus married and divorced two hundred women in his time, and a certain dyer of Baghdad even reached the astonishing total of nine hundred wives. He died at the good old age of eight-five, and if he married at fifteen, he would have had a fresh spouse for every month during seventy years of conjugal felicity. Divorce was so easy that there seems no great reason why he should not have married nine thousand. One lady is said to have reduced the fatiguing ceremony of wedlock to extremely convenient dimensions. The man said to her, Hitp, and she replied, Nick, and the wedding was over. Thus did she marry forty husbands, and her son Kharija was sorely puzzled to identify his father. The governor of Upper Egypt was no mean disciple of these illustrious leaders, but the habit has become more and more uncommon. There would be much more excuse for the women to demand polyandria than for the man to ask for polygynesia, for while the husband can go about and enjoy himself as he pleases, the women of his family are often hard-pushed to it to find any diversion in their dull lives. Sometimes they make up a party and engage a whole public bath, and then the screams of laughter bear witness how the girls of Egypt enjoy a romp. Or else the mistress goes in state to call upon some friends, mounted upon the high ass, enveloped in a balloon of black silk, her face concealed all but the eyes by a white veil, and attended by a trusty manservant. These visits to other harems are the chief delights of the ladies of Cairo. Unlimited gossip, sweetmeats, inspection of toilets, perhaps some singers or dancers to hear and behold, these are their simple joys. They have no education whatever, and cannot understand higher or more intellectual pleasures than those their physical senses can appreciate. 
to eat, to dress, to chatter, to sleep, to dream away the sultry hours on a divan, to stimulate their husband's affections and keep him to themselves. This is to live in a harem. An Englishwoman asked an Egyptian lady how she passed her time. I sit on this sofa, she answered, and when I'm tired, I cross over and sit on that. Embroidery is one of the few occupations of the harem, but no lady thinks of busying herself with the flower garden which is often attached to the house. Indeed, the fair houris we imagine behind the lattice windows are very dreary, uninteresting people. They know nothing and take but an indifferent interest in anything that goes on. They are just beautiful, a few of them, and nothing more. In truth, the Egyptian ladies cannot venture to give themselves airs. They suffer from the low opinion which all Mohammedans entertain of the fair sex. The unalterable iniquity of womankind is an incontrovertible fact among the men of the East. It is part of their religion. Did not the blessed prophet say, I stood at the gate of paradise, and lo, most of its inhabitants were the poor, and I stood at the gates of hell, and lo, most of its inhabitants were women. Is it not, moreover, a physiological fact that woman was made out of a crooked rib of Adam, which would break if you tried to bend it, and if you left it alone, it would always remain crooked? And is it not related that when the devil heard of the creation of woman, he laughed with delight and said, Thou art half of my host, and thou art the depository of my secret, and thou art my arrow with which I shoot and miss not. It is no wonder that a learned doctor gave advice to his disciple before he entered upon any serious undertaking to consult ten intelligent persons among his particular friends. Or, if he have not more than five such friends, let him consult each of them twice. Or, if he have not more than one friend, he should consult him ten times at ten different visits. If he have not one to consult, let him return to his wife and consult her, and whatever she advises him to do, let him do the contrary. So shall he proceed rightly in his affair and attain his object." Following in the steps of this pious father, the Muslims have always treated women as an inferior order of beings, necessary indeed and ornamental, but certainly not entitled to respect or deference. Hence they rarely educate their daughters, hence they seek in their wives beauty and docility, and treat them either as pretty toys to be played with and broken and cast away, or as useful links in the social economy good to bear children and order a household. The fatal blot upon Muslim society is this contempt of women, which far more than counterbalances the good effects of the Mohammedan doctrine of the equality of all true believers in the sight of God and the ease of manner and independence of opinion which result from the sense of fraternity in the sacred bond of Islam. The picture we have drawn of the daily life of the Kyrene is perhaps too somber, and we should watch our tradesman at his revels in order to understand the brighter side of his life. It is true, these excitements are strictly connected with his religion, but so are the Roman Catholic holidays, and if one must dissipate, it is soothing to the conscience to do it under the auspices of a saint. The Muslim, however, takes an unnatural delight in pious celebrations. The wedding guest of Cairo has his own importunate ancient mariner in the Khatma or recital of the entire Quran from cover to cover, which a worthy bridegroom frequently provides for the entertainment of his friends. When the people of Cairo wish to go in for serious dissipation, they visit the graves of their relations, and then in houses expressly reserved for cheerful mourners, they listen to the chanting of the holy book. Voilà un terrible humeur d'homme. Triste as we are said to be in England in our manner of amusing ourselves, even an Ibsen audience would stand aghast at the Muslim state diversions. He certainly makes the most of curiously unpromising materials. The feast of St. Simon and St. Jude does not perhaps suggest exhilaration to an unimaginative Englishman, 
but your Kyrene will intensely enjoy in his sedate way the holidays of his religion. There are plenty of them, and a Cairo molit, or birthday, is not a one-day festival like mere Christian feasts, but lasts sometimes as long as nine days at a stretch. Every tourist knows some of them, such as the Kiswa, or Holy Carpet procession, and the passing of the Mahmal with the pilgrim caravan to Mecca, and they are worth seeing if they happen to fall within the season. For the Muslim year still retains the unreformed lunar calendar, which shifts continually and carries the feasts round with it. There is hardly a week in the year, however, without some special rite or spectacle. It may be the Ashura, or 10th of Muharram, the first month, when people eat cakes in honor of Hussein, the martyred son of Ali, and pay their homage at the mosque of the Hassanain, where the martyr's head is supposed to rest, and watch the amazing antics of the dervishes. Since Hussein, in whose honor it is held, combining with his elder brother Hassan to form the Hassanain, is especially the saint of the heretical Persians, and has given rise, through no merit of his own, to more schisms in the Mohammedan world than any other person, it is strange that the Kyrenes, who are almost all orthodox Sunnis, should pay such particular reverence to this feast. But the truth is, they are glad of any excuse for a holiday, and, after all, was not our Lord Hussein the grandson of the Prophet, and is he to be given over wholly to those heretical dogs of Shia? Whatever the argument, Hussein is deeply revered in Cairo, and his molid is one of the sights of the capital that most delight the European visitor. Nothing more picturesque and fairy-like can be imagined than the scenes in the streets and bazaars of Cairo on the great night of the Hassanain. The curious thing was that in the winter, after Tel el-Kabir, when I stood, for writing was impossible, in the midst of the dance throng in the Muski, and struggled into the by-street that leads to the Qadi's court and the mosque of the Hassanain, there was not a sign of ill-humor or fanaticism in spite of the presence of many Europeans. A more good-natured crowd was never seen. It might have been expected that at least some slight demonstration would have been made against the Europeans who wandered about the gaily illuminated street. But English ladies walked through the bazaars, English officers and tourists mingled in the throng, and even reached the doors of the sacred mosque itself without the slightest molestation or even remark. Once or twice a woman might have been heard sarcastically inviting some Christian to bless the Prophet. But if the Christian charitably replied, God bless and save him, she was nonplussed. And even if he did not know the proper answer, nothing came of it. The general good nature inspired by the festival obliterated all memories of war and heresy, and it may safely be asserted that no English mob could have been trusted to behave in so orderly and friendly a manner in the presence of a detested minority. The scene, as I turned into one of the narrow lanes of the great Khan and Khalili, or Turkish Bazaar, which fronts the mosque of the Hassanain, was like a picture in the Arabian Nights. The long bazaar was lighted by innumerable chandeliers and colored lamps and candles, and covered by awnings of rich shawls and stuffs from the shops beneath, while between the strips of awning one could see the somber outlines of the unlighted houses above, in striking contrast to the brilliancy and gaiety below. The shops had quite changed their character. All the wares which were usually littered about had disappeared. The trays of miscellaneous daggers and rings and spoons and what not were gone, and each little shop was turned into a tastefully furnished reception room. The sides and top were hung with silks and cashmeres, velvets, brocades, and embroideries of the greatest beauty and rarity, costly stuffs which the most inquisitive purchaser never managed to see on ordinary occasions. The whole of the sides of the bazaar formed one long blaze of gold and light and color, and within each shop the owner sat surrounded by a semicircle of friends, all dressed in their best very clean and superbly courteous, for the Cairo tradesman is always a gentleman and mean, even when he is cheating you most outrageously. 
The very man with whom you haggled hotly in the morning will now invite you politely to sit down with him and smoke. At his side is a little ivory or mother-of-pearl table, from which he takes a bottle of some sweet drink flavored with almonds or roses, and offers it to you with finished grace. Seated in the richly hung recess, you can see the throng pushing by, the whole population, it seems, of Cairo in their best array and merriest temper. All at once the sound of drums and pipes is heard, and a band of dervishes chanting benedictions on the Prophet and Hossein pass through the delighted crowd. On your left is a shop, nay, a throne room in miniature, where a storyteller is holding an audience spellbound as he relates with dramatic gestures some favorite tale. Hard by, a holy man is revolving his head solemnly and unceasingly as he repeats the name of God or some potent text from the Koran. In another place, a party of dervishes are performing a zikr, or a complete recital of the Koran is being chanted by swaying devotees. The whole scene is certainly unreal and fairy-like. We can imagine ourselves in the land of the jinn or in the city of brass, but not in Cairo or in the 19th century. Outside the Khan, dense masses of the people are crowding into the mosque of the Hassanain, where especially horrible performances take place and where the tour of the shrine of Hussein must be made. Nearby, a string of men are entering a booth. We follow and find tumblers at work and a performing pony, and a clown who always imitates the feats of the gymnasts, always fails grotesquely, and invariably provokes roars of laughter. In another booth, Karakush is carrying on his intrigues. This Egyptian punch is better manipulated than our own, whom he nearly resembles. But he is not so choice in his language or behavior, and we are glad before long to leave a place where the jokes are rather broad and certain saltatory insects unusually active. People of the lower class, however, care nothing for these drawbacks. They laugh till their sights ache at Karakush's sallies, and whatever they see, wherever they go, whomever they meet, whatsoever their cares and their poverty, on this blessed night of the Hassanain they are perfectly happy. An Egyptian crowd is very easily amused. The simplest sights and oldest jests delight it, and it is enough to make a fastidious European regret his niceness to see how these simple folk enjoy themselves upon so small an incentive. This is what one goes to Cairo to see, the real Eastern life in its Eastern setting. A scene like this repays one for many dreary calls, many tepid dances in the region of hotels. You may get hotel life, club life, polo and tennis and even golf excellently at Cairo, the European Cairo, but these things are common to all winter resorts. In the bazaars, among the people, you get something that the Ismailia quarter cannot give, that no other place can quite rival something that painters love and that kindles the imagination. After all, the most interesting things are always the unfamiliar, and the first plunge into Egypt is a revelation of fresh ideas, new tones and color, and the pungent odors of a strange native life. It is in the bazaars that one feels most the shock of contact with the unfamiliar, but in a less intimate yet deeply impressive way, to drink in the full inspiration of the Muslim city, one must climb to the ramparts of the citadel about sunset and slowly absorb the wonderful panorama that spreads below and around. Unhappily to get there, one usually passes along the most terribly defaced street in all Cairo. The worst destruction took place, one is thankful to remember, before England took the reins of Egypt. It was Ismail, under French influence, who made that unspeakable atrocity, the Boulevard Muhammad Ali, which cut through some of the most beautiful quarters, ruined palaces and gardens, and chopped off half of a noble mosque in order to preserve the tasteless accuracy of its straight line. 
Along its side are ranged, mean and uneven offices and tenements, neither Europeanly regular nor orientally picturesque. Old wine and new bottles are in close connection. A Muslim school elbows a grog shop for army and navy. Under the shadow of the stately mosque of Sultan Hassan, an Arab barber is cutting hair with a modern clipping machine. A gaily painted harem carriage guarded by eunuchs stands at the door of the mosque. On the panel is a sham coat of arms, that last infirmity of Turkish minds. Though, for that matter, heraldic bearings were used in Egypt at least 700 years ago. Solemn sheikhs pace slowly along without any sign of surprise at these strange sights. Overhead, the guns boom out a salute, for it is the great festival, the Aid al-Kabir, from Saladin's citadel. But the garrison are not stalwart Turkmans or wild Kurds in picturesque garb and with clanking spear and mace, such as the great Soldan led against Richard of the Lionheart, but British Tommies unbecomingly attired in khaki. The citadel itself is an arsenal of modern arms and stores, and English officers rule where once the Mamluk bays were massacred. Old and new are ever clashing in the medieval fortress, and private ortheries mounts guards over the mosque of the Mamluk Sultan. But once we stand on the ramparts, the flaring contrasts vanish, and the jarring note is still. All in that wide range beneath the eye is of the east-eastern. The European touches are too small at such a distance to mar the purely oriental tone. Countless domes and minarets, a glimpse of arched cloisters, a wilderness of flat-roofed houses, yellow and white and brown, with sloped pants to admit the cool breezes below, a patch of green here and there with dark-leaved sycamores, revealing some of the many gardens of the old city, and beyond a fringe of palms and a streak of silver where the long, bright river rolls sleepily on between its brown banks. In the distance against the ridge of the Libyan horizon, in the carmine glory of the sinking sun, stand the everlasting pyramids, like the boundary marks of the mighty waste, the Egyptian land of shades. One after the other, the tall forms of slender minarets separate themselves from the bewildering chaos of roofs and domes and display their varied grace. Each has its story of victory or exile, of famine and invasion, of learning and piety to tell. On the right, northwards, the fine towers of Mu'ayyad above the Zuwayla gate recall a hundred deeds and legends of that famous portal, once the main entrance of the Caliph's palace city. Beyond them rise the minarets of the Nahasin, a perfect gallery of Saracen art, and again beyond the turrets of Hakim's great quadrangle. In front of the foreground stands Sultan Hassan, the largest and most imposing of the Mamluk mosques, and a little to the left one looks into the vast arcaded square of Ibn Tulun, with its queer corkscrew tower overhanging the billowy mounds that reveal where Fustat lay a thousand years ago. Still more to the left, a line of arches shows where the aqueduct that has brought water to the citadel for five centuries stretches to the Nile, and behind we can look down upon the cluster of ruined domes and minarets of the southern Carafa, the tombs of the Mamluks, and catch a glimpse of the old fortress of Egyptian Babylon and the mosque of the conqueror Amr. Looking over the Mamluk minarets, we can see the dim outlines of the cairns of Dahshur and the conspicuous form of Saqqara's steppe pyramid, separated from the Saracen domes by only fifteen miles of space, but five millenniums of time. And as the glow of the sunset fades away, the evening clouds gather in the west, and the desert beyond takes up their shades of gray and blue like a vast mid-African ocean. Here we realize Cairo for the first time as a city of the Middle Ages, and more than that, a city with a heritage from the dawn of history. 
It is true it has not the exquisite setting of the seven-hilled queen of the Bosphorus. It is not even built about the Nile, which the silts of centuries have breasted away from the walls it once laid. But as one looks out from the battlements of the castle, one perceives that there are other oceans than those of water, and that the capital of Egypt can have no more fitting frame than the deserts which are her shield, and the pyramids her title deeds to her inheritance from the remote past. He who hath not seen Cairo, said the Jewish Hakim, hath not seen the world. Her soil is gold, her Nile is a marvel, her women are as the bright-eyed houris of paradise. Her houses are palaces, and her air is soft with an odor above aloes, refreshing the heart. And how should Cairo be otherwise when she is the mother of the world? End of section 2 Section 3 of The Story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole. Section 3. Chapter 2. The Town of the Tent. Part 1. In the view from the citadel, one sees an essentially medieval city, but of all the Arab buildings there is not one that in its present state dates back to the Arab conquest. Before the Muslims invaded Egypt in 640, there was no Cairo, and strictly speaking there was none till three centuries later than that, when the Greek general laid the foundations of the palace city of the Fatimid Caliphs, and it received the name el Cahira, which Europeans twisted into Cahir, Kair, and Cairo but this is merely a pedantry of terms, and one might as well restrict London to the city and refuse the name to Westminster and Mayfair. There was a Muslim capital from the days of the conquest, and though it was not called Cairo, it was close to the present city, which is merely an expansion of the original town. The history of its growth will appear as we study its several stages and monuments and for the moment a bare enumeration of the successive foundations will suffice. First rose the original Arab settlement Fustat, the town of the tent, in 641. To this was added in 751 a northeastern suburb, the official residence of the governors and their troops, hence named El Askar, quote, the cantonments. A new royal faubourg, or small city, was built still more to the northeast by the first independent Muslim king of Egypt, Ibn Tulun, about 860, and was known by the name of el Katai, quote, the wards, because it was divided into separate quarters for different nations and classes. So far the three towns were practically contiguous, and Oscar and Katai were but the Chelsea and St. James of the city, the commercial capital, Fustat. The fourth foundation was still further to the northeast, and a considerable vacant space was left between it and the almost destroyed Faubourg of Katai, in order to preserve the safety and seclusion of the sacred caliphs for whom it was built in 969. This last was the true Cairo, El Kahira, but it was not the commercial and residential capital, any more than Oscar or Katai had been. Fustat, resting on the Nile bank, was still the emporium of trade and the metropolis alike of business and of culture, whilst Kahira was but a palace, a barrack, and a seat of government. When the medieval chroniclers, such as William of Tyre, write of, quote, Maser, meaning Maser, properly Maser, the usual Arabic name both for Egypt and for its capital, they refer not to Kahira, but to Fustat, or as it was commonly called, Miser el Fustat, the emir or caliph or sultan, might dwell and rule at any suburb he pleased to build, but the old capital remained the real metropolis throughout. There the Qadis sat in judgment in the, quote, old mosque. There the coins of the realm were issued, and there resided the bulk of the citizens who were not attached to the palace. It was only when Fustat was deliberately burned in 1168 to save it from giving cover to the crusaders, 
The Cairo took its place as the real capital, as well as the official center of Egypt. Saladin was the creator of Cairo as we know it. It was he who planned the wall that was to enclose not only Cairo, but the citadel and what remained of Katai and Fustat. And from his time began the building over the space intervening between the citadel and the palace of Cairo, which gradually filled up the Cairo which we now see. The growth of the city thus consisted mainly of three successive expansions towards the northeast, accompanied by decay of abandoned suburbs and ending in a general enclosure of the chief inhabited portions. Since the days of Saladin, whatever remained of Fustat has vanished, and only a straggling village called Masar al Atika, or, quote, Old Masar, and known to Europeans as, quote, Old Cairo, has risen near its site which is easily traced by the immense rubbish heaps. On the other hand, a new town has grown up between Kahira and the Nile, under European influences, but with this, pleasant winter city as it is, the medieval town has nothing to do. The narrative of the Arab invasion of Egypt is in many points exceedingly obscure, owing to the circumstances that the Arabs did not begin to write history till more than two centuries later and that our only almost contemporary authority, John, Bishop of Nikio, has come down to us in a corrupt translation. The Arabs, under the command of Amr ibn al-Asi, entered Egypt not more than 4,000 strong in December 639, in the Caliphate of Omar, the second successor of the Prophet Muhammad, and after taking Pelusium and Bilves by siege, and fighting a battle with the Romans at Umdunan, a suburb which stood near the present Abdin Palace, attacked the city of, quote, Miser, or, quote, Babylon of Egypt. This city was a northern extension or successor of the decayed but then still existing Egyptian capital, Memphis, about twelve miles distant from the present Cairo, and had grown up under the protection of the Roman fortress of Babylon. It was evidently strongly defended, for the Arab general had to summon reinforcements, till his army mustered 12,000 before he could attack it. Amr divided his forces into three corps, one of which he posted to the north of Babylon, the second was stationed at Tindunyas, probably the Umdunan of the Arabic writers, and the third withdrew northwards to Heliopolis, in the hope of tempting the Romans out of their fortifications, upon which the other two corps were to fall on their rear or flank. The maneuver succeeded. The Romans marched out of their fortifications and attacked the Saracens at Heliopolis, but, being themselves taken in rear by the other divisions, were routed and driven to the Nile, when they took to their boats and fled down the river. Upon this the Muslims occupied Tindunyas, the garrison of which had perished in the battle, except three hundred men who shut themselves up in the fort, whence they retired by boat to Nikio. The taking of Tendunyas was evidently followed by, or synonymous with, the taking of the whole city of Miser, except its citadel, which was blockaded. For John of Nikio, from whose almost contemporary chronicle this account is taken, mentions no subsequent siege or conquest of the city of Miser, but only the reduction of the fortress. Whatever the city of Miser or Tendunyas may have been, it vanishes from history as soon as it is conquered. The last we hear of it is in the Treaty of Capitulation granted by Amr, which ran as follows, quote, In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, this is the amnesty which Amr ibn el Asi granted to the people of Miser, as to themselves, their religion, their goods, their churches and crosses, their lands and waters. Nothing of these shall be meddled with or minished. The Nubians shall not be permitted to dwell among them. And the people of Miser, if they enter into this treaty of peace, shall pay the poll tax when the inundation of their river has subsided fifty millions. And each one of them is responsible for acts of violence that robbers among them may commit. And as for those who will not enter into this treaty, the sum of the tax shall be diminished to the rest in proportion, but we have no responsibility towards such. If the rise of the Nile is less than usual, the tax shall be reduced in proportion to the decrease. 
Romans and Nubians who enter into this treaty shall be treated in the like manner. And whoso rejects it and chooses to go away, he is protected until he reach a place of safety or leave our kingdom. The collection of the taxes shall be by thirds, one-third at each time. For sureties for this covenant stand the security and warranty of God, the warranty of his prophet, and the warranty of the caliph, the commander of the faithful, and the warranty of the true believers. Witnessed by Ez Zubair and his sons Abdallah and Muhammad, and written by Wardan. End quote. The Arab historians connect this treaty, which has all the appearance of being an authentic document, literally copied, expressly with the surrender of the city of Musur after the Battle of Heliopolis, but as Musur means Egypt, as well as its capital, the document itself only proves that the Arab conqueror accorded very generous terms to the people of Egypt. It says nothing explicit as to the town of Musur, the name of which was shortly to be transferred to Fustat, whilst the place thereof was known no more. The only explanation seems to be that the Egyptian city decayed as the Arab town grew, and that the population migrated to the neighboring and more prosperous settlement. The remains of the walls south of, quote, Old Miser may represent part of the site. The disappearance of an Egyptian town is unhappily far from unprecedented. Memphis itself has vanished, all save a few traces of walls and fallen statues. Quote, Hundred-gated Thebes survives only in her temples, and the reason is that the ancient Egyptian built his abode of perishable sun-dried brick, and lavished his massive stonework only upon the tombs of the great dead and the temples of the immortal gods. Whatever became of the city, a fortress of Babylon stands to this day. Its reduction cost the Arabs a seven months siege. The Battle of Heliopolis was won in the late summer of 640, and it was not till April 641 that the fortress was conquered. A leading part in the surrender of the place is ascribed to a mysterious personage, quote, the Mukakis, as the Arabs termed the governor of Egypt. According to the Arab traditions, it was he who negotiated the treaty cited above, which secured to the Egyptians freedom of religion and security of life, and when the Byzantine emperor Heraclius repudiated the treaty, the Mukakis stuck to his word and threw in his lot with the Arabs, whose valor and simple earnestness deeply impressed him. When his envoys returned from an embassy to the Saracens' camp, he asked them what manner of men the Muslims were, and they answered, quote, We found a people who love death better than life, and set humility above pride, who have no desire or enjoyment in this world, who sit in the dust and eat upon their knees, but frequently and thoroughly wash, and humble themselves in prayer. A people in whom the stronger can scarce be distinguished from the weaker, or the master from the slave. End quote. Such a character was new to the Egyptians, who had long suffered under the corruption and luxury of the Eastern Roman Empire, and, Whatever part the Bukakis personally may have played in what has been called the betrayal of Christian Egypt, it is certain that the population abetted the invaders. Although Christianity had been the official religion of Egypt since the Edict of Theodosius in 379, there was still a strong leaven of the old local cults, and more important still, there was a vigorous tendency to nationalism both of church and state. The rule of Byzantium had never been gracious to the Egyptian province. The Orthodox Church had been tyrannous. And when at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, the Eutychian heresy maintained by the Egyptian bishops was formally condemned, the schism became irrevocable. From that time forward, there were two churches in Egypt, the State Church, or Orthodox Greek, supported from Constantinople, and known as the Melachite, or, quote, royalist, and the national church, afterwards called Jacobite, and generally known as the Coptic church. Copt is etymologically the same word as Egyptian, Greek as Aguptios, Arabic as Kipt, and Kupt, English as Copt. And the Coptic church means nothing less than the church of Egypt, as separated by the adoption of the heresy of Eutyches. 
The Egyptian Christians were as much Copts before as after the Council of Chalcedon, but it was their devotion to a metaphysical definition, which very few of them could possibly understand, that made them a distinct church. And to this they owe at once their misfortunes and their historical interest. By their adhesion to the first Nicene doctrine of the single nature of Christ, they exposed themselves to persecution and courted isolation, and sharing in none of the developments of the other churches, they preserved in their scanty and neglected community, unchanged, for nearly fifteen hundred years, the ancient tradition and ritual of the fifth century. It was their implacable hatred of the royalists that threw them into the arms of the Muslim invaders. By the advice of their exiled patriarch, they helped the Arabs from the moment of their setting foot upon Egyptian soil. Eager to rid themselves of Byzantine rule, and still more of the royalist hierarchy, they embraced they knew not what as a preferable alternative, and after the Mukakis, aided, according to tradition, by a Catholicus, probably Cyrus, royalist patriarch of Alexandria, had succeeded in obtaining a generous amnesty from the Arab general, the Copts rendered every aid to the Muslims, assisted them with labor at bridge-making, and brought them supplies. They soon discovered that they had only exchanged masters, but the Arab, despite his haughty assumption of superiority and his occasional outbursts of persecution, was a gentler tyrant than the Roman of the lower empire. Deprived of all support from the population, the Roman garrison of Babylon surrendered in April 641. The delta was quickly overrun, and the Romans fell back upon Alexandria, which, distracted by factions and deprived of competent leaders, yielded to panic and eagerly accepted Amr's magnanimous terms. By the surrender of the Roman capital in October 641, the Arab conquest of Egypt was complete. There was no further resistance worthy the name. The Muslims spread over the land up to the first cataract of the Nile, and Egypt became a province of the Caliphate. On his return from Alexandria, Amr founded the town of the tent. The great port on the Mediterranean was no suitable capital for Arab tribes, whose inexperience magnified the terrors of the deep. Alexandria, moreover, was liable at the period of Nile inundation to be cut off from the center of Arab power at Medina and the Caliph Omar, not yet inspired by dreams of a vast Muslim empire, was chiefly anxious to keep in touch with the army of Egypt. Amr, indeed, wished to retain Alexandria as the capital. Quote, Behold an abode made ready for us, he said. But when the Caliph heard of it, he asked, quote, Will there be water between me and the army of the Muslims? And the answer was, quote, Yes, O commander of the faithful, there will be the Nile. So he set his face against Alexandria. He regarded the new conquest as a barrack rather than a colony. Amir accordingly was bidden to choose a more central position, and found it some ten miles north of the remains of the ancient capital of Memphis, on the site of the camp which lay before the castle of Babylon. An old canal, the Omnis Trajanus, had formerly connected Babylon with the Red Sea at Suez, running past Bilbays and the Crocodile Lake, and this was immediately cleared of silt and reopened, so that tribute and corn were sent by water to Arabia, and close relations were thus maintained with the Caliph. End of Section 3 Read by Jabev Section 4 of The Story of Cairo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole, Section 4, Chapter 2, The Town of the Tent, Part 2. The Town of the Tent owes its name to a pretty legend, which may very probably be true. When Amr led his Arabs against the old capital of Egypt, he pitched his tent on the spot where his mosque now stands. After the surrender of the castle of Babylon, he marched upon Alexandria. But when the soldiers went to strike his tent, they found that a dove had laid her eggs within and was sitting on her nest. Amr at once declared the spot sacred and ordered them not to disturb her. And when on the return from the conquest of Alexandria, 
The army set about building quarters for themselves. Amr bade them settle around his still-standing tent, and the first Arab city of Egypt was ever afterwards known as El-Fustat, quote, the tent, or Miser El-Fustat, or simply Miser. The whole space between the Nile and the hill Mukatam, on a spur of which stands the present citadel, was bare at that time. There was nothing but, quote, wasteland and sown fields, end quote, and no buildings except some churches or convents and the Roman fortress of Babylon, or Babylon, known to the Arabs to this day as the Khazar Shema, or, quote, Castle of the Beacon, because, says the topographer El Makrizi, quote, this Khazar was illuminated on the summit with candles, in Arabic, Shema, on the first night of every month, to serve as a calendar. But it is possible, as Dr. Butler has suggested, that the name is merely a corruption of Khazar el Khami, the, quote, castle of Egypt, and that the beacon story was invented to explain it. Why Amr did not occupy the old city of Mizar, we do not know. Everything connected with that vanished town is a mystery. Elsewhere, the Arabs had no scruple about taking possession of older cities, such as Damascus and Edessa, but in Egypt they preferred to take fresh ground. Mizar may have been too small or it is possible that the caliph's orders that they were not to acquire property and take root in the country led to the original occupation of the bare stretch of land between Babylon and the Mukatam Hills. The first settlement undoubtedly resembled a temporary camp rather than a city. They wanted plenty of space to separate the various tribes who composed the Arab army, and who, despite their Muslim brotherhood, were liable to recall their ancient jealousies. The site they chose was ample and almost unencumbered. The tract was known as the Three Hamras, or, quote, Red Spots, the nearer, the middle, and the further Hamra, apparently from the red standard which was set up in the midst. The Arab clans divided the three tracts amongst them and laid out their settlements from the fortress to where the mosque of Ibn Tulun now stands, in the midst was the general's house, and close to it rose the first mosque built in Egypt, the, quote, Mosque of Conquest, the, quote, Crown of Mosques, as it was proudly called, but known later as the, quote, Old Mosque, and now as the Mosque of Amr. It was originally a very plain oblong room, about 200 feet long by 56 wide, built of rough brick, unplastered, with a low roof supported probably by a few columns with holes for light. There was no minaret, no niche for prayer, no decoration, no pavement. Even the pulpit which Amr set up was removed when the caliph wrote in reproach, quote, Is it not enough for thee to stand whilst the Muslims sit at thy feet? End quote. For it was the duty of the conqueror to recite the prayers and preach the Friday sermon in this humble building. It soon became too small for the growing population of Fustat and was enlarged in 673 by taking in part of the House of Amr and at the same time raised stations, the germ of the minaret, were erected at the corners for the Moisines to recite the call to prayer. Twenty-five years later, the entire mosque was demolished by a later governor who rebuilt it on a larger scale. So many and thorough have been the repairs and reconstructions that there is probably not a foot of the original building now in existence. What we see today is practically the mosque rebuilt in 827 by Abdallah ibn Tahir and restored by Murad Bey in 1798, just before he engaged the French in the, quote, Battle of the Pyramids at Embaba. It is four times the size of the original mosque and different in every respect. The, quote, Old Mosque, as the topographer calls it, was intensely revered in early times. It was there that the chief Cady held his court, and learned men congregated in its arcades. It was a rallying point for orthodoxy in times of schism and obtrusive heresies. When Fustat was burned in 1168, the mosque escaped, though much injured, and Saladin restored it. Quote, Where he found wood and stone, he left marble. End quote but it was as hopeless to maintain its popularity when the town it belonged to was in ashes as it would be to induce the dwellers in Belgravia 
to attend the services at Beau Bell's. Fustat, mostly in ruins, the congregation dispersed, and the Mosque of Amr fell upon evil days. Ibn Said, a Moorish traveler of the thirteenth century, found the sacred building covered with cobwebs and scrawled over with the ribald graffiti of loafers and vagabonds, the remains of whose victuals littered the floor. There were few worshippers and much unseemliness. Quote, Musicians and ape leaders and conjurers and mountebanks and dancing girls, end quote, says the historian Gabarti in the 18th century, desecrated the court, and so decrepit did the building become that even these abandoned it. If Murad Bey had not been, quote, anxious about his soul, end quote, for very good reasons, and made peace with his conscience by spending some of his ill-gotten gains upon the pious work of restoration, the, quote, crown of mosques would have disappeared altogether. In the early part of the 19th century, it was still a favorite place of prayer for the people of Cairo on the last Friday of the fast of Ramadan. Quote, it is believed that God will receive with particular favor the prayers which are offered up in this ancient mosque. Therefore, when the Nile is tardy in rising, and the people fear a scanty inundation and a consequent scarcity, the principal sheikhs and imams and learned and devout Muslims of the metropolis are ordered to betake themselves to the Mosque of Amr, to pray for an increase of the river, together with the priests of the various Christian churches and their congregations, and likewise the Jews, each of these persuasions arranged by itself without the mosque. Public prayers were thus offered up for rain in this consecrated spot by Muslims, Christians, and Jews in a time of unusual drought about twenty years ago, i.e. 1825-28, to 28, and on the following day it rained. End quote. The outside of the oldest mosque in Egypt is not impressive. Among the rubbish hills that mark the site of the town of the tent, its long gray walls, without windows or the least attempt at ornament, look dreary, and the two plain minarets are equally unpretentious. But within, despite decay and the loneliness of neglect, the vast empty court of some 40,000 square feet, surrounded by colonnades, and the forest of columns supporting the roof of the east end, the special place of prayer, wholly dominate all mean details. Crowded with worshippers in the rhythmic bowings of the Muslim ritual, it must have been a wonderful and solemn vision. The arches are of various ages, and the columns, taken from churches, show the most diverse capitals, not always put the right side up. The arcades do not run parallel to the walls, like cloisters round a cathedral close, but open at right angles into the court. Wooden beams stretch from column to column to support hanging lamps, of which 18,000 were lighted every night in former times, and the effect in the long vistas must have been superb. Those nights of illumination are long over, and the conqueror's mosque is a melancholy ruin, the loneliness of which appeals to the imagination to people it with the zealous groups of scholars and divines, fanatics and doctors learned in the law, fakirs and holy men, who once bowed before its deserted Qibla. Not even the mark of the blessed prophet's kerbag on the gray marble of the pillar, which, urged by the blow, despite all considerations of chronology, flew through the air from Mecca when Amr was building the mosque, nor the twin test columns between which only true believers can squeeze, and even a Turkish soldier stuck and almost died, avail to attract worshippers to the old shrine except on very special occasions. Yet it is prophesied that the fall of the mosque of Amr will be the sign of the downfall of Islam, and it is strange that a superstitious people are not more careful of their omens. The original mosque of the Arab conqueror has gone, but at least its representative stands on the hallowed site. One cannot say as much for Fustat, the town of the tent, which he founded. Whatever may remain of this great city, which was the capital and the river port of Egypt for five centuries, lies hidden under the wilderness of sand hills which cover the debris and the kitchen middens of the medieval town. Here, after a strong wind has stirred the sand, you may sometimes chance to pick up curious fragments of glass and pottery, Roman lamps, coins, glass bottle stamps, 
with inscriptions recording the names of eighth-century governors and such-like relics of what was once Fustat. Of its houses, its governor's palaces, its baths and schools, not a stone or brick remains. The, quote, granaries of Joseph certainly date back at least to that later Joseph, Saladin, for Benjamin of Tudela saw them in 1170. But Mazarella Tika, or, quote, Old Cairo, is built on land which was covered by the Nile in the days when Fustat was the capital. The rest is desolation. We shall catch many glimpses of its history in chapters to come, and read the descriptions of it written by Persian and Moorish travelers from the east and the west, but such descriptions do not enable us to realize the vanished Arab city. One monument, however, of the age of the conquest still survives, but it is not Arab. The Roman fortress of Babylon, the, quote, Castle of the Beacon, stands where it once overlooked the Muslims' tents and saw the Arab capital growing up beneath its walls. To understand why it was called Babylon, or as some say, Bablion, quote, the Gate of On, we must go to Materia, a few miles north of Cairo, where stands a solitary obelisk, sole relic of On, or Heliopolis, the, quote, City of the Sun. In the plain of Materia, before this lonely stone, the Turks fought the final battle that won Cairo from the Mamelukes in 1517, and here Claver gained his victory in 1800 over the Turks. There stood the famous Temple of On, of which Potiphera, the father of Joseph's wife, was priest. Here Pianchi, the Ethiopian priest-king, 8 centuries B.C., washed at the, quote, Fountain of the Sun, and made offerings of white bulls, milk, perfume, incense, and all kinds of sweet-scented woods, and entering the temple, quote, saw his father Ra, the sun god, in the sanctuary, end quote. Heliopolis was the university of the most ancient civilization in the world, the forerunner of all the schools of Europe. Here, in all probability, Moses was instructed by the priests of Ra, in quote, all the wisdom of the Egyptians, end quote. Here, too, Herodotus cross-questioned the same priesthood with varying success. Here, Plato came to study, and Eudoxus, the mathematician, to learn astronomy. And here, Strabo was shown the houses where the famous Greeks had lived. Of this seat of learning and focus of religion, nothing but the obelisk remains. Quote, the images of Beth Shemesh, the house of the sun, have indeed been, quote, broken, and, quote, the houses of the Egyptian gods have been, quote, burned with fire, end quote. Beside the obelisk is an ancient sycamore, riven with age and hacked with numberless names, beneath which tradition hath it that the Holy Family rested in their flight into Egypt, and it is hence known as the, quote, virgin's tree. Nearby is a spring of fresh water, a rare sight in this brackish land, which, it is said, became sweet because the bambino was bathed there. From the spots where the drops fell from his swaddling clothes, after they too had been washed in this sacred spring, sprang up balsam trees, which, it was believed, flourished nowhere else. There is no evidence for these fancies, and, of course, the sycamore is but a descendant of the supposed original, as it was not planted till after 1672. But the circumstances that a temple was built by the Hebrew Onias for the worship of his countrymen near here and that Jewish gardeners were brought here for the culture of the balsam trees, gives the tale a certain fitness. Heliopolis is no more, but its guardian fortress, the, quote, Gate of On, still defies time and the restorer's hands, and the name of Babylon of Egypt, applied to the capital, Fustat, as well as the fort, appears frequently in the medieval chronicles and romances. When Richard Coeur de Lyon defeated Saladin, the romance relates, quote, The chef sodden of Hethenais to Babylonia was flown Iwais, end quote. Whether or not there is any foundation for the tradition reported by Strabo and Diodorus that the castle was first built by exiles from the greater Babylon of Chaldea, the present fortress dates from the third or possibly the second century of our era. 
The exterior is imposing, though the walls have been injured and the sand has buried their feet. The greater part of the oblong outline is still sufficiently distinguishable, and five bastions and two circular towers are well preserved. The walls are built in the usual Roman manner, five courses of stone alternating with three of brick, the origin probably of the striped red and yellow decoration of the Muslim mosques and houses, and their massive aspect even now makes one realize how much the capture of such a stronghold must have meant to the early Arabs. When we enter the stronghold, the strange character of the fortress grows upon us. Passing through narrow lanes, narrower and darker and dustier even than the back alleys of Cairo, we are struck by the deadly stillness of the place. The high houses that shut in the street have little of the lattice ornament that adorns the thoroughfares of Cairo. The grated windows are small and few, and but for an occasional heavy door half open, and here and there the sound of a voice in the recesses of the houses, we might question whether the fortress was inhabited at all. Nothing, certainly, indicates that these plain walls contain six sumptuous churches, with their dependent chapels, each of which is full of carvings, pictures, vestments, and furniture, which in their way cannot be matched. A Coptic church is like a Mohammedan harem. It must not appear from the outside. Just as the studiously plain exterior of many a Cairo house reveals nothing of the latticed court within, surrounded by rooms where inlaid dados, tiles, carved and painted ceilings, and magnificent carpets glow in the soft light of the stained windows, so a Coptic church makes no outward show. High walls hide everything from view. The Copts are shy of visitors, and the plain exteriors are a sufficient proof of their desire to escape that notice which in bygone days aroused cupidity and fanaticism. After passing through a strong gateway and traversing a vestibule or ascending some stairs, you find yourself in a small but beautifully finished basilica, gazing at a carved choir screen that any cathedral in England might envy. In the dim light you see rows of valiant saints looking down at you from above the sanctuary and over the screens, and great golden texts in Coptic and Arabic to the glory of God, while above the arches of the triforium over the aisles show where other treasures of art are probably to be found. The general plan of a Coptic church is basilican, but there are many points of wide divergence from the strict pattern. The Byzantine feature of the dome is almost universal, and sometimes the whole building is roofed over with a cluster of a dozen domes. The church consists of a nave and side aisles, wagon vaulted, exactly like the early Irish churches, and like no others, and very rarely has transepts or approaches to the cruciform shape. The sparse marble columns that divide the nave from the aisles generally return round the west end and form a narthex or counter-choir, where is sunk the epiphany tank, once the scene of complete immersions, but now used only for the feet washing of Maundy Thursday. The church is also divided crosswise into three principal sections besides the narthex. The rearmost is the women's place, whom the judicious cops put behind the men, and thereby prevent any disturbance of devotions much more effectually than if the two sexes were ranged side by side, as in some western churches. A latticework screen divides the women's portion from the men's, which is always much larger and more richly decorated, and the men's division is similarly partitioned off from the choir by another screen, while the altars, three in number, are placed each in a separate apse, surmounted by a complete, not semicircular, dome, and veiled by the most gorgeous screen of all, formed of ivory and ebony crosses and geometrical panels, superbly carved with arabesques, and surmounted by pictures and golden texts in Coptic and Arabic letters. During the celebration, the central folding doors are thrown back, the silver-embroidered curtain is withdrawn, and the high altar is displayed to the adoring congregation, just as it is in the impressive ceremonial of St. Isaac's Cathedral at St. Petersburg. The carved doors and the silver thread curtain, the swinging lamps and pendant ostrich eggs, prepare us for something more gorgeous than the nearly cubical plastered brick or stone altar, with its silk covering, 
and the invariable recess in the east side, which originally had a more mystic signification, but is now only used for the burying of the cross in a bed of rose leaves on Good Friday, whence it will be disinterred on Easter Day. The Coptic altar stands detached from the wall of the sanctuary, which is often coated with slabs of colored marble, like the dados one sees in the mosques, or with mosaic of the peculiar Egyptian style, while above are painted panels or frescoes representing the twelve apostles, with Christ in the midst in the act of benediction. Over the altar spreads a canopy or baldacchino, which is also richly painted with figures of angels. The central sanctuary with its altar is divided off from the side altars by lattice screens. A curious part of the furniture is the ark, which holds the chalice during the rite of consecration, and scarcely less interesting is the flabellum, or fan for keeping gnats off the chalice, which is often exquisitely fashioned of repoussé silver. Similar fans are represented in the Irish Book of Kells. There is never a crucifix, but reliquaries are not uncommon, though their place is not on the altar. The Coptic Church forbids the worship of relics, but every church has its bolster full of them, and the devout believer attaches considerable importance to their curative properties. Sometimes the most beautiful object in metalwork in a Coptic church is the silver textus case, corresponding to the Irish gungdach, in which the copy of the Gospels is supposed to be sealed up, though generally a few leaves alone remain inside. It is often a fine example of silver chasing and repoussé work and is reverently brought from the altar where it reposes to the officiating deacon, who places it on the lectern while he reads from another copy. The lectern itself is a favorite subject for decoration. That from the Mualaka Church, now in the Coptic Cathedral at Cairo, is covered with a beautiful inlaid and carved paneling, which is familiar in the doors and pulpits of mosques. Of the six churches contained within the fortress of Babylon, Three are of the highest interest, for, though the Greek Church of St. George, perched on the top of the round tower, is finely decorated with Damascus and Rhodian tiles and silver lamps, the Roman tower itself, with its central well, great staircase, and curious radiating chambers, is more interesting than the church above it. Of the three principal Coptic churches, that of St. Sergius or Abu Sarga is the most often visited on account of the tradition that it was in its crypt that the Holy Family rested when they journeyed to the land of Egypt. The crypt is certainly many centuries older than the church above it, which dates from the 10th century. The church itself is notable for a fine screen, and close to it a remarkable specimen of early Coptic figure carving, with representations of the Nativity and of warrior saints in high relief. Another example of this style of deep carving exists in the Triforium of the Church of St. Barbara. Besides Abu Sarga and Kadisa Barbara, there remains a third and very interesting Coptic church to be mentioned. This is suspended between two bastions of the Roman wall, over a gate with a classical pediment and a sculptured eagle. It is called, from its position, the Mualaka, or, quote, hanging, church. It is remarkable in many ways, partly for being the oldest of the Babylon churches, and partly on account of the entire absence of domes. The Mualaka has other peculiarities. It has absolutely no choir. The dais in front of the shallow eastern apses has to serve the purpose, and it is double-aisled on the north side. The carved screen in the north aisle has the unique property of being filled in with thin ivory panels, which must have shown with a rosy tint when the lamps behind were lighted. The sculptured pulpit is especially beautiful. It stands on, quote, 15 delicate Saracenic columns, arranged in seven pairs with a leader, end quote. Not the least curious part about the, quote, suspended church is its hanging garden, where the bold experiment of planting palms in midair has succeeded in perpetuating the tradition that it was here that the Virgin first broke fast with a meal of dates on her arrival in Egypt. This is not the place to enter into the doctrine and ritual of the Coptic Church. The appalling Lenten fast of the Copts, which lasts 55 days and involves total abstinence from food, 
from sunrise to sunset during each of those days, no doubt suggested the only less rigorous Muslim fast of Ramadan. The Coptic sacrament of matrimony has certain elements of the grotesque in it, but most of the ceremonial of the church possesses a dignity and the sweet savor of antiquity, which must redeem any minor absurdities. No one can stand unmoved in a Coptic church during the celebration of the Mass, or hear the worshippers shout with one voice, just as they did some fifteen hundred years ago, the loud response, quote, I believe this is the truth, end quote, without emotion. Through fiery persecution, they have clung to their truth with a heroism that is only the more wonderful when we consider their weakness. And however partial and ignorant their interpretation of truth, we cannot withhold the respect that is due of those who have come out of great tribulation and remained steadfast to their faith. End of section 4 Read by Jabev Section 5 of the Story of Cairo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole Section 5 Chapter 3 the Faubourgs, Part One, by the Arab conquest in six forty, Egypt became a province of the Caliphate and was ruled like the other provinces by governors appointed by the Caliphs. The first four successors of Muhammad retained Medina, the Arabian city of his adoption, as their seat of government but after the murder of ali the fourth caliph the dynasty of the omayyads transferred the center of power to damascus from damascus therefore came most of the thirty governors who held rule over the land of egypt during the ninety years of the omayyad caliphate some of them were sons or brothers of the reigning caliphs and most were naturally court favorites inexperienced in the art of government and ignorant of everything save their religion and their language the object of the sovereign pontiff at damascus was to get as much revenue as he could out of the subject provinces and egypt especially was regarded in the light of a valuable milch cow amr the conqueror was the first governor and from his new capital of Fustat, he sent out his officers and collected about six million pounds from a populated estimated at from six to eight millions when the old warrior died at the age of ninety and was buried in the mukatam hills he is said to have left seventy sacks of dinars footnote the dinar was a gold coin of about the weight of a half guinea in the footnote or something like ten tons of gold which his conscientious sons declined to inherit however this may be it is certain that the governors looked chiefly to the revenue and did little for the country but draw the not very burdensome land and capitation taxes and accumulate such pickings as might be safely diverted to their own use a governor whose average tenure of office was three and a half years and whose future livelihood often depended wholly on his savings was under serious temptation to make the most of his brief opportunities there were good wallace and bad but the shortness of their tenure and their absolute dependence upon the caliph at damascus restricted their powers and energies and they generally contented themselves with keeping order and rendering tribute to their pontifical caesar the position was not easy there were some thousands of arab soldiers at fustat and alexandria and some other towns constantly increased however by the troops brought into the country by successive governors 
but all the rest of the population was christian and resolved to remain so indeed any wholesale conversion was much deprecated since it implied the loss of the poll tax of a guinea a head which was levied only from non-moslems still it was dangerous to be in so marked a minority and we find that about ninety years after the conquest a governor despairing of any considerable accession of native egyptians to the moslem ranks was driven to import five thousand arabs into the delta it was only by very slow degrees and after much intermarriage and many partial immigrations that egypt became moslem and for a long time the arabs were practically confined to the large towns fustat itself must soon have attracted a numerous coptic population from the decaying egyptian towns in the neighbourhood not only in wives for the conquerors but in the officials all the details of government were naturally in the hands of the subject people the desert arabs knew nothing beyond the patriarchal rule of the clan and they adopted everywhere the system they found prevailing in a conquered territory roman offices were translated into arabic equivalents and the copts a race of born clerks and accountants managed all the departments for half a century the government books and public documents were written in coptic usefulness does not necessarily compel toleration and the christians did not always escape persecution in spite of their official services they were better treated however than is sometimes imagined grateful for their assistance in the stress of the invasion amr granted privileges to the jacobites and recalled their exiled patriarch another governor allowed the copts to build a church at fustat beside the bridge that connected the capital with the island of rhoda and a third abd el aziz son of the caliph marwan bought the monastery at tamwe from the monks for over ten thousand pounds when he wanted a country house he went there in order to be cured of elephantiasis in the sulphur springs of helwan between cairo and memphis and it is curious to consider how nearly this modern health resort now moved further towards the desert became the capital of egypt abd el aziz was so charmed with the climate of helwan that he built mosques there six ninety five a palace known as the golden house from its gilt dome and a glass winter garden planted trees made a lake and aqueduct and constructed a nilometer hither too the lower nile had been measured at memphis but in seven sixteen a new nilometer was set up on the island of rhoda where a second was afterwards built at the upper end of the island in eight sixty one subsequent governors however did not share the ideas of abd el aziz either in regard to the charms of helwan or in relation to the copse and we read of a vexatious system of passports badges for monks fines and tortures and destruction of sacred pictures which excited such indignation that the people rose in rebellion in the east of the delta and the christian king of nubia marched into egypt to demand the release of an imprisoned patriarch these moslem persecutions were not a whit more cruel than the contemporary christian persecutions of the jews but this does not make them the more defensible the monks seem to have especially excited the fanaticism of the early moslems whose puritanism found no place for monastic rules in later times the shia caliphs of cairo took very kindly to the coptic monks but it was not so in the cruder and fiercer age of the arab conquests monasticism was a potent force in egypt from very early days the followers of st mark in the third century had settled in scattered communities all over the delta and had already begun to formulate what is known as the egyptian rule we do not yet know how much we owe to these remote hermits some have held that irish christianity the great civilizing agent of the early middle ages among the northern nations was the child of the egyptian church seven egyptian monks are buried at desert ulid and there is much in the ceremonies and architecture of early ireland that reminds one of still earlier christian remains in egypt 
every one knows that the handicraft of the irish monks in the ninth and tenth centuries far excelled anything that could be found elsewhere in europe and if the byzantine looking decoration of their splendid gold and silver work and their superb illuminations can be traced to the teaching of egyptian missionaries we have more to thank the copts for than has been imagined that arab architecture owes to them much of its decorative charm is among the commonplaces of the history of art such considerations naturally could not influence a people so wholly dead to artistic ideas as the arabs to them the coptic monks were merely candidates for clerkships and owners of secret hoards to be squeezed for the benefit of the faithful any thought of fellowship or amity was out of the question and the fact that persecution was not more general and consistent must be ascribed to the indolence or good nature of individual governors and to the prudent maxim that deprecates the slaughter of the goose that lays golden eggs now and again we read of cruel massacres and tortures and destruction of churches and next we hear of permission granted for the building or restoration of a church we find the cops quietly meeting in the fortress of babylon which they always occupied to elect the patriarch and almost at the same moment appear notices of humiliating sumptuary rules a distinguishing garb of some ridiculous colour and wooden effigies of the devil hung over coptic doors every now and then some rising or a mere street quarrel would be made the pretext for a wholesale massacre when many churches were raised to the ground in spite of persecution in spite of the apostasy of the weaker brethren the church still preserved a painful existence there is something truly heroic in the constancy of these ignorant people for the coptic priesthood was never famous for learning to the faith of their forefathers they still persevered in the celebration of the rites of their religion though the loopholed walls massive doors and secret passages of their surviving churches testified to the perils of that attended such solemnities from time to time many of them waxed rich as the gorgeous adornments of these churches show for their masters could not do without their skill in reckoning and scrivener's work aided by this monopoly and supported by a dogged adherence to their ancient faith the copts present to this day the curious spectacle of a people who have stood still for ages and through many centuries of varying persecution have preserved their individuality and their traditions they are still a people apart less mixed with alien blood than any other inhabitants of the nile valley their features recall those of the ancient egyptians as we see them on the monuments much more than do the faces of the muslim population and not only in person but in language the copts are a remnant of ancient egypt their tongue preserved in their liturgy and recited to-day in their churches is the lineal descendant of the language of the hieroglyphics and of the rosetta stone for ordinary purposes of course they use the arabic of their neighbours but the sacred speech of their religion is still partly understood by the priests and retains its place of honour before the arabic translation in the services of the church by another curious freak of conservatism they preserve this ancient language not in the script that belonged to it the curse of development of the picture writing of the monuments but in the bold unsealed character of early greek manuscripts a people of the race of the pharaohs speaking the words of rameses writing them with the letters of cadmus and embalming in the sentences thus written the creed and liturgy which twelve centuries of persecution have not been able to wrest from them or alter a jot are indeed a curiosity of history the omayyad caliphs were superseded by the abbasids in seven fifty and fustat was the scene of the final struggle marwan the last caliph of the fallen dynasty fled to egypt and setting fire to fustat and the bridge that joined it to the island of rhoda escaped to the west bank his precautions were vain the abbasid general and the men of Khurasan soon found the means of crossing and marwan's head was sent round the towns in evidence of the change of power a usurpers have an invincible repugnance to dwelling in the houses of the usurped the abbasid caliphs left damascus and built themselves a famous new capital at baghdad and their governors in egypt abandoning the house of the emirate at fustat established a new official suburb of versailles of the egyptian paris on the place where the pursuing army had encamped and named it el askar or the contentments the site was a little to the northeast of fustat on a part of the further hamra which had been occupied three by three tribes at the time of the arab conquest 
but had since been abandoned and become desert here a faubourg grew up which extended from fustat to the hill of yesker on which the mosque of ibn tulan now stands a mosque was soon built and a palace for the governor as well as barracks for his troops streets and quarters and large mansions clustered round the new fashionable centre where the sixty-five wallace who represented the abbasid caliphs for one hundred and eighteen years had their seat of government one of them hatim and aten built himself a summer palace called the dome of the air kabat el hawa on a spur of the makatam where the citadel of cairo is now built and thither the emirs of egypt often resorted to enjoy the cool breeze the new faubourg was merely the quarter of the officials and court circles and did not diminish the importance of fustat as the metropolis of egypt not a trace is left of this suburb and the record of the governors who lived there is almost equally fleeting they had a more difficult task than their predecessors under the omayyads hadn't had to suppress insurrections of mohammedan schismatics as well as risings among the arab tribes and at the copse fustad bore unpleasant witness to the revolts and the thousands of rebels heads that were exhibited and the courage of hesitating heretics was damped by the sight of their leader's skull hung up in the mosque of amur the history of the century from seven fifty to eight sixty is one long chronicle of quote, sedition privy conspiracy and rebellion false doctrine heresy and schism end of quote. but the disturbance has hardly affected the prosperous capital the vagaries of some of the governors were much more vexatious to the quiet citizens abu sali abin memdud in seven seventy nine was a middlesome martinet who showed great energy in putting down brigandage in the country and was so satisfied with his measures that he convinced himself of the impossibility of theft in the towns confiding in disbelief he ordered the people of fustat to leave their doors and shops open all night with no more protection than a net to keep the dogs out he abolished the office of the watchman who used to guard the bathers clothes at the public baths and proclaimed that if anything were lost he would replace it himself it is said that when a man went to the bath he would call out o oh, abu sali take care of my clothes and no one would dare to touch them such security argued great vigilance on the governor's part but his absurd laws of dress and general interference irritated the people and his severity was worse than the evils it put down a story is told of the famous caliph harun er rashid which would scarcely invite respect for his nominees one governor of his time musa the abbasid was a man of great official experience and well disposed towards the copts whom he allowed to rebuild their ruined churches when it was reported that he was harbouring designs against the caliph whom as one of the family he might possibly succeed harun exclaimed with his usual levity by allah i will depose him and in his place i will set the meanest creature of my court just then omar the secretary of the caliph's mother came riding on his um, mule will you be governor of egypt asked Gafar the barmecide oh yes said omar no sooner said than done omar rode his mule to fustat followed by a single slave carrying his baggage entering the governor's house at askar he took his seat in the back row of the assembled court musa not knowing him asked his business whereat omar presented him with the caliph's dispatch on reading at musa exclaimed in koranic phrase god cursed pharaoh who said am i not king of egypt and forthwith delivered up the government to quote the meanest creature end of quote. on the other hand a really capable ruler was sometimes sent from baghdad such was abdallah the son of tahir governor of khurasan in northern persia where he afterwards founded a dynasty whose task in egypt was to drive out a troublesome multitude of refugees from spain who had seized alexandria and joined by a hot-headed arab tribe set the government at defiance abdallah in the course of his mission was compelled to attack the preceding governor who refused to be superseded and thus that was blockaded eight twenty six a curious incident of the leaguer was the arrival one night in the invaders camp of a thousand slaves and a thousand slave girls each of whom brought a thousand dinars and a purse abdallah refused the bribe and starved the garrison out unfortunately when his work was done he returned to persia and egypt lost the rare example of quote, a just and humane governor a man of learning and a staunch friend to poets end of quote. a reminiscence of his rule may still be tasted at any cairo hotel in the 
abdallawi melons which he first introduced a greater than he visited askar when the caliph marman son of harun er rashid and himself a noted patron of learning and philosophy came in person in eight thirty two to put down a determined revolt of the copts in the delta and did the work so thoroughly and so relentlessly that there never again was a national movement amongst them and partly by their conversion to islam partly by the settlement of arabs on the land and in the villages instead of only in the large cities egypt began at last to become predominantly a mohammedan country it was the first time that an abbasid caliph had visited the nile the praises of which poets had constantly been dinning in his ears and when el mamen surveyed the view from the dome of the air he was frankly disappointed using the same phrase from the koran as the superseded governor he exclaimed god curse pharaoh for saying am i not king of egypt if only he had seen chaldea and its meadows say not so rejoined the divine for it is also written we have brought to naught what pharaoh and his folk reared and built so skilfully and what must have been those things which god destroyed if these be but their remnants the caliph's visit if it put an end to coptic insurrection brought other troubles in its train his interest in metaphysical and theological speculation which encouraged the study of greek philosophy at baghdad led him among other things to adopt the doctrine of the creativeness of the koran which was flat against all orthodox muslim theory the hated doctrine was made a test question for the kadis or theological judges and the consequences to those who indulged conscientious scruples were distressing a non-conforming chief kadi a fustat was shorn of his beard the worst indignity he could suffer and whipped through the city on an ass the orthodox professors of the hanafi and shafa e schools were driven out of the mosque of amr in disgrace the contumely was the less deserved inasmuch as in those days the jesuits were the one healthy feature of the egyptian government upright and incorruptible as a rule and independent of the governor the chief cadi who may be called the lord chancellor and primate of egypt in one was a firm if narrow interpreter and administrator of the sacred law and would resign his office sooner than submit to his judgments being overruled he was not however disposed to check his people's fanaticism and the suppression of the christian revolt was followed by worse persecution than ever an orthodox reaction began after mamun's death and a new caliph issued a number of petty regulations for the humiliation of the copts eight fifty they were ordered quote, to wear honey-coloured clothes with distinguishing patches use wooden stirrups and set up wooden images of the devil or an ape or dog over their doors the girdle the symbol of femininity was forbidden to women and ordered to be worn by men crosses must not be shown nor processional lights carried in the streets End of quote and so forth the object of course was to furnish opportunities for fines and extortion there is no need to dwell further upon the period of arab rule at fustat and askar the arab governors left little trace and though it is to be regretted that not a single specimen of their buildings has come down to us as links in the history of saracenic art it is not probable that these edifices were remarkable the arabs have never done anything in art by themselves what is called the quote, arab art end quote, in spain was due to a mixture of other and more gifted races and in egypt we find no mohammedan art until the caliphs began to appoint turks as governors one hears a great deal about the misgovernment of the turk in the present day but be it good or bad it is never denied that he can govern in the middle ages it would almost appear that the turks were the only people who possessed the art of governing the greatest ruler of western asia in the eleventh century the seljuk emperor malik shah was a turk the so-called moguls of india Babar and akbar were turks when europe was split up by jealous and ignoble rivalries the great turkish sultans of constantinople wielded power from the danube to the indian ocean and from the caucasus to the atlas most curious it is that wherever there was turkish rule in the middle ages art and letters flourished indeed in many parts art can hardly be said to have reawakened till the turk came to inspire it 
it was not that he could do anything notable himself in art or letters for at least among the turkish rulers of egypt and with an interval of less than two hundred years its rulers have been almost all turks for the past eleven centuries it would be hard to point to many who were distinguished for cultivation it was rather that their strong hand preserved the order that is essential to the work of culture and their unscrupulous levies produced the money that was needed for the beautiful and grandiose buildings in which they loved to see their power and wealth reflected many of them probably had a genuine love of art most of them were fond of luxury and display and delighted to surround themselves with the costly products of exquisite workmanship and a good many no doubt believed that the endowment of sanctuaries might expiate the sins of a life remembering the words of the prophet whosoever builds for god a place of worship be it only as the nest of a grouse god buildeth for him a house in paradise whatever the cause the fact remains that the influence of the turk is found in the artistic energy of every part of the east from the bosporus to the ganges it was to the turks of delhi and agra that we owe the kutub minar the taj the intricate graces of fathpur sikri turks built the atala masjid at janpur the mosques of ahmadabad of gaur of bijapur seljuk turks were the founders of the noble buildings of konia kasaria sivas and other cities of asia minor Othmanli turks built the shrines of brusa and the imperial mosques second indeed but only second to san sophia and constantinople in egypt we find the same thing the first example's distinctively saracenic art appears only when the turk assumed the sceptre up to eight fifty six every governor of egypt was an arab and with the doubtful exception of the mosque of amr not a single monument attests their public spirit from eight fifty six the governors were turks and twenty years later rose the mosque of ibn tulan the first and most remarkable monument of arab art in the country it would take us far from cairo to explain how the turks came to be rulers of egypt the movement was part of that overflow of the peoples of central asia which has been going on from the beginning of history but it was assisted by the policy of the caliphs alarmed at the growing power of provincial dynasts in persia and threatened by turbulent arab tribes in mesopotamia the abbasids imported a guard of mercenaries recruited from the slave markets of the oxus and for a while rejoiced in the protection of these stalwart young turks the old question quis custodiat soon arose in the luxurious and effeminate caliphs of baghdad realized too late that in purchasing these valiant slaves they had virtually condemned themselves to slavery the turkish captain of the bodyguard became the mayor du palais of the baghdad ra van Nayan. the offices of state were seized by the turks and the government of the western provinces was confided to their friends at first they contented themselves with the profits without the cares of office and a series of turkish emirs living at baghdad or elsewhere in mesopotamia held the fief and drew the surplus revenue of egypt through arab deputy governors but in eight fifty six the deputy as well as the fifi was a turk and in eight sixty eight the turkish fifi bakak sent his stepson ahmed ibn tulan to govern egypt as his representative End of section five. section six of the story of cairo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the story of cairo by stanley lane pool chapter three the faubourgs part two ahmad the son of tulan was thirty-three years of age when he arrived at fustat and combined in a remarkable degree the military and administrative ability of his race with the culture of his adopted civilization he had studied under the learned professors of baghdad and even journeyed to tarsus for the benefit of special lectures in matters of arabic philology and koranic doctrine he was critically expert but beyond this he was a man of boundless energy an unerring judge of character who knew how to choose and use 
his subordinates his justice if stern was incorruptible and his generosity was superb give to every one who holds out the hand was his motto and every month he devoted a thousand dinars to charity he came to egypt penniless save for a loan from a friend but when he died he left ten million dinars in the treasury an immense establishment of slaves and horses and a hundred ships of war yet he accomplished his economies without increasing the taxes indeed he abolished various imposts and his revenues were due chiefly to the pains he took to encourage cultivation and to give the fellaheen better security in their land for the first time since the arab conquest egypt became a powerful and sovereign state ahmad soon threw over all save a nominal dependence on the caliphate and after overcoming intrigues and subduing three rebellions in egypt he marched into syria and occupied the whole country as far as tarsus and the euphrates fought the armies both of the caliphate and of the romans of the sicilian frontier and united under his sole authority the broad stretch of territory from barca in libya to the borders of the byzantine empire in asia minor and from the euphrates to the first cataract of the nile side by side with this imperial policy ahmad expended infinite labor and wealth upon the embellishment of his capital Quote, the government house at el asgar the official suburb of fustat was too small to house his numerous retinue and army he was not content either with a mere governor's palace in eight seventy he chose a site on the hill of yashkur at the northeast extremity of ashkar next to the house of the emirate levelled the graves of the christian cemetery there and founded the royal suburb of el Kitai, or the wards so-called because each class or nationality as household servants greeks sudanese had a distinct quarter assigned to it the new town stretched from the present ramayala beside the citadel to the shrine of zain el abidin and covered a square mile the new palace was built below the old dome of the air and had a great garden and a spacious enclosed horse course or maidan adjoining it with mews and a menagerie the government house was on the south of the great mosque which still stands and there was a private passage which led from the residence to the oratory of the emir a separate palace held the harem and there were magnificent baths markets and all the apparatus of luxury End of quote. the generals and officers built their houses round about and great mansions soon covered the new site the bazaars were even better than at fustat well built and filled with choice wares the maidan where ahmed and his captains played mall or polo became the favorite resort of the town and if one asked anybody where he was going to, the answer was sure to be to the maidan it was entered by a number of gates restricted to special classes such as the gate of the nobles the gate of the harem or named after some peculiarity as the gate of lions which was surmounted by two lions in plaster the sag gate made of teak the gate of ed darmon so called because a huge black chamberlain of that name mounted guard there only ahmad himself could ride through the central arch of the great triple gate his thirty thousand troops passed through the side arches on review days he stationed himself on a dais and watched the crowd come in by the polo gate bav es sawagliga and pass out by the gate of lions above which he had a balcony whence on the night of the great festival he could survey the whole faubourg and see what the people were about the view from this belvedere reached to the gate of fustat and to the nile and it was a favourite resort of the emir 
the palace was supplied with water from a spring in the southern desert by means of an aqueduct the traces of which may still be seen not that of many arches running from the citadel to the nile which belongs to a much later date the people in eastern fashion naturally found fault with the quality of the pure water to which their own muddy wells and turgid nile had not accustomed them rumours of this reached ibn tullin and he sent for the learned dr mohammed ibn abdel hakam to resolve these suspicions i was one night in my house he related when a slave of ibn tullin's came and said the emir wants thee i mounted my horse in a panic of terror and the slave led me off the high road where are you taking me i asked to the desert was the reply the emir is there convinced that my last hour was come i said god help me i'm an aged and feeble man do you know what he wants with me the slave took pity on my fears and said beware of speaking disrespectfully of the aqueduct we went on till suddenly i saw torch-bearers in the desert and i been tellin on horseback at the door of the aqueduct with great wax candles burning before him i forthwith dismounted and salaamed but he did not greet me in return then i said o emir thy messenger hath grievously fatigued me and i thirst let me i beg take a drink the pages offered me water but i said no i will draw for myself i drew water while he looked on and drank till i thought i should have burst at last i said o emir god quench thy thirst at the rivers of paradise for i have drunk my fill and know not which to praise most the excellence of this cool sweet clear water or the delicious smell of the aqueduct let him retire said ibn tullin and the slave whispered thou hast hit the mark the monument which has immortalized ibn tullin however is his mosque the only building of all his sumptuous little city that has survived the buffets of civil war and the slow detrition of neglect it is the most interesting monument of mohammedan egypt and forms a landmark in the history of architecture two features specially distinguish it it was built entirely of new materials instead of the spoils of old churches and temples and it is the earliest instance of the use of the pointed arch throughout a building earlier by at least two centuries than any in england they are true pointed arches with a very slight return at the spring but not enough to suggest the horseshoe form the topographer relates how ahmad lighted upon a treasure in the mukattam hills at a place called pharaoh's oven and resolved to build with it a mosque large enough to hold the vast congregations that then overcrowded the mosque of el Asghar. he chose for the site the flat-topped rocky hill of yeshkur a sure place for prayers to be answered since it was believed to be the spot where moses held converse with jehovah here the foundations were laid in eight seventy six to sixty three a h and two years later the work was finished and public prayers were held in the presence of the emir ibn tullin was at first in a difficulty how to procure the three hundred columns needed to support the arcades but his architect who was a christian and doubtless a copt footnote he is called by makrizi merely a nazrani christian but had he been a greek he would certainly have been given the epithet rumi el masudi gives a long account of the conversations of an aged and very intelligent copt of upper egypt a great favorite with ibn tullin who used to spend much time in his company and learned many curious things from the ancient man End of footnote. and was at the time in prison for some offence wrote to him that he would undertake to build him a mosque of the size he required without columns he was brought before the emir who said woe to thee what is this that thou sayest respecting the building of the mosque i will draw the plan for the prince answered the christian that he may see it with his eyes with no column save two beside the qibla they brought him skins and he drew the plan such a design was evidently quite new in mosque building but ahmad saw its merits at once arrayed the designer in a robe of honour and gave him one hundred thousand dinars to carry out his plan when it was done he gave him ten thousand more 
and the total cost is stated to have amounted to a hundred and twenty thousand dinars or about sixty three thousand pounds the use of brick arches and piers instead of marble columns was due partly to the emir's reluctance to deprive the christian churches of so many pillars but even more to his anxiety to make his mosque safe from fire he was told that if he built it of mortar and cinders and red brick well burnt it would resist fire better than if constructed of marble and the fact remains that the mosque has withstood the conflagrations that devastated the rest of the faubourg the adoption of the new plan of brick piers instead of columns led to the employment of the pointed arch and the exclusion of marble suggested the plaster or stucco decoration which still preserves its original admirable designs five rows of arches form the cloister at the mecca or southeast side and two rows on the other sides arches and piers with gypsum and the ornaments on the arches and round the stone grills or windows are all worked by hand in the plaster the difference between the soft flexuousness of this work done with the tool in the moist plaster and the hard mechanical effect of the designs impressed with a mould in the alhambra is striking is the difference between the artist and the artisan on the simple rounded capitals of the engaged columns built at the corner of each arch there is a rudimentary bud and flower pattern and on either side of the windows between the arches facing the court which also are pointed and have small engaged columns is a rosette and a band of rosettes runs round the court beneath the crenellated parapet the inner arches are differently treated Quote, round the arches and windows runs a knop and flower pattern which also runs across from spring to spring of arch beneath the windows and a band of the same ornament runs all along above the arches in place of the rosettes which only occur in the face fronting the court over this band and likewise running along the whole length of all the inner arcades is a kufic inscription carved in wood and above this is the usual crenellated parapet the arcades are roofed over with sycamore planks resting on heavy beams in the rearmost arcade the back wall is pierced with pointed windows which are filled not with colored glass but with grills of stone forming geometrical designs with central rosettes or stars End of quote. the general form of the mosque is similar to that of amur as restored the form of every mosque in cairo from the ninth to the thirteenth century the great square court covering three acres of ground gave room for the largest assembly whilst the covered arcades offered shelter from the sun to the ordinary congregation and to the groups of students ascetics and beggars who have always made their home in mosques the southeast arcade or lawan with its deeper aisles was the special sanctuary footnote the lawan of the mosque of ibn tulan has been considerably altered since its foundation the vizier better el gamali made some repairs in ten seventy seven after the injuries inflicted during the troubles of el mostan sir's reign and his son the vizier el hafdal built a marab in ten ninety four but the chief restoration was made in twelve ninety six by the mamluk sultan lagin whose pulpit still stands in the mosque and bears his inscriptions in the footnote where the mirab or niche in the wall showed the direction qibla of mecca towards which the prayers of the faithful must turn and the pulpit minbar and platform dika gave the preacher and the precentors vantage to make their voices heard throughout the crowd of worshippers so far there is nothing original about the mosque the form may have been adopted by the arabs from ancient semitic temples or the great court may represent the atrium of the byzantine basilica and the lawan the basilica itself only supported on pillars instead of vaulted roofs with a relic of the apse in the concave mirab but it was too obviously suited to the requirements of the climate to need any curious derivation the dome and minaret so characteristic of later cairo mosques are here wanting the odd-looking corkscrew tower with external winding staircase like the assyrian ziggurat has a fellow in the tower of samara on the tigris from which it was doubtless copied but the upper part has probably been restored though the tower of ibn Tullin was certainly in existence in ten forty seven when it is mentioned by nasser e krasrell 
but it is hardly a minaret in the common sense of the term footnote macrizzi says kitat two two eighty four that the minaret of the small mosque of akberga included in the azhar buildings and erected in thirteen thirty one was quote, the first minaret built of stone in the land of egypt after the mansuria end of quote of Kalan, from which we infer that Kalan's minaret of twelve eighty four was the first stone minaret known to the topographer he would probably not call the tower of ibn tullen strictly a minaret and he evidently knew nothing of the stone minarets of the mosque of el hakim end of footnote there is no dome because the dome has nothing to do with prayer and therefore nothing with a mosque footnote there is a small cupola over the niche but this like the pulpit and most of the decoration of the lawan belongs to the restoration by lagin in twelve ninety six the central domed ablution tank is also a later addition replacing the original marble basin resting on columns under a roof in the footnote quote, it is simply the roof of a tomb and only exists where there is a tomb to be covered or at least where it was intended that a tomb should be only when there is a chapel attached to a mosque containing the tomb of the founder or his family is there a dome and it is no more closely connected with the mosque itself than is the grave it covers neither is necessary to a place of prayer it happens however that a large number of the mosques of cairo are mausoleums containing a chamber with the tomb of the founder and the profusion of domes to be seen when one looks down upon the city from the battlements of the citadel has brought about the not unnatural mistake of thinking that every mosque must have a dome most mosques with tombs have domes but no mosque that was not intended to contain a tomb ever had one in the true sense the origin of the dome may be traced to the cupolas which surmount the graves of babylonia many of which must have been familiar to the arabs and still more to the turks who preserved the essentially sepulchral character of the form and never used it as did the copts and byzantines to say nothing of western architects to roof a church or its apse End of quote. but if there is little originality in the shape of the mosque its pointed arches and its decoration are worth studying pointed arches occur also in the second nilometer on the island of rhoda as rebuilt in eight sixty one some fifteen years earlier than the mosque of ibn tulan and the architect of this building is stated to have been a native of Fergana on the arxartes there is nothing to prove that this arch was derived from the coptic style on the other hand the bold and free plaster decoration designed by the coptic architect was undoubtedly borrowed from the ornament of his countrymen the arabs have never been artists or even skilled craftsmen they imported persians and greeks to build for them and decorate their houses and mosques but above all they employed the copts who have been the deft workmen of egypt through thousands of years of her history a comparison of the plaster work of ibn tullen with the coptic carvings preserved in the cairo museum of antiquities and those from the tombs of ain s sira in the arab museum shows clearly the source of the floral decorations which belongs to the byzantine school of syria and egypt the kufic inscriptions carved in the solid wood are a purely arab addition and one that afterwards developed into a leading decorative feature in saracenic art footnote there are some remarkable specimens of arabesque wood carving from the mosque of ibn tullen in the cairo museum of arab art in the footnote the geometrical ornament of the open grills is also byzantine as m bourgeoin has established in his exhaustive treatise on the entre lac but it is not certain that they belong to the original building and the star polygons suggest that the grills may have been part of the later restoration home interests did not interfere with ibn tulan's imperial ambitions he played a conspicuous part in mesopotamian politics and almost succeeded in getting the caliph into his hands the oppressed head of islam would have gladly escaped from his tyrannous brother el muwafak but the scheme failed and egypt lost the opportunity of becoming the seat of the caliphate 
the result was that the ambitious emir was publicly cursed in every mosque of mesopotamia he also failed to capture the sacred city of mecca but his reign ended in some glorious campaigns against the roman emperor in which the egyptian forces defeated the enemy near tarsus killed it is said sixty thousand christians and captured immense spoils of gold and silver crucifixes jewels and sacred vessels the success turned the general's head and ahmad himself had to march north to bring his viceroy to obedience Quote, it was a severe winter and his opponent dammed the river flooded the country and nearly drowned the besieging army at adana ibn tulan was forced to retire to antioch where a copious indulgence in buffalo milk following upon the exposure and privations of the campaign brought on a dysentery he was carried in a litter to fastad where he grew worse in sickness the fierce emir was a terror to his doctors he refused to follow their orders flouted their prescribed diet and when he found himself still sinking he had their heads chopped off or flogged them till they died in vain moslems jews and christians offered up public prayers for his recovery koran and torah and gospel could not save him and he died in may eight eighty four before he had reached the age of fifty End of quote his sumptuous capital received many notable additions from his successor kumara wei who fully shared his father's passion for splendid building as well as his imperial policy he enlarged the palace and turned the maidan into a garden which he planted with rare trees and exquisite roses the stems of the trees were thought unsightly and he quoted them with sheets of copper gilt between which and the trunk leaden pipes supplied water not only to the trees but to the canals and fountains that irrigated the garden by means of water wheels there were beds of basil carefully cut to formal patterns red blue and yellow water lilies and gillyflowers exotic plants from all countries apricots grafted upon almond trees and various horticultural experiments a pigeon tower in the midst was stocked with turtle doves wood pigeons and all sorts of birds of rich plumage or sweet song who made a cheerful concert as they perched on the ladders set against the walls or skimmed over the pools and rivulets in the palace he adorned the walls of his quote, golden house end of quote, with gold and ultramarine and there set up his statue and those of his wives in heroic size admirably carved in wood and painted and dressed to the life with gold crowns and jewelled ears and turbans in front of the palace he laid out a lake of quicksilver by the advice of his physician who recommended it as a cure for his lord's insomnia it was fifty cubits each way and cost immense sums here the prince lay on an air-bed linked by silk cords to silver columns on the margin and as he rocked and courted sleep his blue-eyed lion zurek faithfully guarded his master long after the palace had disappeared people used to come and dig for the costly mercury that had formed the emir's cradle there was also a pavilion as large as the dome of the air with a new device in curtains and splendid carpets and a view over gardens town and nile in another kiosk built by his father men chanted the koran proclaimed the hours of prayer and recited verses sacred and profane pious and amorous triste gay tour a tour whilst the prince sat at table with his lady surrounded by musicians as the solemn call to prayer echoed through the merry din he would lay aside his cup and bow his head to the earth in prostration for he was an orthodox though very irregular muslim the topographer expatiates for pages on the wonders of kumaraways menagerie of lions and lionesses leopards elephants and giraffes his vast stables for which whole districts were set apart to grow the necessary fodder the lavish luxury of his kitchen which cost twelve thousand pounds a month and the splendor of his household troops recruited from the predatory arabs and of the delta so brave so terrible and so gallant a figure was this superb prince that his subjects dared not speak much less sneeze as he passed by it is melancholy to think that of all this glory nothing remained after a few years but the traces of the quicksilver Quote, neither the lion nor his bodyguard of vigorous young arabs could save the voluptuous prince from the jealousies of his harem early in eight ninety six some domestic intrigue ended in his being murdered at damascus his murderers were crucified and amid loud lamentation his body was buried beside his father's not far from his stately palace under mount mukatam 
seven quran readers were engaged in reciting the sacred book at the tomb of ibn Talun, and when the bearers brought the body of kumara way and began to lower it into the tomb they happened to be chanting the verse seize him and hurl him into the fire of hell End of quote his dynasty did not long survive him two young sons were ill able to withstand the efforts of the caliph to recover the rich provinces of syria and egypt which ahmad and his son had held in sovereign power for thirty years in nine o five the opposite general mohammed ibn suleiman entered katai massacred the black troops of the tulanids and demolished the beautiful faubourg asgar became once more the seat of government as it had been under earlier abbasid emirs but katai what was left of it after the invading army had plundered it for four months gradually decayed its hundred thousand houses if we are to believe the historians fell by degrees and the prodigious famine and anarchy of the time of manasseur in the eleventh century finished the ruin we shall hear of this terrible reign of chaos in a later chapter but though it is anticipating the course of the story the final destruction of the two faubourgs must be noted here these quarters had become so ruinous by ten seventy that a wall was built all the way from the new palace of kahira to fustat or in other words from the gate of zoela to near the mosque of amr in order that the caliph when he rode out might not be distressed by the sight of the dead cities the ruins of katai and haskar became as it were a quarry from which people got the materials for building elsewhere the whole space between the new karu and fustat reverted to a state of desert except for a few gardens and country houses and though after eleven twenty five the people began to build houses outside the gate of suela the rest of the site of the faubourgs remained unoccupied save about the mosque of ibn tulan down to the day when makrizi wrote in fourteen twenty four it is no wonder that the place beside the hill of yasker known as the castle of the ram footnote this curious building of which a drawing is given on page one seventy seven was built very probably on an ancient foundation by saladin's great nephew s sali about twelve forty five and was used as a royal palace here the abba said khalid hakim was installed by Baybars and nasir rebuilt the castle or belvedere of the ram in thirteen twenty three and the emir of sargitmish lived there and built the gate and round towers it was partly destroyed by el ashraf shaban and then used for tenements makrizi to one thirty three end of footnote where pharaoh's seat once stood and abraham slew his sacrifice became the haunt of the jinn in the eighteenth century an ancient sarcophagus belonging to a lady of the twenty sixth dynasty still occupied the site of the mastaba pharaon and anything brought there were it but a handful of dates immediately turned into gold but now the alchemy is exhausted the sarcophagus is in the british museum where no such miracle has been known to happen and even the jinn have deserted the spot End of section six. Section 7 of The Story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hawaii in May 2021. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole. Section 7. Chapter 4. Miser. On the downfall of the House of Toulon, Egypt reverted to the dependent position of a province of the Baghdad Caliphate. The wards having been laid low by the conquerors, the new governors took up their residence in Askar, but the name was soon dropped, and the cantonments became merged in the city of Fustat or Misr. During the whole time of the rise and decay of the official suburbs, Misr, the real metropolis of Egypt, had been increasing in prosperity. The segregation of the troops and palace officials at the faubourgs, whilst depriving the townsfolk of a certain amount of trade, relieved them from the violence of the black soldiery and the tyranny of the bureau, and left them free to pursue their commerce. A large part of the Indian and Arabian trade with Europe which afterwards developed to great importance, passed through Misr, and the keys were laden with the wares of many foreign lands. It is true, 
For thirty years after the ruin of the Tulunids, Egypt and its capital were a prey to military despotism, and the caliph's generals, weakly controlled from distant Baghdad, did what seemed best in their own eyes. These were wild times in Misr, when a hot-headed youth, El Kalangi, upholding the claims of the fallen dynasty with the enthusiastic approval of the mob, drove out the hated troops, seized the capital and Alexandria, and even defeated a fresh army from Baghdad, till, after eight months of amazing impudence, he was betrayed and executed. 906. As if this were not enough diversion for a generation, the schismatic Fatimid caliphs of Kairawan offered the good people of Misr the spectacle of an African army marching through Egypt, and even attacking the camp across the river at Giza, where the Baghdad army of occupation, under the command of Dukas the Greek, lay timidly entrenched. The Africans were at last driven out, 920, but the state of the country did not improve. The Turkish governor had to quarter his troops in his own palace for his protection, and when he died, his son was hooted out of the country by the army clamoring for arrears of pay. The treasurer Madarai was in hiding. Rival governors contended for power, mustered their troops, and skirmished over the distracted land. And a fearful earthquake, which laid many houses and villages low, followed by a portentous shower of meteors, added to the terror of the populace. The people who profited most in the confusion were the Lord's treasurers, who seemed to have done what they pleased with the revenue. Three members of the talented family of Madarai, taking their name from their original village of Madaraya near Basra on the Tigris, successively held the lucrative post of treasurer or comptroller of the taxes, and one of them enjoyed this office not only under Kumarave and his two sons, but also under some of the caliph's governors, and afterwards under two of the succeeding dynasty. In spite of several reverses of fortune, Mohammed Madarai contrived to scrape together the not contemptible income of over two hundred thousand pounds a year, without counting his rents. But if he largely received, he greatly gave. Every month he distributed a hundred thousand pounds weight of meal to the poor, he freed many thousands of slaves, endowed charitable and religious foundations, and spent from sixty thousand to eighty thousand pounds on each of his twenty-one annual pilgrimages to Mecca, for he was a devout man, diligent in prayer and fasting, with the Koran ever in his hand. It was said of his vast charity during the pilgrimage that there was not a soul in Mecca who did not sleep in repletion by his beneficence. Mararai and the great judge Ibn Harbawey, who used to receive seated even the state visits of the governors, were two bright exceptions in a crowd of petty tyrants. At last, another strong Turk took the reins. If Mohammed the Ikshid, who derived his title from his ancestors, the king of Fergana on the Ixartes, did not leave any monument in Misr to rival that of his great predecessor Ibn Tulun, and if his cautious policy was content with a kingdom extending no further than Damascus, instead of to the Euphrates, he at least restored order in Egypt, kept the African invaders at a distance, waged on the whole successful war in Syria, and maintained kingly state in his beautiful palace in the Garden of Kafur, west of the present Nahasin. A delightful trait of chivalry is recorded in his war with Ibn Raik, a Turkish chief who dominated Syria for a time. This emir was so distressed to find the corpse of one of the Ikshid's brothers among the slain that he sent his own son to his adversary as an atonement to be dealt with as he chose. Not to be outdone in generosity, the Ikshid clothed the intended sacrifice in robes of honor and sent him back in all courtesy to his father. Of course, the youth married the daughter of his chivalrous host. 
In the summer of 935, the people of Mizr saw the procession of the Ikshid's war vessels advancing up the Nile from Damietta and occupying the island of Rhoda, which was connected with the city by a bridge of boats. And in August, the troops entered the capital and plundered it for two days, till called to order by their stern master. After the anarchy of the past thirty years, the firm, if rapacious hand of the new ruler, was a grateful change, and the enthusiastic son of El Kalati, who jumped upon the carved wooden horse that stood before his palace and let fly a pigeon sweetly anointed with musk and rose water at the new emir, expressed the sentiments of the people. The old mosque of Amr recovered its former importance as the chief place of worship, and the Ikshid furnished it with beautiful new rush mats, lamps and perfumes, and himself attended the service in state on the last night of Ramadan, clad in white and followed by five hundred squires carrying maces and torches. On the following day, the lesser festival, he held a review after the example of Ibn Tulun. The army, numbering four hundred thousand, marched by all day long, followed by the household corps of eight thousand Mamluks in shining armor, beneath the dais at the gate of the government house. On the second day of the feast, the emir attended the prayers at the mosque, and held open house for the people. When the caliph sent the ikshit an official robe of honor, with necklace and bracelets, the streets and bazaars were decked with rich cloth and rugs, and the doors of the old mosque were covered with gold brocade, as the emir dressed in his new robe pranced in stately procession to the Wednesday prayers. Footnote. The Ikshid had a passion for amber, and people used to give him quantities of it at the New Year and Spring festivals, and he would sell it for great sums. After his death, his widow's house was burnt down, and with it fifty thousand pounds worth of amber, Ibn Said. End footnote. Those were glorious days in Misr, and the people almost forgot the immense confiscations and severities of the new regime in the enjoyment of its refulgence. Arabic literature began to flourish in the capital beside the Nile, though still far from rivaling the intellectual supremacy of the caliph's city on the Tigris, where Persian influences had produced a quickening of varied studies that were long in finding their way to the more orthodox capital of Egypt. Arabic learning was still in its infancy in the days of the Ikshid. Poetry indeed had never died, though it had become mannered and imitative, but history had only begun to be written, Science was scarcely touched upon, save in the distorted form of astrology, and the great names of Arabic literature had hardly begun to make themselves known. The lives of the Prophet were gradually being enlarged into wider histories, and two of the earliest and the most famous chroniclers, Tabari and Masudi, were contemporaries of the Ikshid. Masudi indeed visited Egypt in 942, and though greatly to our loss, he does not describe the capital as he saw it, he gives a vivid account of the Night of the Bath, a Christian festival adopted by the Muslims, which shows us how the people of Misr could make merry. The Leilat el Gitas, he says, is one of the great ceremonies, and the people all go to it on foot on the 10th of January. I was present in 350, 942 A.D., when the Ikshid lived, at his house called the Elect, in the island that divides the Nile. He commanded that the bank of the island and that of Fustat should be illuminated each with a thousand torches, besides the illuminations of private people. Muslims and Christians by hundreds of thousands thronged the Nile on boats, or looked from kiosks over the river or from the banks, all emulous for pleasure, and outdoing each other in their display and dress, gold and silver vessels and jewels. The sound of music was heard all about, with singing and dancing. It was a splendid night, the best in all Misr for beauty and gaiety. The doors of the separate quarters were left open, 
instead being barred as usual at sunset, and most people based in the Nile confident in its power, on that night, of preventing and curing all illnesses. The traveller tells how people came to the Ikshit and begged to be allowed to dig for treasure, the clue to which they said they had found in ancient manuscripts, but when permission was given, the treasure-seekers found only caves full of statues of bone and dust. In short, they had opened some mummy pits. Masudi mentions the two nilometers on the island of Rhoda, which he calls the island of the shipbuilders, the first built by Osama and still in general use, the second made, or rather restored, by Ibn Tulun, being used only for very high niles, and he saw the bridges connecting Mizr with the island and the island with Giza on the west bank. He met merchants from Constantinople at Mizr, but of the city itself he tells us nothing. From Ibn Said and others, however, we learn that the Ikshid built a new dockyard at Mizr, which took the place of the inconvenient docks on the island of Roda, where a garden and pleasure house were laid out instead, and it was characteristic of his parsimony that when the estimate was laid before him he exclaimed, What? Thirty thousand dinars for a pleasure garden? and immediately cut the cost down to five thousand. As the dockyard of Roda was superseded by that of Miser, so was the latter replaced by the port of Max, a mile lower down the river, in the next generation. The Ikshit's economical pleasure house on the island has left no traces, but the Roda was a favorite resort of successive rulers, and his building was doubtless pulled down to make way for the Hadak or Litter Pavilion of El Amir and the more elaborate constructions of the Ayubids. The great business of men of learning in those days was the interpretation of the sacred law as laid down in the Quran, in the traditions of the Prophet, and in the decisions of the canonical theologians. A Mohammedan lawyer was necessarily a divine, since the law depended on revelation, and the earliest scholars of Miser were chiefly theological jurisconsults. Of the four recognized schools of orthodoxy, the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, and Hanbali, the Malikis and the Shafi'is each had fifteen porticos in the mosque of Amr, to only three for the Hanafis, and the great court rang with their disputes. To us their distinctions may seem trivial, but to the Muslims of that age they were quite as vital as the filioque was to the Orthodox Eastern Church, or the difference between Er and Er to the Copts. The divines waxed so furious in their arguments in the old mosque that the Ikshid was obliged for a season to take away their rush mats and cushions and close the mosque except at prayer time. Mosques were then, as some are still, the academies of Islam, and not merely divinity schools. In the old days before Muhammad, the Arabian poets used to recite their verses at the great fairs before critical audiences of their countrymen. In Muhammadan times, the criticism of authors was equally public, but in a different fashion. When a man had produced something he thought particularly good, he hastened to the mosque to share it with his critics. He was sure to find them there, doctors learned in the law, poets, commentators, seated cross-legged on their carpets and the arched porticos round the court, expounding the refinements of style to a circle of squatting students. To this audience he would recite his latest achievement, proud but tremulous. It must have been a searching ordeal, for the listeners were some of them rivals, and all of them keen critics, on the alert for the least flaw, the slightest halt in the rhythm, the smallest lapse from the purity of the classical idiom. They had, too, a way of expressing their opinions which was more forcible than kind. There was a hot debate, much citing of precedents and quoting of the masters, exploring of memory, and examination of texts. The newcomer defended his diction and produced his authorities. The rest cut him up in remorseless verbal vivisection. 
It was not only theology that echoed in the mosque of Amr in the days of the Ikshid. Though the long list of worthies, whose biographies even side unrolls in his String of Trinkets of the Fustant Bride, consists preponderantly of lawyers and divines, men primed with serried precedents and tenacious of the authentic tracing of traditions, these were not all. There were the family of the Taba Taba, famous descendants of Ali, poets every one, whose verse is full of the love of nature and of love itself, and not a little of the joys of wine, always forbidden, but not the less dear to the poets of all ages of Islam. Did not one of these poets sing something like this? Griggs chirp in the sand, the moon is on high, the breeze curls the runnel, clouds fleck the sky, great trees swing with joy and merrily crack. Now brim me the beaker, ere life turns its back, no friendships so knit that time cannot split. There was Abu al-Fadl of the distinguished family of El Furat, who, though a mighty authority on traditions, did not disdain, any more than many other learned doctors, to write a good verse now and then, though his vein might be serious. Whose soul is dark, a quiet life is his, no night's unease. When the storm breaks, it spares the low but fells the tallest trees. Even Mansur the lawyer condescended to a somewhat staid vein of verse, though it was he who stirred up such a turmoil by his pronouncement on the question of the legal maintenance of divorced wives in the days of Governor Ducasse, that he had to be protected by troops, and there was a terrible scene of swords drawn and knives about his beer when the people believed that he had been murdered by a judge who disagreed with him. The Qadi el Bakar the aged court poet, had such a fund of delightful anecdote that the Ikshid would often send for him of an evening and beg for a story, were it only a finger's length. It was this genial old bard who wrote the lines about the morning cup and the enjoyment of that good comrade, life, ending, Allah, give me not peace, O God, I ask not content, only a waste to embrace and a wine cup never spent. Miser had its merits in this respect, for as Zeynebi wrote, My home is in Fustat, blame me ye who chide, where the musket vines are, there do I abide. Egypt, I'll not leave thee, reason need I hide? The celebrated author El Musebihi comes rather later, for he was not born till 977, but his work is typical of the 10th century in Egypt. Thirty books he wrote, numbering nearly 40,000 pages, and their subjects ranged over poetry and criticism, the history of Egypt and religion, treatises on wine and joviality, on choice repasts and cookery, on astrology and demons, dreams, wishes and oaths, anecdotes and maxims, besides subjects that are best described as curious. Literature owed much to the pleasure-loving court of the Abyssinian slave Kafur, that is, Camphor, who, after the Ikshid's death in 946, ruled the land for twenty-two years, first as regent over his late master's two sons, who lived and died in luxurious and inactive obscurity, and for the last two or three years as titular prince of Egypt. There are few quainter figures in history than this jolly black eunuch, with his huge paunch, his bandy legs, and his immense cloven underlip, of which his guest, the poet El Mutanebi, last of the classic Arabians, made such fun when he found that his panegyrics of the Black Prince brought him less returns, large as they were, than he expected. Kafur was at once the Lucullus and the Mecenas of his age. He had contrived to acquire some cultivation, as most clever slaves did, and he loved to surround himself with poets and critics, and listen to their discussions of an evening, or make them read him the history of the caliphs of old. 
serious scholars attended his reunions. There might be seen El Kindi, the chronicler of the excellencies of Egypt, Fadail Misr, to whom Makrisi owed so much, El Bakhtari, the learned grammarian, as well as Ibn El Asim, whose light lyrics won him the title of the castanetist of the soul. Kafur could appreciate them all. Like all blacks, he delighted in music. He had control of vast sums of money, and he scattered it liberally among his literary friends, who repaid him in fulsome flattery. When the castanetist of the soul explained in choice verse that the frequent earthquakes of the time were due to Egypt's dancing for joy at Kafur's virtues, the pleased Ethiopian threw him a thousand dinars. On his table, camphor was lavish. He had the black's jolly sensuality. The daily provision for his kitchen consisted in one hundred sheep, one hundred lambs, two hundred fifty geese, five hundred fowls, one thousand pigeons and other birds, and one hundred jars of sweets. The daily consumption amounted to one thousand seven hundred pounds of meat, besides fowls and sweets, and fifty skins of liquor were allowed to the servants alone. A favourite drink was quince cider, for which the Cadi of Asyut sent fifty thousand quince apples every season. In spite of a stern and unimaginative religion, in spite of fatalism and all its paralyzing effects, the medieval Arabs managed to enjoy life, just as their forefathers of the desert did. The wonderful thing about this old Mohammedan society is that it was what it was, in spite of Mohammedanism. With all their prayers and fasts and irritating ritual, the Muslims of the Middle Ages contrived to amuse themselves. Even in their religion they found opportunities for enjoyment. They made the most of the festivals of the faith, and put on their best clothes and made up parties, to visit the tombs perhaps, but to visit them cheerfully, and they tipped all their servants, that they too might go out and amuse themselves in the gaily illuminated streets filled with dancers and singers and reciters, or in the mosques where the dervishes were performing their strange and revolting rites. Such diversions gave a relish to life, even though a man had his destiny inscribed in the sutures of his skull, and some ascetic souls found a consolation in staring at a blank wall till they saw the name of Allah blazing on it. But the great amusement of the medieval Muslim was feasting. It is true that the Arabs did not understand scientific cookery or aesthetic gastronomy. They drank to get drunk and ate to get full. We read of a public banquet where the table was covered with twenty-one enormous dishes, each containing twenty-one baked sheep, three years old and fat, and three hundred fifty pigeons and fowls, all piled up together to the height of a man, and covered in with dried sweetmeats. Between these dishes were five hundred smaller plats, each holding seven fowls and the usual complement of sweetmeats. The table was strewn with flowers and cakes of bread, and two grand edifices of sweetmeats, each weighing seventeen hundredweight, were brought in on shoulder poles. A man might eat a sheep or two without being too remarkable, and if he ate hugely, he washed it down with plenty of wine, in spite of all the prophet's laws. The Arab's cup held a good pint, and he refilled it pretty often. Hence, the majority of the banquets described in the Arabian histories end under the table, or would do so if there were any tables of the right kind. There are redeeming points, however, in all this gluttony and sottishness. The Arabs did not tope moodily in solitude. They liked a jovial company round them, and plenty of flowers and sweet scents on the board. They dressed very carefully, and perfumed their beards with civet, and sprinkled themselves with rose-water, while ambergris, burned in a censer, diffused a delicious fragrance through the room. Nor was the feast complete without music, and the voices of singing men and singing women. 
a ravishing slave girl with a form like the oriental willow and a face like the full moon sang soft sad arabian melodies to the accompaniment of the lute till the guests rolled over with ecstasy and rarely was a banquet considered perfect without the presence of a wit such a wit as no longer exists no mere punster though he could pun on occasion but a man of letters well stored with the literature of the arabs able to finish a broken quotation and of fine taste in his compositions and recitations it was indeed the heyday of literary men so intense was the devotion of the caliphs and viziers to poetry and song that they would refuse nothing to the poet who pleased them a beggar who gave an answer in a neatly turned verse would have his jar filled with gold and a man of letters who made a good repartee was likely to have his mouth crammed with jewels and his whole wardrobe replenished one poet left behind him a hundred complete suits of robes of honour two hundred shirts and five hundred turbans but kafur was much more than an epicure and a dilettante strong as a horse but gentle as a giant his hard work and unfailing good humour were phenomenal he was no mean statesman and devoted much time and pains to the management of public business working often far into the night and then throwing himself on his knees crying o oh god give no created thing power over me his justice clemency open-handedness and piety were renowned and though he left immense wealth in gold and precious stones slaves and beasts he used his possessions in a large-minded and charitable spirit he died in nine hundred sixty eight and on his grave at damascus was written how fares it with thee kafur alone in the grave amid the rattle of the hail who once did travel in the din of battling hosts men's feet now trample over thy head where of old the lions of the sandy waste crouched before thee the warlike epitaph was not very apposite for kafur brave as he was cannot be described as a successful general in spite of the two victories in his earlier days in syria it was to the credit of his statesmanship and his officers that the whole of the kingdom now extending to the northern frontier of syria and including the higas with the holy cities of mecca and medina was preserved in undiminished prosperity and rarely ruffled peace throughout his regency and reign and this in spite of several bad niles and consequent scarcity portentous earthquakes and a disastrous fire which consumed one thousand seven hundred houses in misr in nine hundred fifty four the big black eunuch knew how to keep order unhappily like most great autocrats he left no successor and the weakness of the government of the new prince the infant grandchild of the ikshid invited the invasion which the fatimid caliphs had long been preparing we have no description worth quoting of the city of misr during this prosperous period the traveller ibn hakal gives a brief account of it a little later nine hundred seventy eight and estimates its size as about a third of baghdad he notes its handsome markets its narrow streets with brick houses of five and even seven stories high large enough for two hundred people to live in and the gardens and pleasure grounds surrounding the city the mosque of amr in its midst was still the most striking of its buildings which shows that there were as yet no great palaces or government houses kafur's own palace was outside probably in the park called the garden of kafur though at one time he built a new palace at the cost of one hundred thousand dinars by the pool of karun near the mosque of ibn tulun but the miasma from the stagnant water soon caused its desertion the capital was of course very differently situated from the present cairo the nile had then hardly begun the slow shifting of its bed towards the west which resulted in the formation of the island of bulak or el gezira the river in the ikshid's time flowed under the walls of the castle of babylon 
skirted el Askar, and passed by the points now known as the bab el luk and bab el hadid all the districts of mazar el atika kazer el eni kazer ed dubara and bulak were then under water and the capital spread along the banks of the nile and stretched inland to near the mosque of ibn tulun the best description is that of the persian nasir i kursau who visited Mizr in 1047, 80 years after Kafur's death, it is true, but it is not probable that very important changes had taken place in the interval. He knows nothing of El Katai, and from his description of Mizr as a city built on high ground, and other indications, it is evident that in his day the wards Faubourg was included in Mizr, and that there were still houses there in spite of the devastation that followed the fall of the house of Toulon. The mosque of Ibn Toulon, on the outskirts of the town, was then as now surrounded by a double wall more solid than any the traveller had seen, except at Amit and Mayafari Kin, and a minaret was certainly standing at that time. There were altogether seven mosques in the old city, of which that of Amr was the chief, with its mirab covered with white marble, on which was engraved the entire text of the Koran, and its court crowded with professors and students, and a multitude of people of all kinds, who used it as a general meeting-place for business. It had lately been purchased by the Fatimid Caliph Hakim, of whom we shall hear presently, for one hundred thousand dinars, the mosque of Ibn Tulun had cost him only thirty-five thousand, and he had made some restorations and presented a magnificent silver lamp carrying seven hundred lights. So huge was this work of art that a door had to be broken down to get it into the mosque. The chief Qadi still held his court there. Outside, the gates opened into the bazaars. On the north was the street of lamps, the like of which the traveller had seen nowhere else. He was amazed at the cut rock crystal, tortoise shell, and other delicate work he saw there displayed, besides ivory tusks, ostrich feathers, and other products of the Sudan and Abyssinia. On one day, to be precise, the 18th of December, 1048, he counted the following flowers and fruits and vegetables in the markets of Misr. Red roses, lilies, narcissi, bitter and sweet oranges, lemons, apples, jasmine, melons, dust buyas, bananas, olives, dates, grapes, sugar cane, mad apples, gourds, padrangs, onions, garlic, carrots, and beetroot, though they belonged to different seasons. But Egypt, he adds, is a land of great extent which produces the fruits both of hot and cold climates, and the products of all the provinces are brought to the capital and are readily sold in the markets. Pottery he found manufactured of so fine a quality that he could see his hand through it, and so skilfully coloured that it resembled the iridescent fabric called Bukalamun. There was also a green transparent glass of costly price. All this is amply confirmed by the fragments which have been found among the rubbish heaps of the old city. He saw great bowls of Damascus copper. One woman owned five thousand of them, which she let out at a franc, dear him, a month at the borrower's risk. He was pleased to discover that there was no need to carry one's bottle or paper to the bazaars of the druggists or ironmongers. They themselves supplied the wherewithal to contain their wares. And what was more extraordinary, the shopkeepers sold at a fixed price, instead of haggling for a bargain, and if one of them cheated, he was set on a camel and marched through the bazaar to the ringing of a bell, crying aloud, I have deceived and am punished. May the like chastisement befall other liars. All the shopkeepers rode on donkeys from their houses to their shops, and asses stood for hire at the street corners to the number, he was told, of fifty thousand. Only soldiers rode horses. 
The city stretched along the Nile bank, and kiosks and pavilions overlooked the river, whence one could draw up water by a rope. Sakas carried it then as now in great pitchers on their backs or on camels. Some of the houses were seven stories high, and on the top of one of these was a terrace garden of orange and other fruit trees, watered by a sakya turned by a bull that had been conveyed to the housetop when a calf. The houses were so large, thirty cubits square, that three hundred fifty people could occupy a single house. Some of the covered streets and bazaars had to be constantly lighted by lamps, since no sunlight penetrated to them. To cross to the island there was a bridge of thirty-six boats, but at that time there was no second bridge connecting Roda with Giza, and one had to take a boat or a ferry. Fortunately, there were more boats to be had at Mizr than either at Baghdad or Basra. The inhabitants of the city, says Nasir i Kusrau, were enjoying great prosperity in 1048, and in honor of a royal accouchement they decorated the town with such splendor that he would not hope to be believed if he described it. Indeed, he never knew so peaceful and orderly a country as Egypt, and tells the story of a rich Christian he met at Misr, who owned innumerable cargoes and vast estates, and who, when appealed to by the vizier in a year of scarcity, informed him that he had enough corn in his granaries to supply the capital for six years. The rents of the occupiers of a single khan, or inn, called the Dar el-Vizir, brought in twelve thousand dinars a year, and there were said to be two hundred such buildings. The city which the Persian philosopher described in 1047-8 to was probably little changed in the remaining century of its prosperity. The foundation of Kahira, or Cairo proper, had once more separated the official and court circles from Misr, eighty years before the visit of Nasir i Kusrau, and yet the old capital retained its flourishing position as the commercial metropolis. There is no reason to suppose that it decayed during the hundred and twenty years that were left to it. We have already anticipated the course of history in describing Misr in the eleventh century, and it will be well to finish the subject by relating its destruction in the twelfth. In 1168, Amalric, the Latin king of Jerusalem, advanced upon Cairo, intent upon the conquest of Egypt, which the crusaders believed to be essential to their safety in Palestine. In November he took Bilbeis, and stained his name by massacring every man, woman, and child. Fear of similar atrocities, and the danger of affording the invader valuable cover close to Cairo, induced Shawar, the vizier of the Fatimid Caliph of Egypt, to order the burning of Misr. On the 12th of November, 20,000 naphtha barrels and 10,000 torches were lighted. The fire lasted 54 days, and its traces may still be found in the wilderness of sand heaps stretching over miles of buried rubbish on the south side of Cairo. The people fled as from their very graves, the father abandoned his children, the brother his twin, and all rushed to Cairo for dear life. The hire of a camel for the mile or two of transit cost thirty pieces of gold in that crisis of panic. The smoke rose in dense black clouds to the sky and compelled the invaders to camp at a distance. The cruel measure may have been necessary, though Cairo was saved by other means, but as we look out upon the desolate sand hills that mark the site of the vanished town of the tent and recall the peace and prosperity witnessed by the Persian traveller, it seems as if a thousand crusaders in Cairo would be a lighter sacrifice than the loss of the old city of Misr. Though the town never really recovered from the fatal day of its burning, it must not be supposed that no efforts were made to rebuild it. People are not so easily transplanted from their old seats, and as soon as the crusaders were driven away, the inhabitants began to search for their blackened homes and tried to make them fit to live in. Ibn Guber, the Spanish Arab, who visited Misr in 1183, 
only fourteen years after the great fire found a less melancholy scene than we should be led to expect from the account of the fifty-four days burning he was comfortably entertained at the inn of master worthy funduk abith tana in the street of lamps so called because formerly inhabited by nobles who had each a lamp before his door which still stood close to the mosque of amr and though there were sad signs of the late destruction the people had rebuilt many of the ruined houses and the new buildings are in continuous lines which form a great city with the remains of the former town lying beyond and all around it close by showing how great was its extent in earlier days the attempt to restore the old city did not succeed a sign of the diminishing population is seen in the fact that although ten colleges were founded in and about Mizr by saladin and his successors in the belief that the town would recover not a single mosque for congregational worship was built there after the great fire cairo was rapidly taking its place and when ibn said visited Mizr about twelve forty he was distressed at its blackened walls ruined houses and general state of dirt and neglect there were still plenty of people in the narrow crooked streets and peddlers hawking their wares among the students and children in the old mosque which was covered with cobwebs and littered with refuse the slovenly quays of fustat were still frequented by much shipping and there were sugar and soap factories still at work but the ruin was universal the final decay had set in and the glory of misr was transferred to cairo End of section seven. Section eight of the story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The story of Cairo by stanley lane pool chapter five cairo part one the foundation of cairo proper as distinguished from the earlier city of miser and its faubourgs marks a revolution infinitely more profound than a mere change of dynasty or shifting of site the fatimid conquest which created the new city was a revolution in religion in statecraft and in culture the theological differences that had turned the mosque of amr into a bear garden in the time of the ikshid were hair splittings compared with the breach between the old orthodoxy and the heresy of the newcomers in its inner essence she -ism the religion of the fatimids is not mohammedanism at all it merely took advantage of an old schism in islam to graft upon it a totally new and largely political movement the schism arose out of the succession to the caliphate and resolved itself into the old antagonism between the theories of popular election and divine right the orthodox party or sunnis held that the election of the first three caliphs abu Bekr, omar and othman was constitutional in islam the shia maintained that the divine right of succession to the prophet's mantle rested with his own family that is to say with his daughter fatima's husband ali and their offspring the only surviving descendants of muhammad ali in turn became the fourth caliph but he was bitterly opposed and in the end murdered his children the prophet's grandsons were ousted from the succession one of them hussein endeavouring to assert his rights was defeated and slain and the tragedy of the martyrdom at kerbela has ever since excited the deepest passions of the shia at the annual representations of the persian passion play in the month of Muharram the ruthless persecution of the holy family by the omayyad caliphs 
stimulated an enthusiastic sympathy with their misfortunes but since none of their descendants showed any political genius the occasional risings in favour of the alids were scarcely more important than the last attempts in scotland to revive the claims of the pretender the movement would probably have died out as an element in politics and become a mere tradition or sentiment but for the new development given to it in the ninth century by an obscure persian half conjurer half high doctor named abdallah son of maimoun this man who abhorred the arabs and their caliphs devised a scheme by which the very religion of islam should become the instrument of its own destruction and the persians should recover their power by the unconscious aid of their conquerors his doctrine whilst making use of the alid sentiment of divine right was such that not only the enthusiasts who still wept over the tragedy of kerbala but all shades of dissenters from rigid mohammedanism might embrace he taught that god has always been incarnate in some spiritual leader or imam such as adam abraham and so on to ali the world has never been without an imam but and here came the stroke of genius the imam is not always visible in the flesh the series of spiritual leaders descended in apostolic succession from ali was broken but not the less was there a hidden imam who would reveal himself to mankind in his own good time when he appeared all would recognize the mahdi and abandon the self-styled caliphs who usurped his authority meanwhile those who awaited his coming must strive to prepare men for it though the imam be hidden his doctrine must be zealously preached and in the absence of the mysterious being in whom the secrets of the most high are deposited his missionaries must go forth and call men to the truth a widespread and admirably organized propaganda was instituted a secret society skilfully graduated in advancing degrees of initiation worked underground throughout the mohammedan world but with special success in arabia mesopotamia and north africa the dais or missionaries were carefully chosen and trained to teach such doctrines as their converts could bear to the rude and undeducated they would preach what seemed the plain lessons of the koran always coupled with the imminent approach of that mysterious and attractive personality the mahdi to the philosophic they would use arguments suited to their special views and leading them up through the progressive stages of initiation would finally land them in a philosophy of complete negation these missionaries had nothing in common with muslims they were atheists among themselves and all things to all men their aims were political to upset islam through itself to dispossess muslims and to grasp their power they made use of all forms of religion indifferently all were equally false to them and all were serviceable tools to their purpose they cared not what means they used to secure proselytes to whom they confided only so much of their system as they could safely assimilate they employed the hallowed name of ali and preached the immediate advent of a messiah not because they believed in either or in any caliphate or a spiritual incarnation but because if the multitude is to be made to dance one must harp on some string and these strings happen to twang harmoniously in the ears of the people three signal successes rewarded the brilliant propaganda of the shia or ismailian missionaries the first was the carmathian domination of arabia mesopotamia and syria in the ninth and tenth centuries the second was its offshoot the fatimid caliphate of north africa and egypt the last was the dreaded vemgericht of the ishmaelians or assassins in persia and the lebanon here we have chiefly to do with the second though both the carmathians and the assassins had their influence upon egypt the fatimid caliphate taking its name from ali's wife the daughter of the prophet was the most powerful and conspicuous result of shia proselytism among the credulous berbers the missionary had an easy field of conquest and when he produced a reputed descendant of ali and fatima in the person of the mahdi obeidallah and Kaurawan, the arab capital of what is now called tunisia in nine ten the revolution was triumphant the whole of barbary from fez in morocco to the frontier of egypt which he twice invaded bowed before the sway of the mahdi inheriting by conquest the possessions of the aglabid dynasty of tunis who for more than a century had been the great naval power of the central mediterranean and held sicily sardinia corsica and malta 
the fatimid fleets ravaged the coasts of france and italy plundering burning and kidnapping wherever they went the fourth caliph of the mahdi's line el moiz the conqueror of egypt was a singularly able upright politic and intelligent man an orator a linguist who knew greek as well as arabic and the barber tongue and to all appearance a just and honest muslim of the shia sect footnote as evidence may be cited his complete breach with the carmathians although they were the source of the fatimid revolution twice they invaded egypt shortly after the fatimid conquest in nine seventy one and again in nine seventy four and even laid siege to cairo and forced their way through one of the gates the invincible hostility of moiz to these arabian brigands had doubtless a political basis but had he held the advanced views of the shia propaganda he would hardly have quarrelled with its grand master End of footnote. there was so careful a distinction between esoteric and overt doctrine among the shia that it is impossible to be certain but the probability is that moiz like most of his successors did not share the extreme views of the advanced degrees of the initiate but held koranic doctrines tempered by alid views and allegorical interpretation such was the fatimid caliph who after a progress throughout his african dominions and carrying his arms even to the shore of the atlantic nine fifty nine at length resolved to achieve the conquest of egypt which his grandfather had vainly attempted and which was the goal of his own ambition the barren land and unruly tribes of barbary were not to be compared with the fertile valley and splendid commerce of egypt and his plans were carefully laid for the invasion the conquest was an easy triumph gawar his roman slave from the eastern empire led his one hundred thousand men from kar rawan in february nine sixty nine alexandria capitulated on liberal terms the egyptians exhausted by a distressing famine followed by plague of which more than half a million people died in and around misr led by no competent chief despoiled by a mutinous soldiery and influenced by secret sympathizers with the fatimids made scarcely an effort to resist there were a few skirmishes at giza and then gawar forced the passage of the nile the defenders fled and the women of miser implored mercy a full amnesty rewarded a submission and pillage was interdicted and the fatimid army rode into miser on the fifth of august that very night gawar laid the foundations of a new city or rather fortified palace destined for the reception of his sovereign he was encamped on the sandy waste which stretched northeast of fustat on the road to heliopolis and there at a distance of about a mile from the river he marked out the boundaries of the new capital there were no buildings save the old convent of the bones nor any cultivation except the beautiful park called kaffir's garden to obstruct his plans a square about twelve hundred yards each way was pegged out with poles and the magrabi astrologers in whom moiz reposed extravagant faith consulted together to determine the auspicious moment for the opening ceremony bells were hung on ropes from pole to pole at the signal of the sages their ringing was to announce the precise moment when the laborers were to turn the first sod the calculations of the astrologers were however anticipated by a raven who perched on one of the ropes and set the bells jingling upon which every mattock was struck into the earth and the trenches were opened it was an unlucky hour the planet mars el cahir was in the ascendant but it could not be undone and the place was accordingly named after the hostile planet el cahira the martial or triumphant in the hope that the sinister omen might be turned to a triumphant issue cairo as cahira has come to be called may fairly be said to have outlived all astrological prejudices the name of the abbasid caliph was at once expunged from the friday prayers at the old mosque of amr the black abbasid robes were proscribed and the preacher in pure white recited the kutbah for the imam mohiz emir el mu minim in and invoked blessings on his ancestors ali and fatima and all their holy family the call to prayer from the minarets was adapted to shia taste the joyful news was sent to the fatimid caliph on swift dromedaries together with the heads of the slain coins were struck with the special formulas of the fatimid creed ali is the noblest of gods delegates the vizier of the best of apostles the imam ma'ad calls men to profess the unity of the eternal in addition to the usual dogmas of the mohammedan faith for two centuries the mosques and the mint proclaimed the shibboleth of the shia 
but the change was far more than a substitution of one creed for another indeed thanks no doubt to the politic tolerance of the conqueror and the discreet avoidance of extreme shia doctrines the people accepted the new regime without any outburst of orthodox fanaticism except when the new comers flaunted the muharram festival in memory of the kerbala martyrs in their very faces the majority remained unconverted to the new formulas at least they welcomed the restoration of orthodoxy two centuries later with equal phlegm the real change was political cairo was no longer the capital of a province of the old caliphate or even of a virtually independent principality connected with that caliphate it was the capital of a rival power and that power a mediterranean empire it is true the empire soon lost its outlying african provinces and european islands and shrank to the dimensions of the principality of ibn tulan but the strength and the wealth and commerce of the fatimid kingdom were something new the rivalry between cairo and baghdad between the vigorous young caliphate of the shia and the decaying hierarchy of the sunnis had far-reaching effects in politics and in civilization the naval power and european connections of the fatimids introduced a new element into foreign policy gave a stimulus to trade and modified in various ways the civilization of egypt and syria on the other hand undoubtedly the isolation of cairo tended to a development of a separate culture which was not to its advantage heresy cut it off from the great centres of intellectual life in the arabian world from baghdad damascus and cordova the old intercourse which brought students and professors of all parts of the moslem empire together in the mosques of every great city was impossible in a capital where the mosques were in the hands of heretics hence cairo was out of intimate touch with the progress of moslem studies in the eleventh and twelfth centuries and a few of the leaders of arabic thought or literature were found under fatimid rule in some branches such as philosophy and physical and medical science one would expect to find good results from the influence of shia free thinking and undoubtedly some progress was made especially by jewish and christian physicians but these exceptions do not outweigh the general loss entailed by isolation from the rest of the intellectual world a little later the heretics of cairo might have profited much by their intercourse with europe but in the tenth and eleventh centuries europe had little to teach the class that gained most by the change of government was that of the christian copts hitherto they had their ups and downs according to the disposition and rapacity of different arab and turkish governors but with the advent of the fatimid caliphs they entered upon a period of unusual toleration and even favour the new rulers with one notorious exception were exceedingly well disposed towards their christian subjects and many churches were built or restored during their reigns the caliph el aziz son of moiz who reigned from nine seventy five to nine ninety six had a christian wife two of his brothers-in-law were melachite patriarchs and the jacobite patriarch ephraim and severus bishop of ashmanian were his particular friends the bishop was encouraged to come to the palace and discuss theology with the chief cadi and the patriarch was allowed to restore the church of st mercurius abus Sefain, the two sordid outside miser in ancient times we are told by an armenian writer there had been a church dedicated to st mercurius on the bank of the river but it was ruined and turned into a storehouse for sugar canes then in the time of this patriarch inquiries were made about the creed of the christians whether they believed in the truth or in a lie so the christians assembled and went out to the mountain and the moslems and jews went out at the same time on account of a certain event many of the moslem sayyids came forward and prayed and cried allah who akbar and implored the assistance of god but no sign appeared to them then the jews followed them and still no result followed then the patriarch came forward and the tanner for whom god had performed a miracle followed him and all the orthodox people followed them they prayed to the most high god and burnt incense and cried kyrie eleison three times and god showed his wonders and the mountain moved namely that part of the makatam hills which is near the hill of al kabj between cairo and Mizr this miracle took place through the faith of a tanner who had plucked out his eye in the presence of al aziz and the chief men of his government and the Qadis of the moslems when al aziz had witnessed this great miracle he said it is enough o patriarch we recognize what god has done for you and then he added desire of me what thou choosest and i will do it for thee the patriarch however refused with thanks but al aziz 
begged him to ask for something and did not cease until the patriarch had asked for a certain church which had fallen into ruin so alice's commanded that this church should be restored for the patriarch and it is said to have been the church of st mercurius the patriarch would not accept the offer of money for the restoration but paid for it himself and the work was carried out under a guard of the caliph's troops to protect the christians from the common people of the moslems who had no patience with such concessions to the polytheists one of the viziers or prime ministers of aziz was a converted jew another was the christian ibn nestorius the moslems naturally resented this unusual toleration and, and lampooned the caliph but the harem was on the side of the christians and as usual had its way even under the caliph hakim the exception referred to who certainly at one time persecuted the cops cruelly the great posts of state were still held by christians and though there was much confiscation and extortion under the vizier yazuri in the middle of the eleventh century it seems to have arisen more from physical necessities than from religious antipathy the great influence of the armenian viziers in the latter part of that century evidently promoted a good feeling for in the twelfth we find the caliph hafiz receiving lectures in history twice a week from the armenian patriarch and several of the later caliphs would visit the shaded gardens of coptic monasteries where they were hospitably welcomed by the monks and made suitable returns for their cheer we read of handsome contributions for the support of convents and churches the far from exemplary caliph amir even had a monk for his right-hand man and used often to use a pavilion which he had built at a monastery near giza as a hunting lodge paying one thousand dirhams to the monks at every visit he took pleasure in standing in the priest's place in their church but scrupulously entered backwards in order to avoid the appearance of bowing when passing through the low door the last of the fatimid caliphs el adid had also his favourite monastic retreat in the convent of the virgin some miles out of cairo where he would take the air and gaze upon the blessed nile footnote there are numerous notices of this intimacy between the caliphs and the coptic monks in the work of the armenian christian abu salif written between eleven seventy three and twelve o eight and excellently edited translated and annotated by mr b t a evitz with the assistance of dr a j butler End of footnote if the churches were cared for the mosques were not neglected and though the fatimid period is not rich in the multitude of mosques erected by private benefactors which distinguishes the later mamluk period it boasts at least the two greatest congregational mosques gami of cairo proper both of which were among the early preoccupations of the new dynasty gauhar's first step after beginning the walls of the palace city of cahira was to lay the foundations of the mosque which stands to this day known to all the world as el azar the resplendent the day of its foundation was sunday the third of april nine seventy and it was finished the twenty fourth of june nine seventy two in nine eighty eight it was specifically devoted to the use of the learned and became what it has been ever since one of the chief universities of islam here to this day multitudes of students gather from all parts of the muslim world from the gold coast to the malay states each nation to the special rewak or protocol assigned to its use and here they receive from learned sheikhs instruction in the various branches of the old arabic curriculum theology exegesis traditions jurisprudence grammar prosody logic rhetoric algebra etc over nine thousand students still nineteen o one attend the lectures of two hundred and thirty nine professors in the azhar and not one of them is called upon to pay a piastre in fees the learned men of cairo and many foreign cities willingly impart their knowledge without reward and eke out a living by private tuition and copying manuscripts the foreign students not only pay no fees but receive rations of food from certain bequests one may regret the limited scope and fanatical tendency of the ashar lectures but at least it is a noble example of free education open to the poorest no matter what his race or language and given to all without distinction of class the knots of students sitting round their master in earnest attention or swaying to and fro as they commit his dicta to memory are a spectacle not easily forgotten in every detail they carry us back to the middle ages of arabic culture and show us a zeal for learning neither tainted by 
prize hunting nor cramped by examinations which may teach even western universities something that they lack very little of the azhar represents the original building it has been repeatedly restored and was largely reconstructed in the eighteenth and the middle of the nineteenth century and though there are some fine kufic friezes and keoform persian arches characteristic of the fatimid period its present aspect is modern the square court however covers the same ground as it did when in nine seventy three the caliph mo is after making his splendid entry preceded by the coffins of his ancestors into the new city built by his faithful general and totally ignoring the old metropolis then on fete for his reception himself conducted the prayers on the festival following the fasting month delivered the kutba or sermon with his wonted unction and then headed the procession of his troops escorted by his four sons in armor and preceded by two elephants back to the palace which gawar had prepared for him the fortified enclosure which has given its name to cairo though sometimes called el medina the city was never intended to be an egyptian metropolis it was to be the residence of the caliph and his court his slaves and officials and his african troops the public of misr had no access to it none might pass through the gates without a permit and even ambassadors from foreign states were obliged to dismount and were led into the palace between guards after the byzantine custom Kazhira was in fact a royal compound or enclosure not a public city its high walls and guarded gates symbolized the seclusion of mystery in which the sacred person of the caliph was wrapped and his familiar epithet the guarded city el kahira el marusa illustrates its privacy the original walls were built of large bricks nearly two feet long and fifteen inches broad and the thickness of the walls was such that two horsemen could ride abreast upon them the topographer in fourteen hundred measured the last fragment of this first wall and says that none of it afterwards remained to be seen the original enclosure was about one hundred feet smaller every way than the later enclosure built in ten eighty seven and we may easily realize the length of the city of gawar by remembering that the present bab el futa with the mosque of el hakim and the bab sawela with the mosque of el mayad stand a little outside the original enclosure whilst its breadth extended from the bab el gurayib beyond the azur on the east of the kalig or canal on the west the western boundary running beside the canal is still recorded in the street called bain s serain between the walls at the top of the musky the enclosure was thus about twelve hundred yards each way and formed an area of less than half a square mile about the centre was the square called bain el kasrain between the palaces a name still preserved in the original site in part of the street known as the coppersmith's market souk en nahasin now flanked by several noble mosques of much later date the name explains itself the square which was far broader than the present thoroughfare and formed a parade ground on which ten thousand troops could be marshalled separated the two palaces which faced it and served as the meeting place of the city the great palace of moiz lay on the east the khan el ka lili stands on a corner of its vast ground and the hassanain at another corner and the lesser west palace built by aziz a little later faced it on the other side where the maristan or kalan occupies a portion of its site and on the back looked upon the spacious garden of kafur where the ikshid once had his pleasure house makrizi devotes nearly two hundred pages to the description of these wonderful palaces we read of four thousand chambers of the golden gate which opened to the golden hall a gorgeous pavilion where the caliph seated on his golden throne surrounded by his chamberlains and gentlemen in waiting generally greeks or sudanese surveyed from behind a screen of golden filigree the festivals of islam of the emerald hall with its beautiful pillars of marble the great divan where he sat on mondays and thursdays at a window beneath a cupola and the porch where he listened every evening while the oppressed and wronged came below and cried the credo of the shia till he heard their griefs and gave redress these various buildings composing the great palace were not the work of a single year or of one ruler gawar began the palace on the same night that he marked out the foundations of the city in july nine sixty nine two gates were finished in the following march and a wall was carried round the palace in nine seventy to one 
writing of the wall three quarters of a century later nasir e kusru says that from outside the city the palace of the caliphs looked like a mountain by reason of its lofty mass of buildings but when one drew near one could see nothing of it on account of its high wall footnote he is clearly referring to the palace wall for he distinctly says that the city wall did not then exist in the footnote this original palace was designed by the caliph moiz himself but it did not comprise itself half the splendid halls described by the topographer the next caliph aziz built the golden hall and the great divan as well as the smaller western palace and the pearl pavilion in kafur's garden later caliphs and viziers added and altered and the splendid palaces el kasur ez zahira as they were collectively called included numerous separate mansions or suites of rooms of various dates the great palace alone had ten gates besides a subterraneous passage by which the caliph could cross on his mule led by slave girls to the western palace which was specially reserved for the harem in the eleventh century there were twelve thousand servants in the palaces and including the women the inmates were reckoned at thirty thousand end of section eight Section 9 of the Story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole. Section 9 and chapter five cairo part two monsieur ravais has reconstructed the fatimid palaces and even drawn plans of them from the topographer's descriptions into elaborate memoirs and though some of the details must be regarded as tentative and open to revision the general results probably represent the actual arrangement of the fatimid city according to these interesting researches the great east palace comprised principally three large quadrangles of unequal sizes forming three quarters of a square the fourth or northeast quarter being occupied by the court of the festival an open space between the great palace and the palace of the viziers where the people could make merry on the id days this great palace flanked by the vizirat and the ajar covered the space from the present khan el khalili and hassanain to the jemalaya street where the monastic mosque of baybars the jashnikur stands the various halls apartments and court offices were arranged about the quadrangles and stables and stores formed outbuildings on the other side of the bain el kasrain the west palace ran from where the maristan now stands to the harat bargawan with two wings jutting forward at each end to enclose the bain el kasrain whilst the space between the west palace and the west wall was filled by the spacious garden of kafur with its various kiosks looking on the canal the rest of the city enclosure outside the palaces was occupied by the quarters hara of the various divisions of the fatimid army such as the gaudaris the de lemis the kitama the barkas the utafs the zawila and the north and south greek quarters harat ur rum and so forth the gates of the city were the old gates of succor bab and nasser and of conquest bab el futa on the north the gate of the bridge b el kantara leading to gawar's bridge over the canal the b el farag also called the gate of the sharaya a berber tribe and the gate of saada named after a general of el mo is and the wicked gate bab el kowaka on the west opening to the canal the old double gate of zoela on the south and on the east the burnt gate 
b l maruk so called because burnt down by some fugitive mamluks in the thirteenth century the new gate b l kadid built by hakim and the gate of the barka troops b l barkaya now known as the b l gu rayib some of the modern superstitions connected with the gate of zuela have been mentioned before but it has always been a haunted spot and the fact that executions took place just outside did not improve its reputation the topographer records that the original gate which stood beside the oratory of shem the son of noah consisted of two arches one of which was known as the gate of the arch this was the gate through which el moiz entered when he made his state progress into the new city of Carrera and all the people followed his example but the other arch was considered unlucky and no one cared to go under it this second gate no longer remains says macrizi nor is there any trace of it but the place where it stood is called el hagarin where musical instruments as drums lutes and such like are sold and it is still notorious among the people that whoever passes that way will not accomplish his wishes some say that the reason of this saying is because it is the place of sale for musical instruments which are held in disrepute and the abode of musicians and male and female singers but the case is not as they pretend for the saying was current among the people of el cahira from the time when el moiz entered before this place was a market for musical instruments and the haunt of the disorderly such topographical details are chiefly interesting to the antiquary we must search the records of travellers for more graphic descriptions strangers unfortunately were rare in so jealously secluded a sanctum as the fatimid palace and there are consequently few travellers pictures to add to the researches of the topographer the persian nasir e kusrau was indeed admitted in ten forty seven but he is disappointingly discreet in his account and we gain only a confused but gorgeous impression of the great throne room with hunting scenes carved on the gold throne which was screened by gold lattice and approached by silver steps the best description occurs in william of tyre's account of the mission of the crusaders in eleven sixty seven when amalric was posing as the protector of the caliph though it may well be that the palace had greatly changed in the two centuries that had passed since its foundation the introduction of christian ambassadors to the sacred presence where few even of the most exalted moslems were admitted was unprecedented but amalric was in a position to dictate his own terms permission was granted and hugh of caesarea with geoffrey fulcher the templar were selected for the unique embassy the vizier himself conducted them with every detail of oriental ceremony and display to the great palace of the fatimids they were led by mysterious corridors and through guarded doors where stalwart sudani saluted with naked swords they reached a spacious court open to the sky and surrounded by arcades resting on marble pillars the panelled ceilings were carved and inlaid in golden colours the pavement was rich mosaic the unaccustomed eyes of the rude knights opened wide with wonder at the taste and refinement that met them at every step here they saw marble fountains birds of many notes and wondrous plumage strangers to the western world there in a further hall more exquisite even than the first a variety of animals such as the ingenious hand of the painter might depict or the license of the poet invent or the mind of the sleeper conjure up in the visions of the night such indeed as the regions of the east and the south bring forth but the west sees never and scarcely hears of at last after many turns and windings they reached the throne room where the multitude of the pages and their sumptuous dress proclaimed the splendour of their lord thrice did the vizier ungirding his sword prostrate himself to the ground as though in humble supplication to his god then with a sudden rapid sweep the heavy curtains broidered with gold and pearls were drawn aside and on a golden throne robed in more than regal state the caliph sat revealed 
the vizier humbly presented the foreign knights and set forth in lowly words the urgent danger from without and the great friendship of the king of jerusalem the caliph a swarthy youth emerging from boyhood fuscus procaris corpori facii venusta replied with suave dignity he was willing he said to confirm in the amplest way the engagements made with his beloved ally but when asked to give his hand in pledge of faithfulness he hesitated and a thrill of indignation at the stranger's presumption ran through the listening court after a pause however the caliph offered his hand gloved as it was to sir hugh the blunt knight spoke him straight my lord troth hath no covering in the good faith of princes all is naked and open then at last very unwillingly as though derogating from his dignity the caliph forcing a smile drew off the glove and put his hand in hugh's swearing word by word to keep the covenant truly and in all good faith there is no doubt that the fatimid caliphs were the most sumptuous monarchs that ever ruled in egypt mo is himself was no sybarite he attended personally and assiduously to the details of administration looked to the justice of the law courts managed the army upon which his power depended and built a new dock at mox lower down the river than the former dockyards of rhoda and misser then near the present as Bekaya. mox remained the dock and port of cairo until the shifting of the nile bed brought Balak to the surface six hundred ships were soon afterwards built there and some of moiz's vessels were seen in ten forty seven by nasir e kusrau beached at mox and were found to measure about two hundred and seventy five feet in length by one hundred ten feet in the beam but hard-working and prudent as he was he loved display he would go in state to cut the dam of the canal and spent large sums on the brocaded covering for the kaaba at mecca the holy city now acknowledged his supremacy which was exhibited to the people at the annual feast of sacrifice the palace buildings were all planned by his own hands gauhar had only been his clerk of the works and the profusion of the new city argued the luxurious taste and the prodigious resources of the caliph the wealth of the fatimids recorded by the historians seems almost incredible we read of two daughters of moiz one of whom left about a million and a half in gold two million seven hundred thousand dinars whilst the others numerous jewel rooms and coffers containing among others five sacks of emeralds three thousand silver vessels and thirty thousand sicilian embroideries exhausted forty pounds of wax in sealing them up for her executors moiz himself bought a silk curtain from persia for nearly twelve thousand pounds on which the countries of the world were depicted in their cities and his wife spent much treasure in nine sixty six on her mosque in the Kaira designed by el hassan the persian and decorated by basra painters one advantage of heresy was the toleration of artistic ideas that were apart to the orthodox and the fatimids encouraged if not portrait painting at least the representation of human beings in art which was held to be distinctly forbidden by the prophet the mosque of the cemetery called the karafa however transcended anything ever attempted before in egypt if we accept the stories of kumara way's palace in the wards its plan was the ordinary square quadrangle surrounded by cloisters like the azhar but the decoration was remarkable the fourteen square doors leading into the luan or sanctuary were surmounted by arches resting on triple marble columns painted blue red and green the ceilings were also painted in various colors by artists from basra opposite the middle door was an arch on which a bridge was painted with steps of various colors which looked real painters used to come to see it but they could not copy it we read of two rival artists el kassir and ibn aziz of chaldea protégés of the vizier el yazuri who painted figures the first of a dancing girl in a white dress standing against the black background of an arch seeming as though she stood inside it and the second a similar girl in red 
who appeared to be standing out in front of a yellow arch there was in a house in the Karafa a picture of el katami one of the decorators of this mosque which represented joseph in the pit so that he seemed to stand out in relief the money to pay for the outgoings of the palace with its twenty to thirty thousand inmates and all the luxury it implied was partly obtained by a more rigorous collection of the taxes and arrears than heretofore and by the substitution of a central tax office in the old emirate house next to the mosque of ibn tulan in place of the wasteful and corrupt system of local collectors and tax farmers in a single day the city of miser still in its prime contributed from twenty six thousand pounds to sixty two thousand pounds in taxes according to the season all taxes had to be paid in the new fatimid coinage and the abbasid money was put out of currency the next caliph el aziz was noted for his judgment in gems and set a number of new fashions in gold thread turbans jewelled harness scented with ambergris and gold inlaid armor for his horses and luxuries for the table such as truffles from mokatam and fish fresh from the sea like kumarawe he was fond of strange beasts and imported birds and animals from the sudan but he shared with his father the statesmanlike qualities that no luxury could enfeeble he built a fleet to fight the emperor basil personally waged a successful campaign in orthodox syria which never became reconciled to the fatimid supremacy and he gave egypt an interval of unbroken peace his name was commemorated in the friday prayer in the mosques from arabia to the atlantic and he never failed to stand before the people in the azhar and conduct the service as their spiritual as well as temporal head the mosque known as el hakim's owed its foundation at the close of nine ninety to el aziz and his vizier ibn Kilis, who completed it sufficiently to hold the friday prayers there a year later the decoration minarets and other accessories were not finished till the reign of his son el hakim who set the work in hand in ten o three and placed the final inscription on the pulpit in march ten thirteen hence this second congregational mosque of Kahira, originally known as the new mosque or the brilliant el anwar in obvious imitation of the name of el azhar took its most usual title from el hakim in the course of its history it has suffered even worse indignities than the old mosque of amr when the crusaders occupied cairo in eleven sixty seven they turned part of the mosque of el hakim into a church under the ayyubid restoration of orthodox islam the azhar was disused for a time and as being the chief seat of heresy and the mosque of el hakim became the official place of worship afterwards it seemed to have been used for stables and in the summer of thirteen o three it was terribly shattered by a great earthquake and restored in the following year by baybars the taster by the time that the topographer wrote his account of it about fourteen twenty the mosque was again in ruins by fire and neglect and its roof was crumbling piece by piece since then it has fallen on still more evil days its court has served in turn as a rope walk a drying ground a common thoroughfare a playground which you entered through a cafe a brewery or a bead factory the only honourable use it has been turned to is that of a museum of arab art which for the past twenty years has occupied part of the arcades of the east end where the noble arches and kufic inscriptions still preserve something of their ancient grandeur and formed a fit shrine for many beautiful and curious works of saracenic art melancholy as this vast empty court surrounded by decayed walls and ruined arches appears in the present day there are points of great interest in the mosque of el hakim the arches are the only exceptions to the persian shape keel form two arcs terminating in tangential lines at each end which is otherwise universal in the architecture of the fatimid period this is doubtless due to its early date and obvious imitation of the mosque of ibn Tulan still more remarkable are its minarets commonly called mibkaras or censers from their peculiar shape the heavy square bases however have nothing to do with the original minarets the lower parts of which built of carefully dressed stone with traces of fatimid inscriptions may still be traced inside these ugly buttresses 
a minute examination made by hertz bay and m von Burcham established beyond a doubt the fact that the brick minarets belonged to the hasty restoration of thirteen o four after the earthquake bay bars did not trouble to rebuild the minarets in their former style but put brick tops and probably shored up the old bases with the clumsy cubical casings which have puzzled so many archaeologists and suggested strange theories of the early forms of minarets the cubes may be later however and may have had some connection with the military defences of the neighbouring city gate the remains of the original stone minarets inside these casings are especially interesting since they are the only definite evidence we possess save the small brick minaret of the mosque el guy ushi as to the construction of minarets of the fatimid epoch of which Magrizi was evidently unaware when he wrote that no stone minarets were erected previously to that of kalaun in 1284 they are precisely similar in construction to the later mamluk minarets starting from a square base changing to an octagon resolved into a cylinder a spiral staircase within led up to windows whence the muzins chanted the call to prayer the caliph hakim is one of the best-known characters in egyptian history yet a character so contradictory and bizarre that his biographers are inevitably reduced to the weak conclusion of explaining his conduct by the unsatisfactory solution of mania he was the only son of the exemplary aziz and his christian wife the sister of two patriarchs and is another witness to the truth of the saying that clergymen's relations are no better than other folk emerging from the upper branches of a fig tree at the age of eleven to enter upon the dazzling lustre of the throne the boy had an unfortunate training his governor the slavonian eunuch bargawan whose name is still to be read in one of the lanes off the bain el kasrain amused himself in the pearl palace in the garden of kafur whilst the berber and turkish troops fought each other in the streets one of hakim's early experiences was the presentation of the berber general's head by the victorious turkish guard it was but a short step to the murder of the regent and after four years of very lax tutelage the youth of fifteen assumed full powers as the young caliph came more before the public the eccentricities of his character began to appear his strange face with its terrible blue eyes made people shrink his big voice made them tremble his tutor had called him a lizard and he had a creepy slippery way of gliding among his subjects that explained the nickname he had a passion for darkness would summon his council to meet at night and would ride about the streets on his grey ass night after night spying into the ways and opinions of the people under pretence of inspecting the market weights and measures night was turned into day by his command all business and catering was ordered to take place after sunset the shops had to be opened and the houses illuminated to serve his whim and when the poor people overdid the thing and began to frolic in the unwanted hours repressive orders were issued women forbidden to leave their homes and men to sit in the booths shoemakers were ordered to make no outdoor boots for women so that they might not have the wherewithal to stir abroad and the ladies of cairo were not only enjoined on no account to allow themselves to be seen at the lattice windows but might not even take the air on the flat roofs of their houses stringent regulations were issued about food and drink hakim was a zealous teetotaler as all muslims are expected to be beer was forbidden wine was confiscated fines cut down even dried raisins were contraband malukaya jews malo was not to be eaten and honey was seized and poured into the nile games such as the egyptian chess were prohibited and the chess boards burnt dogs were to be killed wherever found in the streets but the finest cattle could not be slaughtered save at the feast of sacrifice those who ventured to disobey these decrees were scourged and beheaded or put to death by some of the novel forms of torture which the ingenious caliph delighted in inventing a good many of these strange regulations were no doubt inspired by a genuine reforming spirit but it was the spirit of a mad reformer the lively ladies of cairo have always needed a tight hand over them but who could expect to restrain a woman by confiscating her boots the prohibition of intoxicating liquors 
gambling and public amusements was in keeping with the character of a sour and bitter puritan and was doubtless intended as much to improve the morals as to vex the souls of his subjects but the nightly wanderings the needless restrictions and harassing regulations concerning immaterial details were signs of an unbalanced mind hakim may have meant well according to his lights but his lights were strangely prismatic it is difficult to discover the method in this madness at first christians were tolerated then about ten o five began a course of contemptible persecution petty annoyances foolish badges and liveries and other humiliations followed by wholesale confiscations and destruction of churches but the moslems fared almost as ill viziers whether christians or moslems were indiscriminately assassinated or executed the great gahar's son was treacherously murdered in the palace officials of all grades and all creeds were barbarously tortured and wantonly killed a distinguished general after putting down a rebellion which kept egypt in a tumult for two years happened to disturb hakim when he was cutting up a murdered child and paid for his indiscretion with his life yet at the very time when these horrors were being enacted the young caliph was busily superintending the decoration of the mosque that bears his name and also founding the remarkable institution called the hall of science dar el ilm in the precincts of the great palace where learned men of all shades of opinion met together and discussed everything under the sun with the resources of a well-appointed library these meetings of a parliament of religions recall the debates of akbar's later hall of worship at agra nor is this the only point of resemblance between the two sovereigns contrasted as they are in most respects akbar allowed himself to be worshipped as a deity and akim came at last to a similar result and both were led to it by shia influences no doubt those long lonely rides on his grey ass about the desolate mu katam hills those nights in the observatory on the slopes where he worked out his astrological chimeras ministered to a mind deeply imbued with the mystical teaching of the shia he was the imam through whom god revealed himself to the ignorant world he was the only possessor of the divine secrets it was an easy step and illogical to argue that he was the incarnation of the deity that he was god it took more than twenty years to bring him to this point but aided by the preaching of some persian mystics he arrived there about ten eighteen it is true his preachers had poor success in their mission of proclaiming the divinity of hakim one was set upon and murdered to the joy of the orthodox others desecrated the old mosque of amr with their blasphemy and the people rose and slew them derazi who afterwards gave his name to the strange sect of the druzes in the lebanon was hunted to the palace and with difficulty saved by the caliph's personal interposition and ready lie nobody accepted the new doctrine monstrous to orthodox ears and probably the bulk of the people were not even moderate shia but really sunnis of the old school miser was in an uproar and with an ace of a revolution but the negro troops did their savage work the old capital was looted houses were burst open young girls dragged away and a reign of terror silenced the outcry the tortured people gathered in the mosques and prayed for help help came but from an unexpected quarter the black troops had gone too far and their rivals the berbers and turks less out of humanity than mere jealousy of power joined together in suppressing the common enemy even hakim lost his control over the army he also set a powerful influence against him in the harem he slandered his sister's chastity the princess royal refused after this to stand between her brother and his fate a conspiracy was formed and when on the thirteenth of february ten twenty one hakim took one of his accustomed rides to the hills dauntless and unconcerned as ever he never returned his ass and his coat slashed with dagger cuts were found but his body had disappeared for a long time people fearfully expected his return as the druzes in the lebanon do to this day after so horrible a nightmare cairo stood in sore need of rest it came but not at once military tyranny was succeeded by the corrupt rule of a court clique a terrible famine in ten twenty five drove the starving people to highway robbery the treasury was exhausted the very slaves of the palace mutinied and syria was in open revolt whilst the new caliph hakim's son amused himself with singers and dancers and bricked up young girls to starve to death in the mosque 
the luck of the fatimids was not yet exhausted however and good niles a vigorous suppression of the syrian rebellion by an energetic viceroy and a temporary quieting down of the soldiers jealousies gave egypt a quarter of a century of comparative tranquillity the valley of the nile was now almost all that was left to the fatimids their great barbary dominions had completely fallen away by ten forty six and the old mediterranean supremacy had departed for ever syria was held with difficulty by force of arms and though arabia from medina to the yemen and had ramah what yielded homage to the egyptian caliphs its shia emir was nothing less than an independent sovereign the extraordinary fact that for forty weeks in ten fifty eight to nine the fatimid caliph was prayed for in the mosque of orthodox baghdad testifies to political intrigues in the eastern caliphate rather than to any real access of power to the fatimids in egypt however they were still undisturbed a new caliph el mustansir a baby of eight months succeeded to the throne in ten thirty six and kept it by no special virtue or effort of his own until ten ninety four and his long occupation it can hardly be called reign comprised alternation of surprising prosperity and desperate distress in spite of the evil influence of his mother a sudani black who imported many of her savage compatriots to overawe the capital the country enjoyed exceptional tranquillity in the middle of the eleventh century we have the evidence of nasser e Kusrau in ten forty seven to nine who states unconditionally that egypt was then in affluence and that he had never known such tranquillity and security as he saw there the caliph mustansir was exceedingly popular and no one went in fear of violence or rapacity from his government order reigned supreme and the very jewellers and money-changers did not trouble to shut the doors of their shops against thieves the shops in cairo itself were reckoned at over twenty thousand and all were the property of the caliph and paid him from two to ten dinars a month he owned it was said twenty thousand houses five or six stories high let out in lodgings at monthly rents of averaging eleven dinars or seventy pounds a year the houses were well built of good stone not brick and were separated by delightful gardens there were then no city walls the first walls having fallen to ruin and the second not built till forty years later but the lofty houses themselves says the traveller were almost like fortifications and each palace or mansion was a castle by itself there was a space of a mile between cairo and misr covered with gardens and country houses but flooded at the time of the inundation so that it looked like a sea the persian saw one of the great ceremonies of the cairo year the cutting of the dam of the canal at misr by mustansir in person the caliph rode at the head of ten thousand horsemen whose saddles and harness and horse armor were adorned with gold and precious stones with silken housings embroidered with the caliph's name led camels bore litters richly decorated and even the mules had their share of jewelled harness regiment after regiment the army defiled towards the mouth of the canal berbers of the kitama tribe twenty thousand strong descended from the veterans of moiz magrabis fifteen thousand masmuda twenty thousand turks and persians called the easterns though born in egypt ten thousand badawis from the Hagas, fifteen thousand sudani blacks thirty thousand slaves chamberlains officials of all ranks poets and doctors princes from morocco from the yemen from nubia abyssinia asia minor georgia turkestan and even the sons of a sultan of delhi whose mother had settled at cairo the caliph himself a handsome and amiable looking young man clean shaved and dressed in a long robe of pure white rode a mule without any ornaments three hundred persians of dalem on foot dressed in greek brocade formed his escort carrying axes and pikes a great dignitary bore the parasol of state beside him and eunuchs burned incense on either hand all the people fell on their faces as the caliph passed to the silken tent at the mouth of the canal and as soon as he cast a javelin at the dam they fell to with pick and shovel and the nile flowed in then all the world went sailing on the river in great joy headed by a boat full of death and dumb for the sake of luck End of section nine. Section ten of the story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
the story of cairo by stanley lane pool section ten chapter five cairo part three the persian was fortunate in the time of his sojourn in egypt very evil days were in store for it in which cairo suffered its first spoliation since its foundation a century before for nine years ten fifty to eight a naval vizier el yazuri kept the upper hand over the various factions he did his best to deal with the ever-recurring menace of famine and it is possible that the ruins of joseph's granaries near masser el atika which benjamin of tudela mentions as early as eleven seventy represent the storehouses for corn which he laid up against years of scarcity in those days there was no wilcox or scott moncrief to plan barrages and dams and make the great river the servant of the poorest fella if the now at the season of inundation did not rise above the lines on the nilometer at rhoda known by the ominous names of the degrees of munkir and nakir the two angels of the grave a famine inevitably ensued and with the famine came too often plague and misery and hunger led to disorder and crime the cause and effect recurred with the regularity of a machine yazuri's granaries staved off the danger for a while at the capital but after he was poisoned in ten fifty eight there was no one to control the warring factions forty changes of viziers in nine years show the instability of the government the caliph listened to the advice of anybody and men of straw formed his council the real rulers were the turkish troops who united with the berbers and drove the hated sudanis out of cairo the blacks established themselves in upper egypt where their license terrified the people and prevented cultivation the berbers expelled in turn overran the delta and deliberately destroyed the irrigation system in order to starve the fellahin meanwhile the turks looted the capital despoiled the beautiful palaces of the caliphs dispersed their priceless collection of works of art precious stones and jewelry and worst of all broke up their incomparable library of one hundred thousand manuscripts some of them books which orientalists still search for in vain and used these treasures of learning to mend their boots to light their fires or even threw them wantonly out on the rubbish heaps upper and lower egypt being held by predatory bands of sudanis and berbers the capital was cut off from supplies when the great famine began in ten sixty six seven years it lasted without a sign of relief and egypt was nearly ruined terror of the disbanded troops in the provinces paralyzed the fallahin and nothing was done to mitigate the effects of the low niles or to sow for the next season cairo and Misser, deprived of their usual supplies from the provinces felt the scarcity most severely we read of eight pounds being paid for a loaf of bread of a house bartered for a quarter of flour of ladies of quality throwing away their useless jewellery which no one would take in exchange for food and of horses asses and even dogs and cats bought at high prices and hungrily devoured soon there was not a beast to be killed and the caliph's stable was brought so low that his starved grooms could only muster three sorry nags the people began to kidnap and eat each other human flesh was sold by the butchers then came the plague and mowed down every soul in house after house with its sudden secret scythe famine and plague are no respecters of persons the great suffered alike with the poor proud noblemen tried to earn a crust of bread by serving in the public baths the caliph himself despoiled by the turks and deserted by his household even his wife and daughters fled to baghdad to escape the pest owed his daily rations of two loaves to the charity of a scholar's daughter those seven lean years of indescribable misery and crime had never before been approached in egypt at last they came to an end 
the harvest of ten seventy three was bountiful the leader of the turks was cut in pieces small and a great vizier came to the rescue of the tottering state ten seventy four this was better el gemali for whom the caliph sent in his distress better was an armenian but not a christian and began his career as a slave his marked ability had raised him to such high offices as the governorship of damascus and afterwards of akka acre he was the man for the crisis and by a fortunate omen a koran reader was actually reciting to the caliph the verse and god has helped you with better when better entered the presence had you read any more cried the delighted caliph your head would have been cut off the famous general made short work of the turkish oligarchy the leaders were all killed by a treacherous but salutary trick in a single night the reign of terror in cairo was over better was appointed commander-in-chief vizier of the sword and pen chief Kadi, and director of the shia propaganda generalissimo prime minister cardinal and lord chancellor in one he first brought back order in the capital and then marched through the provinces defeating slaughtering and subduing berbers sudanis and arabs till law reigned supreme from alexandria to aswan the peasantry restored to peace and security labored their lands again the revenue rose by leaps and bounds and for twenty years the country enjoyed plenteous prosperity cairo benefited incalculably by the large and noble policy of the great armenian for a century since the days when aziz built the west palace and the pavilion of the pearl there had been few important additions to its architecture hakim indeed had finished his father's mosque and built the hall of science mustansur's favorite residence was his country palace at heliopolis where he had a kiosk modeled after the holy but distinctly ugly kaaba of mecca with a pool of wine to represent the well of zem zem and there he made merry with exceedingly unorthodox sarcasms upon the black stone and bad water of the arabian original with the rule of better cairo once more heard the sound of the trowel in view of the recent invasion and spoliation of the city by insurgent troops the first necessity was to fortify it for defence the old wall of sunburnt brick had practically disappeared in the growth of the town which now spread outside the three gates built by gawar these gates were now taken down and rebuilt of stone eleven eighty seven to ninety one so as to enclose a larger area the greek quarter at the south for example was now taken within the wall and a new wall of brick was carried round the city it was afterwards enlarged by saladin but some of the wall of better still remains on the north it still connects the babin nasser with the babel futa and extends to a bastion about three hundred and thirty feet west of the latter and to a re-entering angle some two hundred feet east of the bab and nasser there is also a piece of the wall among the houses near the bab suwela on the south face of the enclosure and as late as eighteen forty two a portion of the west wall was still to be seen at the west side of the Ezbekaya. The three great gates stand practically unchanged, though the towers of the Zuwayla gate were shortened to receive the minarets of the mosque of El Mu'ayyad in the 15th century. These gates are the most impressive monuments of the Fatimid period, but they are Byzantine, not Saracenic. According to the Armenian chronicler Abu Sali, a copt, john the monk planned the walls and gates for the armenian vizier but whatever share he had in designing the lie of the walls he could never have been the architect of these norman-looking gates the topographer is evidently right in stating that they were built by three brothers from edessa a city full of armenians where better with his syrian experience would naturally seek his architects each of whom built one gate the statement is amply confirmed not only by the style which clearly belongs to the syrian byzantine school but also by various masons marks in greek letters z h h etc in short as m von bircham has pointed out the gates and enchant of cairo belong to what is called the templars as distinguished from the french style of military architecture the great byzantine and saracenic school of which the chief characteristics may be traced in various countries and at divers epochs at constantinople nicaea brusa adelia 
and the pamphylian cities and the old arab fortresses of northern syria in the style of the templars and the military buildings of the post crusade saracens such as the enchant of jerusalem etc the leading features of the style are square bastions and square or round-headed openings contrasting with the persian arches of the fatimid mosques and the round bastions of saladin's wall the curtains run to a thickness of eleven to thirteen feet and contain archers chambers and other apparatus for defence the gates consist of a vaulted passage with round arch between towers containing an ingenious arrangement of shooting floors and connected by a cross passage above the arch with a place for launching stones or grenades upon the enemy a fine spiral staircase admirable cornices some sculptured shields and a magnificent kufic inscription adorned the bab and nasser the inscription like another on the babel futa expresses the shia creed but has nevertheless sustained eight centuries of orthodox rule in egypt unchanged the three great gates are noble monuments of one of the greatest viziers of mediaeval cairo for nearly sixty years egypt enjoyed the inestimable benefits of armenian rule better died ten ninety four the year also of the caliph mustansur's death but the vizier's son el afdal succeeded to his father's power and governed egypt still eleven twenty one when he was assassinated by order of the caliph amir afdal's son abu ali held supreme power in eleven thirty one in the name of the expected mahdi thus reverting to the old shia theory of the hidden imam and ignoring all claims of the fatimid dynasty when he in turn was murdered on his way to the polo field yanis an armenian slave of afdal's became vizier and after him bahram an armenian christian retained the office until eleven thirty seven by this time the growing influence of the armenians had led to their holding every post worth having in all the government departments and their excessive assumption of authority led to a natural reaction bahram and two thousand of his fellow-countrymen were expelled and the heyday of the armenians was over they deserved well of the country and had ruled on a whole both wisely and large-mindedly firm and yet mild the virtual sovereignty of better and his son had rendered immense services to egypt if they had accumulated vast wealth afdal is said to have left over three million pounds in gold and the milk of his herds of cows was farmed in one year for fifteen thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds they earned their fortunes by hard and intelligent work they were just and generous and the copts had much to thank them for even abu ali with his eccentric revival of the doctrine of the concealed imam who actually figured on the coinage inherited the wise tradition of his father and grandfather and showed himself tolerant and mild a good friend to the christians and a patron of learning from the time of better egypt it will be realized had become a country ruled no longer by caliphs but by viziers it was the old story of the merovingian major domo translated into arabic indeed since the terrible despotism of hakim no caliph had exercised personal authority in the great affairs of state except el amir who tried for a few years to be his own prime minister with the help however of the monk ibn kenna but the experiment was not a success the monk became too inflated and was scourged to death el amir's cruelty made him detested and one day as he was riding back from the hawdag or litter the country house on the island of rhoda in which he consulted the desert tastes of his badawi bride he was assassinated by some ismaelian assassins eleven thirty he had at least the virtue to found a mosque the gami el akmar grey mosque in bain el kasrain after this the caliphs resigned themselves to a succession of aziers who were themselves the instruments of military factions the spiritual sanctity and seclusion of the fatimid pontiffs were still observed as we have seen in the description of this embassy of the two knights but one must believe that this reverence had degenerated into something like a farce the murders of amir and zafir the early imprisonment of hafiz and his later thraldom to his drunken negro guards who killed the gallant rudwan vizier soldier and poet in front of the grey mosque and who made the caliph poison his own son by the hands of his christian physician the awful scene of bloodshed in the very palace amid which the baby faiz was exhibited to the trembling court as their spiritual imam 
these do not point to any real reverence for the mystical caliphate of the shia fainant caliphs had long been known to baghdad and their rivals on the nile were equally shadows of a mighty name the last horror was too much even for the long-suffering people of cairo the murder of the caliph zafir shortly after the murder of the kurd vazir ibn s salar the massacre in the palace the peculiar unnaturalness of the crimes on the part of a kinsman and boon fellow the atrocious brutality of exposing the child caliph of four years to the terror of such a scene of blood and anguish roused a storm of vengeance the new vizier abbas the instigator fled from a hail of stones and was killed near the dead sea the actual assassin nasser was delivered up by the templars of palestine for a blood money of thirty thousand pounds to the women of the palace who tortured him and sent him through the streets of cairo maimed and blinded to be crucified alive at the bab zuela in their desperate straits the women had sent locks of their hair to the governor of Ushmanain in upper egypt and the emir talai son of ruzik responded gallantly to the appeal eleven fifty four waving the eloquent tresses he rode into cairo followed by an arab guard and when he had assumed the viserit in the dar el mamun the capital recovered its confidence talai who followed the custom of recent viziers and styled himself king el malik s sali was the last buttress of the falling dynasty he was a man of culture a poet accessible generous and politic his mosque still to be seen near the bab zuela bears witness to his pious munificence he tried his best to turn aside from egypt the storm that was threatening from the political complications in syria and palestine but the palace women found that they had called to their rescue an austere moralist and ungratefully put him to death his last words were a regret that he had not conquered jerusalem and exterminated the franks and a warning to his son to beware of shawar the arab governor of upper egypt the regret and the warning were well founded shawar deposed and executed the vizier's son ruzik at the beginning of eleven sixty three and within the year the christian king of jerusalem was in egypt before turning to the invasion of cairo by the crusaders the conquest by saladin and the end of the fatimids and the death of the last caliph el adid a few words must be said on the remains of the city which the falling dynasty had created and maintained in exceptional splendor of all their buildings only the three great gate part of the walls and the remains of four mosques bear witness to the fatimids the palaces have utterly gone they were not used by their successors and gradually fell to ruin o oh, centura of my love for the sons of fatima wrote omara the poet before eleven seventy four join in my tears over the desolate hills of the twin palaces the hall of science the dar el mamun the palace of the viziers and all the other mansions and pleasure houses of the shia caliphs and their court have disappeared there was no wanton or general destruction the buildings were simply deserted and neglected under the new orthodox regime and neglected houses soon fall to ruin of the few remaining monuments the oldest that can be regarded as authentic is the mosque of el hakim for the azhar retains little of its original architecture or decoration the akmar mosque in bain el kasrain built by the caliph amir is remarkable as the first mosque built of stone the earlier mosques were all of brick only the facade however is of stone well shaped and joined and finely sculptured the interior arches are of brick on marble pillars small and ruined as it is it is the feature unique among fatimid mosques of a fine facade unfortunately hidden by a formless erection which the monuments commission has vainly sought to obtain power to remove very likely the ordinary plain exterior of the early mosques and deserving special notice for the shell ornament of its fluted niche the rosette of an open tracery composed of inscriptions and ornaments and the side niche is surmounted by a kufic frieze two inscriptions giving the name of el amir and the date five nineteen a h eleven twenty five belong to the foundation and two others record the restoration of the mosque by the emir yel buga s salim in seven ninety nine thirteen ninety six but this restoration fortunately made but slight alterations in this interesting building the mosque of the vizier talai ibn ruzik near the bab zuela 
eleven sixty though much dilapidated shows a notable advance in decorative skill and the rich detail of its arabesques is scarcely surpassed by any later work fatimid decoration is well illustrated by several important examples in the museum of arab art especially to be studied are the panelled doors with fine foliate carving and inscriptions of el hakim from the azhar mosque and the three me robs or prayer niches two of which came from the azhar one bears an inscription recording its erection there by el armir in eleven twenty five and the third from the chapel of sayida rukaya of about eleven thirty five the last is a marvel of intricate geometrical panel work and arabesque and kufic ornament unhappily if heterodox opinions encouraged artistic development they also led to the destruction of its achievements had the fatimids not been heretics their beautiful palaces with their thousands of exquisite works of art might have been preserved by their successors as it was they all bore the mark of the beast and the pious folk of later times were only too eager to efface all memories of the schismatic caliphs who had lavished their fabulous wealth with admirable taste upon the embellishment of their city End of section ten section eleven of the story of cairo this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kristen Hand. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 6. Saladin's Castle. Part 1. Cairo at the beginning of the 13th century was a very different city from the Fatimid royal compound. It covered a much larger space, included a number of new buildings of a character unknown in Egypt before, and it possessed a citadel. All these changes were due to Saladin, though he did not live to see them completed. To trace in detail the causes which led to the invasion of Egypt by the crusading king of Jerusalem and the expulsion of the Franks by the armies of Nur-ed-Din, sultan of Damascus, would carry us far away from our proper subject. The principal element in the political situation was the partition of the Fatimid province of Syria between two new and aggressive powers, the Crusaders and the Seljuk Turks. The gradual infiltration of Turkish officers into the Baghdad Caliphate had ended in a great invasion of this race, led by the Seljuks, who not only subdued the whole of Persia and Mesopotamia in the middle of the 11th century and made the Abbasid Caliph their tool, but overran the Fatimid dominions in Syria, which had always been loosely held, took possession of Damascus in 1076, and were only prevented from invading Egypt by the bribes and warlike preparations of the Armenian vizier Badir el Jamali. The Seljuk Empire broke up at the close of the century, but its Syrian fragment, under the brilliant leadership of the Atabeg Zenji, and his son, Nurid al-Din, was little less formidable to the Fatimid authority than the undiminished empire of the Seljuks. Meanwhile, a fresh complication was introduced into Syrian politics by the beginning of the Crusades, the recovery of Jerusalem by the Christians in 1099, and the establishment there of the Latin kingdom. Step by step, the Fatimid garrisons were driven south. The Armenian Afdal, Badir's son, after attempting negotiations, fought a series of campaigns in Palestine, but the advance of the Crusaders was not to be stayed. Tripoli fell in 1109, Tyre followed in 1124, and after a long interval, Ascalon, the last Fatimid outpost, surrendered in 1153. The Crusaders now touched the Egyptian frontier, and their fortresses at Carrick and Montreal by the Dead Sea intercepted communications with Syria. Of the two powers, the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem and the Turkish Sultanate of Damascus, neither was strong enough to crush the other. Egypt was the key of the situation. If either power could obtain possession of the Nile, it would take its rival on the flank and win the mastery. The natural combination would, of course, be between the two Muslim states of Damascus and Cairo, 
but religious sectarianism barred the way. Nur din was a zealous Muslim of the Orthodox school and would have no traffic with Shia heretics. The viziers Ibn S. Salar and Talai did indeed open a diplomatic correspondence with the king of Damascus, but received little encouragement. It was not till his hand was forced by the actual presence of a crusading army at Cairo that Nur din at last sent his troops to Egypt. The interference was due to the quarrels of rival viziers who were struggling over the remains of the Fatimid power. One of these, Shawar, expelled by Durjam, appealed to Nur din and Durjam sought the alliance of Amalric, the king of Jerusalem, who had already invaded Egypt to claim the yearly subsidy. Anua Tributi Pensio, as William of Tyre describes it, which the decrepit Fatimid government had recently paid as blackmail to its Christian neighbor. Shawar returned in 1164, supported by a Syrian army commanded by Sir Ku, with his nephew Saladin on his staff. Durjam, defeated at Bilbis, made another stand at Cairo, where he held the Fatimid city whilst Shawar and the Syrians occupied Misr. Popular as Durjam had been, he was a brave Arab, who had fought the crusaders at Gaza and commanded the Barkia battalion of the Fatimid army. He ruined his cause by laying hands on the Waqif pious benefactions to meet his military necessities. His followers fell away and the caliph withheld his countenance. The final scene was tragical. Driven to bay for the last time, he sounded the assembly. In vain the drums beat and the trumpets blared, Mashallah! on the battlements. No man answered. In vain, the desperate emir, surrounded by his bodyguard of five hundred horse, all that remained to him of a powerful army, stood suppliant before the caliph's palace for a whole day, even until the sunset called to prayer, and implored him by the memory of his forefathers to stand forth at the window and bless his cause. No answer came. The guard itself gradually dispersed, till only thirty troopers were left. Suddenly a warning cry reached him. Look to thyself and save thy life. And lo, shawars, trumpets, and drums were heard, entering from the gate of the bridge. Then at last the deserted leader rode out through the Zulwala gate. The fickle folk hacked off his head and bore it in triumph through the streets. His body they left to be worried by the curs. Such was the tragic end of a brave and gallant gentleman, poet and paladin. As soon as Durjam was disposed of, the treacherous Shawar turned upon his deliverers and called in the aid of Amalric to drive away the Syrians. After a prolonged conflict, an armistice was eventually arranged, and both armies, Christian and Syrian, retired from Egypt without immediate result. But the invasion was the beginning of a permanent occupation. On their return to Damascus, the Syrian troops described the weakness of the Fatimid rule and urged upon Nur ad Din the importance of the conquest of Egypt. The cautious sultan was slow to move, but when the news came that Amalric was again intriguing with Shawar, the Syrian army set out a second time for the Nile and crossed it just as the crusaders came up, 1167. Amalric, however, succeeded in getting possession of Cairo and made the treaty with the caliph, which was the occasion of the memorable audience of the two knights described above, page 131. Sirku, on the other hand, overran Upper Egypt and Saladin held Alexandria for 75 days. Then another truce was arranged, and the two armies went back respectively to Syria and Palestine. The Franks, however, left a resident at Cairo and manned the guards of the gates, quartering a garrison in the mosque of El Hakim, and the representations of these spectators of the weakness and distraction of the government of Egypt brought Amalric back in the following year with the definite intention of annexing the land. This breach of faith, followed by a barbarous massacre at Bilbis, so alarmed the Egyptians that they sent urgent entreaties to Nur ad-Din. The caliph even plied him with the touching argument of tresses of his wife's hair. And for the third time, at the beginning of 1169, Sirku and Saladin arrived in Egypt. This time they stayed for good. Amalric retired without even giving battle, Shawar, after plotting the murder of his rescuers, was arrested and executed. 
Sherku was appointed vizier, and on his death two months later, Saladin was invested with the robe of office in March 1169. As vizier of the Shia Caliph and, at the same time, viceroy of the Orthodox King of Damascus, Saladin's position was clearly untenable, and though he carried on the business of state for two years in this anomalous situation, it was obvious that the Fatimid Caliphate must come to an end. The last of the Fatimids was dying, and the opportunity was taken to make the necessary change. At the Friday prayers on the 10th of September, 1171, the Abbasid Caliph of Baghdad was duly proclaimed in the mosques of Cairo. A similar ceremony is described by an Arab traveler from Spain 12 years later. In one of these Friday mosques, says Ibn Gubayr, the sermon was preached today. The preacher herein followed the sunny rite, beginning his sermon with an invocation conjointly for the companions, the followers, and their fellows, also for the mothers of the faithful, who are the wives of the prophet, and for his two noble uncles, Hamza and El Abbas. Further, he preached so fine a sermon and so moving a discourse that hard hearts were humbled and dry eyes shed tears. He delivered his sermon robed in black, as is the Abbasid rule for he wore a black cloak over which hung a talisman or veil of fine black linen, such as in Spain would be called an ihram. His turban also was black, and he was girt with a sword. As he ascended the pulpit, he struck a blow on the step with the ferule of his scabbard when he first began to go up, such as the congregation might hear, and as though it were a call to silence, and in the midst of his ascent he struck another blow, and when he reached the top, a third after which he pronounced the blessing, turning first to the right and then to the left, standing there between two black banners that had white marks on them, which were fixed in the upper part of the pulpit. On this occasion, further, he invoked a blessing first on the Abbasid Caliph, who is En Nasir Lidini Allah, son of El Mustari, and next he prayed for the restorer of his power, Yusuf, son of Ayub, who is the Sultan Saladin, and then for his brother and heir apparent, Abu Bakr, who is named Saif ed Din, Safadin. The congregation who first heard this bidding prayer in 1171 showed little surprise, and there was scarcely a murmur. The Shia propaganda had probably been attended with little success in Cairo, and the bulk of the people retained their leanings to the Orthodox creed, in spite of two centuries of dominant heresy. At least the revolution was accomplished without a shock. The last of the Fatimid caliphs passed away without hearing of his deposition. His relations were kept in luxurious captivity and his slaves and household dispersed. The palaces were too magnificent for Saladin's modest wants and he quartered the officers of his army there and himself occupied the house of the viziers. The great library of 120,000 books, which had been studiously collected since the dispersal of the earlier library a century before, was given to the learned chancellor, Qadi el Fadil. The treasure was distributed or sold. The palaces in every memory of the Fatimids gradually disappeared, save their mosques, and orthodoxy once more reigned supreme in Egypt. The career of the great champion of Islam was made chiefly outside Egypt, of Saladin's reign of 24 years, for reign it was from the beginning, though nominally subject to the king of Damascus for the first five years, he spent but eight at Cairo, and his greatest triumphs, as well as his few reverses, took place in Syria, Mesopotamia, and Palestine. When he left Cairo on the 11th of May, 1182, and the great officers of the court came to his stirrup to bid him farewell, as the cavalcade halted by the lake of the Abyssinians, a voice was heard above the music and singing. Enjoy, it cried in the classical lines of an Arab poet. Enjoy the perfume of the ox eyes of Nejd. After tonight, there will be no more ox eyes. The evil omen came true. There were no more ox eyes in Egypt for him, and Cairo saw him never again. He conquered the land of the Euphrates, held kingly state at Damascus, which he had annexed after the death of Nur ed Din won his great victory at Hattin over the Crusaders, recovered Jerusalem, sacred to him as well as to Christians, and brought all the Holy Land to his feet, and fought the long duel with the chivalry of Europe, which wavered about Akah for two years. 
and ended in the running fight with Richard of England that has made Saladin a household name even in Europe. After the last dash upon Jaffa and its repulse, the Treaty of Peace was signed, and in the following March, 1193, Saladin died and was buried at Damascus. The Holy War was over. The Five Years' Contest ended. Before the great victory at Hattin in July 1187, not an inch of Palestine west of the Jordan was in the Muslims' hands. After the Peace of Ramla in September 1192, the whole land was theirs, except a narrow strip of coast from Tyre to Jaffa. At the Pope's appeal, all Christendom had risen in arms. The Emperor, the Kings of England, France, and Sicily, Leopold of Austria, the Duke of Burgundy, the Count of Flanders, Hundreds of famous barons and knights of all nations had joined with the king and princes of Palestine and the indomitable brothers of the temple and hospital in the effort to deliver the holy city and restore the vanished kingdom of Jerusalem. The emperor was dead. The kings had gone back. Many of their noblest followers lay buried in the Holy Land. But Jerusalem was still the city of Saladin, and its titular king reigned over a slender realm at Acre. All the strength of Christendom concentrated in the Third Crusade had not shaken Saladin's power. When the trials and sufferings of the Five Years' War were over, he still reigned unchallenged from the mountains of Kurdistan to the Libyan desert, and far beyond these borders the King of Georgia, the Catholicos of Armenia, the Sultan of Koinia, the Emperor of Constantinople, were eager to call him friend and ally. Brief as was Saladin's residence at Cairo, none of its rulers has left more lasting traces of his influence. It is to him that the capital owed the form and extent it has borne ever since, until comparatively recent times. Its most conspicuous feature, the citadel, was Saladin's creation, and its most pervasive architectural form, the madrasa, was his introduction. All these changes were due to his initiative, and when, after eight years, he went away, and thenceforth continually called upon Egypt to send its contingents to his yearly campaigns, he left behind him officers and kinsmen who carried out the great works he had begun. These works were partly defensive and partly religious. The defensive works were the citadel, the new wall, and the great dike, and all three are original features. Hitherto, the various rulers of Egypt had contented themselves with building official or royal suburbs, each half a mile or so further to the northeast. Even the Fatimid city of Cahira, as we have seen, was an official and palatial residence of the caliphs, not a metropolis of Egypt. Saladin was the first to elaborate a comprehensive plan of a great capital. Instead of following the example of earlier sovereigns and building a new suburb, he resolved to unite the existing inhabited districts within one great wall and to crown the whole by a citadel. The burned city of Masur was then struggling to rise from its ashes like the phoenix and renew its youth. Saladin resolved to help it. The scattered settlements upon the site of the ruined faubourgs were also to be gathered in, and the port of Mox was to be joined to its city by a wall, as Piraeus was to Athens. The enclosing wall was to be of stone and to prolong the defenses of better the Armenian to Mox, on the west, and to the hill of Mukatam on the south, and thence to run around the remains of the old town of the tent, till it touched the Nile. The great scheme was never completed. Its author was busy on his Syrian campaigns, and probably his representatives at Cairo had enough to do to raise men and money for his support without carrying out more building than was absolutely necessary. It is also possible that further reflection convinced him or his deputies that the plan of enclosing so decayed a town as Misser was hardly worth the cost of a couple of miles of wall. What was actually accomplished was this. The wall of better on the north was prolonged from its terminus at the canal to the Nile, where the fortified tower of Mox was erected. On the east, the old wall was prolonged southward to the Babel Wazir, near the wall of the new citadel. The Sultan's death stopped the work before a junction had been made, and the south and west walls were not even begun. A large part of Saladin walls still stands. Though often lost among houses, they can be traced between the canal and the iron gate, Babel Hadid, formerly called the Babel Bahur, or Nile Gate, beside the fort of Max, which has disappeared.
were the contrast between the last square bastion of the Fatimid wall and the neighboring rounded bastion of Saladin's curtain, with its bosses, watchtowers, and loopholes, is clearly marked. The same characteristics are seen on the east wall, which separates the city from the Kayat Bay Cemetery, until a modern style appears at the Babel Wazir. A portion of the wall at the northeast angle with the Berg as Zafar lies outside the desert, showing that here only has the modern city shrunk within its 12th century limits. The walls were but a development of the earlier Enciente of Badir. The citadel was a new idea. It may have been partly inspired by Saladin's dislike to the palaces so intimately associated with the schismatic caliphs, for though he did not live to dwell in the citadel, except for a brief visit, there can be no doubt that he intended to make it his residence, as his successors did. But the obvious explanation of the fortress is to be found in his Syrian experience. There, every important city had its kala, or castle, and nothing could be more natural than that Saladin, looking with a soldier's eye at the jutting spur of Mukatam, should at once have recognized it as the proper place for a citadel. It is true that whilst commanding Cairo from its height of 250 feet, the fortress is itself commanded by higher positions on Mukatam, but this would hardly injure its efficiency in days of stone slings and short-ranged mangonels. It was a strong enough position for 12th century engineers, and no pains were spared to make it impregnable from beneath, in case of an insurrection in the city. The work was begun in 1176 and 7 under the direction of the eunuch Karakush, one of Saladin's most faithful emirs, who in spite of great services and warlike deeds has by a strange freak of fortune come to be associated with the ribald antics of Karakush, the Oriental Punch. It was not until six years later that the founder's inscription was set up, which still surmounts the Gate of Steps, Babel el Murdaj, in the original, west, part of the citadel, where we read how the building of this splendid castle, on the terrace which joins use to beauty and space to strength for those who seek the shelter of his power, was ordered by our master, the king strong to aid, Salah ed Dunya wa dadin, Saladin, conquest laden, Yusuf, son of Ayub, restorer of the empire of the caliph, with the direction of his brother and heir to the just king, El Adil, Sayyaf ed Din Abu Bakr Muhammad, friend of the commander of the faithful, and under the management of the emir of his kingdom and support of his empire, Karakush, son of Abdallah, slave of El Melik and Nasir, in the year 579, 1183 and 4. The smaller pyramids of Giza were used as quarries for the stone, and the masonry was executed in part by Frank or European prisoners taken in Saladin's wars. The Spanish traveler Ibn Geber, who visited Cairo in 1183, saw the building in progress. Both the workmen, he says, whose forced labor is employed for building the citadel and their overseers, are Christian prisoners of war of the Franks. Their number is so great as cannot be reckoned, and but for them there would be no means of carrying out these works, for only they can support the toil and heavy labor of sawing the marble, dressing the great blocks of stone, and of quarrying the fossi which encompasses the wall of the city though, which fossi is cut like a ditch in the solid rock with crowbars, a wonder of wonders forever. Elsewhere there is another building of the sultan which is being carried out by the Frank prisoners who work here, but even those of the Muslims who give their service in these and similar public works must do it at their own cost, for there is no pay given to any who work here. Corvée labor was no new thing in Egypt, however strange it may have appeared to a visitor from Spain. The citadel was not finished until 1207 and 8, when Saladin's nephew El Camille was king. As the chief residence and stronghold of every successive ruler down to 1850, it has been frequently altered and enlarged by several of the Malmuk sultans, and finally by Muhammad Ali Pasha, and none of the mosques or vestiges of palaces on it belongs to Saladin's age. The old mosque was built by En Nasir in 1318. The more conspicuous mosque with slender Turkish minarets was begun by Muhammad Ali 
in 1824. The Hall of Yusuf, believed to be Saladin's, was part of a Mamluk palace. The interior towers are not original, and the gateway opening on the Rumelia was built in the middle of the 18th century. Still, there is much remaining of the original structures besides the famous Well of the Winding Stairs, 280 feet deep, which was excavated by Karakush. Saladin's walls are still preserved in a large part of the Enciente, though it needs some architectural knowledge to distinguish them from later additions and restorations, and some of the internal passages and constructions date from the foundation. The prevalent use of round, slightly truncated, and well-projected bastions commanding a long stretch of the curtain, the absence of interior chambers or low loopholes in the curtain, and the arc brise or square openings, besides certain technical peculiarities in the masonry, reveal the original work and associate it with the Franco-Syrian rather than the Byzantine school. End of section 11. Section 12 of the Story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kristen Hand. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 6, Saladin's Castle, Part 2. The last work of defense was the great dike of Giza on the west bank of the Nile. Ibn Guber describes it as a gigantic undertaking. The sultan, he says, to his glory and as a lasting work that shall serve the need of the Muslims, has begun to build a great dike of arches to the westward of Misr, and at a distance from it of seven miles. This forms a continuation of the embankment, which, beginning opposite Misr, runs along the side of the Nile like a hill that has been flattened on the ground, after traversing which you come at the end of six miles to the dike continuing it. This dike consists of forty arches, each of the largest size of bridge arches, and runs in the direction of the delta which extends thence to Alexandria. It is a wonderful work, and such as only a king of great foresight would emprise, as a precaution against sudden attack by an enemy from the Alexandrian frontier at the time of the inundation when, the land being under water, the usual road becomes impassable for troops. The dike thus forms a causeway available at all seasons of need. The object of this defense is evident. Saladin had not forgotten the history of the successive Fatimid invasions from the Libyan side, when there was nothing to stop them from marching straight to the Nile, and he determined to be forearmed. Ibn Gaber mentions that there were fears of an attack from the Almohades, who, after subduing all Morocco and southern Spain, had conquered Algeria, Tunis, and Tripoli in 1158, till the frontier of their victorious leader, Abed el Mumin actually touched the western border of Egypt. Saladin did well to take precautions, though the threatened invasion never came. These defensive works against external enemies were accompanied by other measures taken with a view to internal order and content. It must not be supposed that the new regime had no difficulties to contend with. However well disposed, the mass of the people may have been towards a ruler who showed himself so magnanimous, generous, and yet indomitable as Saladin. The traditions of two centuries were not to be uprooted in a day. The partisans of the Fatimid family were numerous and active. Before the death of El Adid, there was a formidable rising of the black troops, abetted by the caliph himself, and Saladin had hard work to put it down. The Sudanese were at last driven to bay and slaughtered for two days till they cried quarter when they were banished to the city. The part called El Mansuria, outside the Zuwayla gate, that had been covered with their barracks, was utterly burned down and the site turned into gardens. So that a few years later, when Saladin rode from the palace to the new citadel, he passed between trees and flowers, and standing at the mosque of Ibn Tulun, he could see the gate of Zuela with no building intervening. Other conspiracies followed, supported by the Franks who threatened Alexandria, and stern measures were needed before the new sultan felt his power secure. So long as there was a strong party sympathizing with the captive survivors of the fallen dynasty, there would always be danger. 
how zealous the Shia still were may be judged by the scene described by the Spanish traveler in the famous shrine which preserved the head of the martyr Hossein in the mosque adjoining the great palace of the Fatimids. The head is preserved in a chest of silver buried underground over which a mighty building has been erected such as any description thereof must fail to portray, for the understanding cannot compass it. Its walls are tapestried with brocades of various kinds, and it is set round with what are like great columns, the same being white candles, though some are of smaller size, the most being set in candlesticks of pure silver or of silver gilt. Above are suspended silver lamps, and the whole of the part above this is set with the like of golden apples, and so arranged as to resemble the chapel at Medina where the prophet is buried, called Er Rhoda. And by the beauty and magnificence thereof it rivets the sight, for herein are all kinds of rare variegated marbles wonderfully wrought in mosaic work such as no imagination can depict, nor can he who would describe it attain thereto with any description. The entrance to this chapel is through a mosque that is the equal of it in regard to the pleasure of the eye and the rare sight that it affords, for all its walls are of marble after the fashion above described. To the right of the chapel, where the head is, and to the left of it, are two chambers, through which you enter the same, and each of these is in every particular similar to this last, and curtains in brocade stuff of wondrous workmanship are here hung on all sides. But the most curious of the many things that we saw was on entering this most blessed mosque, for a stone is set in the wall facing him who enters, which is so extremely black and lustrous that the whole person is reflected therein, as though it were in an Indian steel mirror newly polished. And we saw the people kissing this blessed tomb, where the head of Hosean is buried, embracing it with their arms and prostrating themselves upon it, after which they would lay their hands on the pall that covers it, and then, crowding one on another, circle round, praying, weeping, and supplicating Allah, to whom be praise, for the blessing that pertains to this holy grave, humbling themselves before him in such fashion as melts the heart and overcomes the feelings of the spectator. For this is a wonderful matter and a sight that is awful in its aspect. May Allah cause us to benefit by the blessing vouchsafed to this holy oratory. Such a demonstration, recalling the hysterical emotions of the Persian Passion Play, shows that twelve years after the deposition and death of the last Fatimid Caliph, Shia fanaticism was still ardent in Cairo. Saladin's mode of dealing with it was characteristic of his statesmanship. Despite his gentle and chivalrous nature, he was quite capable of fierce persecution for righteousness' sake. A Muslim of the Muslims, rigidly orthodox and deeply imbued with the puritanical ideas of the theologians with whom he loved to converse, he had no toleration for heretics and infidels. The grievous confiscation and destruction which the Copts and their churches suffered in the Orthodox Reformation showed that Saladin's magnanimity did not extend to matters of faith. But in the case of the Shia, he had to deal with a more powerful and dangerous movement, which had two centuries of dominance behind it, and he met it not by overt persecution, but by a counter-propaganda. The people of Cairo must be taught the true religion, and then there would be little fear of heresy. At the time of his accession, there was not a single college in Egypt where orthodox theology was taught. This want was at once supplied, and Saladin began the foundations of those madrasas, or theological colleges, which have ever since been the leading architectural feature of Cairo. In 1176, he established the first madrasa ever built in Egypt. It was next to the shrine of the Imam Shafi, the founder of the school of orthodoxy to which most Egyptian Muslims have since belonged. The tomb mosque may still be visited in the wilderness of graves to the south of Cairo, but the college has long disappeared. In 1183, the shrine is described as a magnificent oratory of vast size and strongly built, standing opposite to a madrasa, so large and so surrounded by buildings as to resemble a township with its dependencies. Over against it is the hammam with all other needful offices, and the building and additions are still going on at a cost not to be counted. The Sheikh Negum ed Din el Kabushani himself oversees it, being imam of the mosque, a pious, learned man. 
The Sultan of the land, Saladin, has munificently supplied all that is required, therefore, commanding that the buildings shall be well cared for and beautified, and all expenses set down to him. We met this Kabushani and gained the blessing of his prayers. His fame had reached us, even in Andalusia. We visited him in his mosque and also at his private dwelling within the precincts, a small house with a narrow court, and here he offered up a prayer for us when we left. In all Egypt, we did not meet his equal. Besides the Shafi College, Saladin built a madrasa close to the stronghold of the enemy, the shrine of the Hossein, turned the old palace of Mamun into the Sayyaf ed Din College for the Hanafi divines, and built another for the Shafis and a fifth for the Malikis in Misr. In recording his benefactions, one must not forget his hospitals. Everyone knows the Maristan, or hospital of the Mamluk Sultan Kalaun, in the Souk en Nahasin, but it is not generally known that this noble institution was anticipated by Saladin. To quote Ibn Geber again, Among the famous institutions of this sultan which we saw was the Maristan, or hospital, which stands in the city of Cairo. It is one of the great palaces there, spacious and magnificent, and the sultan has been prompted to the meritorious deed of establishing this hospital solely by the hope of gaining favor with God and recompense in the world to come. He is appointed here an administrator, a man of knowledge, in whose charge a provision of drugs has been placed, with power to compound potions with these according to diverse recipes and to prescribe them. In the chambers of this palace, couches have been placed, which the sick folk make use of as beds, these being fully provided with bedclothes, and the administrator has under him servants who are charged with the duty of inquiring into the condition of the sick folk morning and evening, and these last receive food and medicines according as their state requires. Opposite this hospital is another, separate therefrom, for women who are sick, and they also have persons who attend on them, while adjacent to these two hospitals is another building with a spacious court in which are chambers with iron gratings, which serve for the confinement of those who are mad, and these also are visited daily by persons who examine their condition and supply them with what is needful to ameliorate the same. The Sultan himself inspects the state of these various institutions, investigating everything and asking questions, verifying the statements with care and trouble even to the uttermost. And in Misr also, there is another hospital exactly after the pattern of the one just described. Between Misr and Cairo stands the great mosque called after its founder, Ahmad ibn Tulun, which is one of those from ancient times used for the Friday prayers. It is admirably built and very spacious, being at the present day set apart by the Sultan as a dwelling place for strangers from the western lands, where they may abide and hold their assemblies, the Sultan having provided monthly rations for their support. And one of the most remarkable matters related to us is this which we heard from a person cognizant of the facts, namely, that the Sultan allows the strangers entirely to govern themselves, and lays no hand on any one of them, for they elect from among themselves their governor, and his rule they conform, submitting to his judgment in all cases of disputes that arise in their affairs. They are people who seek to live in piety and peacefulness, being solely occupied in the worship of the Lord, and thus, through the favor of the Sultan, they may gain grace enabling them to hold the better part in the way of righteousness. Indeed, there is no one either of the great mosques or of the lesser mosques or any one among the diverse chapels that are built over the tombs of saints, neither any of the various colleges or schools, but is the object of the grace of the sultan, and aid in money from the public treasury is freely given to all who frequent these places, or have their abode there by reason of necessity, in relief of their needs. The institution of the Madrasa by Saladin marks a conspicuous change in the architecture of Cairo. Hitherto the mosques had been of one form only, that of the Gami, commonly pronounced Gama, and meaning a place of assembly, or congregational mosque, where alone the Friday prayers, guma, and sermon take place. The form was specially adapted to the meeting of large congregations. There was the ample east end or sanctuary, where a considerable number of worshippers could kneel under cover, and in case of a great crowd, as on certain festivals, there was the great open court where a multitude could prostrate themselves toward the Qibla. 
The arcades around the court served for professors to hold classes and as shelters for fakirs and mendicants. But these are no essential parts of the Gama, which, as its name implies, is a place of congregational worship. There were only four such buildings when Ibn Geber visited Cairo, and these were the Gamis El Azar, El Hakim, Ibn Tulun, and Amr. The few others that existed, such as El Akmar and Es Sali Talai, and perhaps two or three less important and probably ruined, though built in the Gama form, and used at one time for congregational worship, fell into disuse when the death of their founders or some other cause removed them from the list of fashionable churches. New gamas were always being built from time to time, as we shall see in the next chapter, and they were always formed and form the leading mosques of Cairo, but they were not by any means the only kind of mosque. The word mosque itself comes through the old Italian mesquita, Spanish mesquita, and later mosecha, from the Arabic mesquid, which means a place of worship, but does not imply a congregation. Comparatively few mosques were known as mesquids, and such as bore the name were small buildings used chiefly for private prayer. Another term more commonly employed is zawiya, which means properly an ingle or nook, but in its application to mosques differs hardly at all from mesquid, unless the not unusual assignation of a zawiya as a hospice for poor students or devotees constitute a difference. Both the mesquid and the zawiya were comparatively insignificant edifices, and it may be doubted whether any ordinary visitor to Cairo has noticed a single example of either, except as a decorative feature in a by-street. The buildings which everyone knows and which everyone calls mosques are really colleges, madrasas. They include most of the famous architectural gems of the city, such as Sultan Hassan, Barkuk, Ibn Mushir, Nasir, Kalun, and so forth, and they differ altogether from the Gama, both in form and object. They were not intended or used for congregational worship, but were expressly built for the purpose of theological training, and this purpose radically influences their form. Instead of the great open court where vast congregations could muster on Fridays, there is only a small central square, and in most cases this was originally covered by a flat roof of painted planks and joists, with perhaps a small cupola or skylight in the center. The sides, instead of being surrounded by long arcades or cloisters, are formed of four transepts, each spanned by a single lofty arch. The transept toward the east, forming the Luan for prayer, is deeper than the other three and is furnished with mihrab, pulpit, tribune, and other accessories for worship, since worship takes place there, or may do so, though not, as a rule, the regular Friday congregations of the Gama. Each of the four transepts was originally assigned, or ready to be assigned, to one of the four Orthodox schools, Shafi, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali and in each there might be found a group of students following the instruction of the professor of that particular school. These professors and students often had lodgings in the college, and there were also a variety of lecture rooms, libraries, laboratories, and other adjuncts built in the spaces that intervened between the cruciform interior and the rectangular exterior. The subjoined sketch representing the later madrasa of Sultan Hassan, 1359, will give the general idea of the arrangement. This, then, was Saladin's method of counteracting heretical tendencies by building and endowing a number of Orthodox colleges, state-supported theological seminaries or divinity schools. The idea was not his own. He brought it with him from Syria, where his former sovereign, Nur ed Din had been zealous in founding similar college for Hanafis at Damascus and other cities and Nur ed-Din himself only followed the example of the pattern of the age in Asia, the great Seljuk Sultan Malik Shah, whose vizier, the scarcely less famous Nizam el-Mulk, the friend of Omar Khayyam, had established in splendid Nizamiya College at Baghdad. The introduction of colleges into Egypt, however natural and inevitable in the pupil of such masters, was little less than a revolution in culture as well as in architecture. The old stigma of heresy removed, 
and these new colleges founded, the wave of intellectual commerce once more flowed to Cairo from all parts of the Muslim world. The chief control in Egypt during Saladin's long absence was vested in his brother or son, subject to the counsels of his chancellor, the Qadi el-Fadil, an Arab of Ascalon, a learned scholar and a wise man, whose very ornate dispatches concealed a vast amount of sound sense. Under his influence, foreign students began again to frequent the mosque of Cairo, and Egypt rejoined the Committee of Islam. Professors from remote cities of Persia or even from beyond the Oxus met the learned men of Cordoba and Seville. In 1176, for example, there arrived a stranger from Zatavia in distant Andalusia, drawn eastward by the fame of the revival of learning. It was Ibn Firo who had composed a massy poem of 1,173 verses upon the Verae Lectiones in the Quran, simply for the greater glory of God. This marvel of erudition modestly confessed that his memory was burdened with enough sciences to break down a camel. Nevertheless, when it came to lecturing to his crowded audiences, he never uttered a superfluous word. It was no wonder that the Qadi el-Fadil, chief judge and governor of Egypt under Saladin, lodged him in his own house and buried him in his private mausoleum. The presence of such philosophers tempered with cool wisdom the impetuous fire of the predatory chiefs. Many of the great soldiers of that age delighted in the society of men of culture. Nur ad-Din was devoted to the society of the learned, and poets and men of letters gathered round his court, whilst Saladin took a peculiar pleasure in the conversation of grave theologians and solemn jurists. I found him, wrote Abd el-Latif, the Baghdad physician, a great prince, whose appearance inspired at once respect and love, who was approachable, deeply intellectual, gracious, and noble in his thoughts. I found him surrounded by a large concourse of learned men who were discussing various sciences. He listened with pleasure and took part in their conversation. It was not the least of Saladin's titles to fame that he brought the collegiate mosque to Cairo. The training of the madrasa may have been narrow and bigoted, but it was the system of the whole Muslim world, and its adoption put Cairo in touch with the thought of the other leading centers of Islam. End of section 12. Section 13 of the Story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Leanpool Section 13, The Dome Builders, Part 1 Chapter 7, The Dome Builders 1. The Mamluks of the River Saladin had raised Cairo once more to the rank of an imperial capital. By his fortifications he had strengthened it against attack, and by his theological foundations he had united it to the great comedy of Muslim culture. He had no doubt added seriously to the responsibilities of future rulers of Egypt, who found themselves engaged in controversy, diplomacy, or war with the minor rulers of Syrian cities, members of Saladin's kindred, as well as with the Franks of the coast of Palestine, who had not yet abandoned the dream of Jerusalem Liberata, and were now fully aware that the roads of the Holy City, circuitous as it might seem, lay through Egypt. It is no part of the story of Cairo to relate the campaigns waged by Saladin's brilliant brother, El Adil Saifeddin, the noble Safadine of the Talisman, the friend of King Richard, who actually gave the accolade of Christian knighthood to one of Safadine's sons, is Humphrey of Toron and given it before to Saladin himself. Succeeding, after a brief interval, to his brother's empire in 1200, El Adil soon showed that the loss of the hero was not irreparable. He had loyally served Saladin as his right hand for a quarter of a century, and for another quarter of a century he held together the empire which his nephews and cousins were doing their best to shatter into fragments. He prudently kept on terms with the Franks by the cession of a couple of ports in Palestine, and such hostilities as took place in spite of his concessions did not lower his prestige. He is described by one who knew him as a man of immense experience and information and much foresight, physically robust and high-spirited, and capable of eating a whole lamb in a meal. A contemporary Arabic poet dwells on his extraordinary alertness and personal control of every part of his wide dominions. 
a monarch whose majestic air fills all the range of sight whose care fills all the regions everywhere who such a war doth keep that save where he doth set his lance and rest to check the foe's advance his eye with bright and piercing glance knows neither rest nor sleep even his vigilance however could not avert that periodical calamity of medieval Egypt and insufficient inundation of the Nile, and its usual concomitants, plague, pestilence, and famine. This happened in 1201 and was repeated in 1202, and the results were exceptionally disastrous. We have the appealing narrative of an eyewitness of undoubted veracity and professional experience for this time of war. The Baghdad physician, Abd al Lati, who lived at Cairo for ten years, 1194 to 1204, Attending the professors' lectures at the Azhar Mosque, records the terrible experiences of the famine. The distress was so desperate that the inhabitants emigrated in crowds, whole quarters and villages were deserted, and those who remained abandoned themselves to atrocious practices. People habitually ate human flesh, even parents killed and cooked their own children, and a wife was found eating her dead husband raw. Men waylaid women in the streets to seize their infants. The very graves were ransacked for food. This went on from end to end of Egypt. The roads were death traps. Assassination and robbery reigned unchecked. And women were outraged by the multitude of reprobates whom anarchy and despair had set loose. Three girls were sold at five shillings apiece, and many women came and implored to be bought as slaves to escape starvation. An ox sold for seventy dinars, and corn was over ten shillings a bushel. The corpses lay unburied in the streets and houses, and a virulent pestilence spread over the delta. In the country and on the caravan routes, flocks of vultures, hyenas, and jackals mapped the march of death. Men dropped it down at the plow, stricken with the plague. In one day at Alexandria, an imam said the funeral prayers over 700 persons, and in a single month the property passed to 40 years in rapid succession. The depreciation of property was disastrous. Owing to the decrease of population, House rent in Cairo fell to one-seventh of its former price, and the carvings and furniture of palaces were broken up to feed the young empires. Violent earthquakes, which were also felt throughout Syria and as far north as Armenia, shook down countless houses, devastated whole cities, and increased the general misery. The invasion of John de Brienne, who captured Damietta, kept Egypt in a tremor of anxiety for three years, 1218 to 21, but El Adil, who died at the beginning of the trouble, left a singularly able successor in his son, al -Kamil. The crusaders departed in ignominy, and when some years later the emperor Frederick II himself took the cross and came to Palestine, the prudent sultan not only let the emperor crown himself in Jerusalem without striking a blow, but actually concluded, 1229, a general defensive alliance with Frederick even against the Franks of Syria. The holy city was surrendered to the Christians with the road to it, but the Muslims retained the sacred enclosure of the Mosque of Omar, which was all they cared for. The treaty was the most singular ever concluded between a Christian and a Muslim power. But it must be remembered that the Pope had called Frederick a follower of Mohammed, and the Emperor's correspondence with the Arab philosopher Ibn Sabin, and the metaphysical debates he held with Camille's ambassadors point to emancipated views that in the case of less eminent people commonly conducted them to the stake. Frederick was much admired by Muslim writers, and for his part Camille had shown himself broad-minded. He had entertained the Emperor's envoy, Bishop Bernard, in Cairo, released the poor prisoners taken in the children's crusade, and loyally stood by his tree. It is not surprising that good Muslims regarded him in much the same way as the bishop of Rome held the emperor. They were wrong, however, for Camille was a thorough Muslim, and had only treated with the infidel in the cause of peace. His college, the Dor al Hadith, or Camilia, some relics of which still stand in Bain al Khazrain, bears evidence to his zeal for Orthodox Islam. Whilst his father's intellectual power shone in the sun when he took part in the meetings and learned at his palace on Thursday evenings. To him, Cairo owed the completion of the citadel, where he took up his residence, and Egypt was improved in cultivation by his assiduous superintendents and enlargements of the canals and dikes. The new regime of the Ayyubids, or successors of Saladin, had introduced something besides an imperial sway and a revival of orthodox learning. It had brought within a feudal system that dominated Egypt, for better or for worse, for six hundred years, and violently affected the social conditions, arts, literature, and material aspect of Cairo. The Mamluk period may be said to begin with Saladin. 
It is true, of course, that there had been Mamluks, i.e. white slaves, long before, and many of them had attained to power. Ibn Taloon, or at least his father, was a Mamluk, and many of the later governors belonged to the same class of emancipated slaves, whether Turks or Greeks, from Turkestan or from Asia Minor. Under the Fatimid Caliphs, slaves had risen to the highest rank. Gawar, the founder of Cairo, was a great or a slav. It is not certain which, and we have seen how the Armenian slave better became practically master of Egypt. Slavery in the East is no disgrace. On the contrary, the relationship ranks far above mere hired service. The slave is regarded almost as a son, and we find an amusing instance of this feeling in the undoubted slur that attached to a famous emir, Kassoun, in the 14th century, because he had the misfortune not to be a slave, like the rest of his world. The Fatimid armies were full of such Mamluks, and they required rank and lands. But the system had not reached the completeness that we see under Saladin's successors. The great champion of Islam was brought up in the Mamluk system, is organized by the Seljuks and their followers, whose power rested upon a military basis formed by hired or purchased troops, paid by grants of fiefs, lands, castles, towns, or even whole provinces, on a strict condition of military service. The higher feudatories sublet parts of their fiefs to minor vassals who had to furnish a certain number of men to their lord, just as he had to bring his contingent to aid the sultan in his wars. The system was adopted in all the provinces governed by officers of the Seljuk Empire. Nureddin, din who sprang from the Seljuk officers, carried it out in Syria. Saladin, trained under nur ed din brought it to Egypt, where the land and villages were parceled out among the generals of his armies, who lived on them during the winter, and joined their overlord at the head of their retainers each year as soon as the campaigning season opened. We find this feudal system in force in Egypt, from the arrival of Saladin and his Turkish troops, down to the accession of Muhammad Ali in the 19th century. It took a dominant place in Cairo when El Adil's grandson, as Sali, established a picked battalion of Mamluks, in the new palace and barracks, which he built on the island of Rhoda, opposite Mizur. From their quarters on the river, Elbar, they were known as the Bari, or Nilotic Mamluks. Their splendid valor at the Battle of Mensura, when under the leading of Baybars, they drove back the finest chivalry in Europe, decided the fate of the disastrous crusade of Louis IX. Thenceforward they ruled Egypt for a century and a half, and in spite of much lawlessness, tyranny, intrigue, and slaughter, the reign of the Bari Mamluks is among the glorious pages in the history of Cairo. Their triumph at Mansura was not the less remarkable because they were then under the sovereignty of a woman. Queens are rare in Mohammedan history, for the Blessed Prophet had a prejudice against them. But among the three or four Muslim women that have held the scepter, Queen Shigar ed Dur, Spray of Pearls is the translation of her charming name, holds the first place. She was only a slave, and her lord and husband, as Sali, grandson of El Adil, died in the midst of the campaign with the Crusaders. But she at once took command, kept the sultan's death secret till his son could be fetched from the other end of the empire, controlled the government, organized the defense, gave instructions to the generals and governors at her levies, and with wonderful courage and wisdom held the state together. When the year arrived, 1250, she surrendered her regency, but on the assassination of the brutal young man by the exasperated Mamluks within two months, Spray of Pearl resumed her authority and honorably observed the Treaty of Ransom with St. Louis, who probably owed his life to the high-minded queen. She possessed great qualities, and she had the title, such as it was, that was conveyed by her having borne a son to the late Ayubid Sultan. The baby was dead, but she still based her claims to rule upon her motherhood, and her signature and her coins bore a string of feminine titles ending with mother of the victorious King Khalil, though the little king had never been conscious of his royalty. She was not long left to rule alone. The idea of queenship was too repugnant to Muslim prejudices, and the Caliph of Baghdad interfered with all the authority of a pope. If they had no man among them, he wrote to the emirs of Cairo, he would send them one. So the commander in chief, Ibek, was chosen to marry the queen, and a joint king, a child of Saladin's kindred, was appointed to keep up the figment of the departed dynasty. The spray of pearls is still ruled, in fact though not in name. She kept her hold on the exchequer, and evidently treated her new husband with scant respect. Like a true woman, however, 
She could be jealous. She made him divorce another wife, and when Ibeck ventured to propose a fresh marriage with the princess of Mosiel, the queen gave way to a regrettable act of resentment. Having lured him by fair words to the citadel, the facts unhappily cannot be softened. She had him murdered in the bath. 1257. Her punishment was speedy and terrible. In three days all was over. The Mamluks shut her up in the Red Tower, where she vindictively pounded her jewels in a mortar that they might adorn no other woman, and then she was dragged before the wife whom she had made Ibeck divorce, and there and then beaten to death with the women's claws. For days her body lay in the citadel ditch for the curse to worry, till some good Samaritan buried it. Her tomb may still be seen beside the chapel of Suda Nafisa, and a pious hand of these latter days had shrouded it with a cloth on which the Arabic name of spray of pearls is worked in gold. The rule of the Bari Mamluks now began, without further pretense of joint kingship with one of Saladin's house, though not without opposition and intrigue from members of the family in Syria, nor without hostility from the Arabs of Egypt, who got up a national movement and were put down with great severity. The bare list of the twenty-three sultans of the Bari dynasty, all Turks, and most from Kipchak, who succeeded Ibek in rule from 1257 to 1382 was misleading, unless one takes the conditions of their rule into account. Of the twenty-three, only four reigned for any considerable period, and the four reigns of Babars, Kalun, and Nasir, and Hassan account for more than half the sum of all the twenty-three reigns. A sultan was nothing more than the chief Mamluk, elected by his comrades, Provis and Perez indeed, but with a distinct understanding that they were his peers. For example, when Magin was elected sultan by a conspiracy of the emirs, they marched at his stirrup and did him fealty, but they made him swear, and then swear again, that he would remain one of themselves, act only by their counsel, and never favor his own Mamluks to the detriment of the rest. And when he broke his oath by making a favorite, they murdered him. It was only a very strong man who could hold the dangerous position for long, as Babars did, partly by the prestige of his brilliant campaigns in Syria, and after the strong man's death, which as likely as not happened by design, his son would be set on the throne as a stopgap whilst the rival emirs tried their strength, arranged their combinations, and bought off competitors. Then the strongest of them, or the most diplomatic, would remove the warming pan and ascend the throne to hold it as long as he could, after which the same process would be renewed. We must at least give the man Luke's their due as a splendid soldiery. Four times they had to meet the most formidable of all possible invasions, the repeated advance of the Mongol hordes led by Genghis Khan's successors, and four times they rolled them back. Katuz was the first to bear the grunt. Hulagu's Mongol envoys came to Cairo with insulting demands of submission. Katuz cut off their heads and hung them up at the Zuwela Gate. Then marched into Syria, routed the Mongols in a glorious victory at Goliath's well in 1260, and rid the land of them. Babar swam the Euphrates at the head of his troops and defeated the Mongols of Ira in 1273. Then turning west, he slew 7,000 of the enemy at Abu Lestain, and seated himself on the Seljuk throne, which they had usurped at Caesarea Cappadocia. Kalaun stemmed another invasion in 1281. Mustering every man he could enroll, man looks at the guard, Turkmans, desert Bedouis, Arabs from the Euphrates and the Hegaz, backed by the steady veterans of the old principality of Mal, which still owned a piece of solid in blood. The Sultan won a decisive battle in Amisa, and freed Syria once more from the locust cloud of devouring Mongols. Again they returned in the time of his son at Nasir, and this time the Egyptian army sustained a terrible reverse at the Battle of the Treasurer's Guild near Amisa in 1299. Damascus was lost, and the Mongol envoys appeared at Cairo to treat for the respectful submission of the Sultan. But the Mamluks had not lost heart. The armorers of Cairo were busy, recruits were pouring in, and remounts were in such demand that the price of a horse rose at a bound from twelve pounds to forty pounds. Syria was in a panic after an orgy of Mongol license, but the great emirs, Babars Gashnikir and the other Mamluk chiefs, rode proudly on to victory. Once more the opposing armies met, and the plain of Mar guessed so far, in 1303, and for the fourth time, and the last, the Mongols were driven out of Syria. Nasir returned to Cairo in a wave of glory. Messengers had announced the news, and the emirs vied with one another in setting up costly pavilions, or grandstands, richly decorated and burnished, along the route of his procession. 
Workmen were forbidden to do anything but send out these triumphal erections. Rooms along the route were let out from two pounds to four pounds for the day. Silken carpets were laid in the street, and the proud sultan rode between the brilliant facades and admired the nobles' as pavilions, while troops of Mongol prisoners in chains, each with a fellow Mongol's head hanging from his neck, completed the triumph. So noisy were the rejoicings and so deafening the tumult of drums and music throughout Egypt that nothing short of an earthquake sobered the people. Nor was it the Mongols alone who felt the edge of the Mamluks' steel. Babars the Great, a blue-eyed Turk from Kipchak afflicted by a cataract, which caused him to fetch but twenty pounds in the slave market, despite his humble beginnings, had the courage and the zeal of a second Saladin. He waged the holy war for ten years in Palestine, where the Franks were disposed to league with the Mongols. He seized and raised Caesarea and Arsuf in 1265, and dragged their defenders in cruel ignominy to Cairo, where they were paraded with reversed banners and broken crosses. Jerusalem had been recovered from the Christians twenty years before, but the empress of crusading zeal still smoldered feebly on the coast and in a few inland fortresses. Babars resolved to extinguish the last flicker. Java fell in 1268, though Fort surrendered, and Antioch, the Christian capital of northern Syria, was stormed and burnt to the ground. Three years later, the great fortress of the Hospital Tallers, cracked as chevaliers, lowered its flag, and the Teutonic Knights lost Montfort. Even Cyprus, whence the Franks got their supplies, was invaded by the Mamluk fleet. The mountain fastnesses of the dreaded assassins were seized and disarmed, and the Wengerich sank into impotence. Before Babar's died, his commands were obeyed from the Pyramus and the Euphrates to the south of Arabia and the fourth cataract of the Nile. The holy cities of Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem were his. He held the ports of Sawaki and Idol on the Red Sea. The Arabs of the desert were his servants. The chiefs of Barbary paid him tribute. The great Khan of the Golden Horde on the Volga was his sworn ally and sent him his daughter in marriage. Mongol though he was, Baraka Khan was the inveterate foe of the Mongols of Persia, who had overrun Syria. Embassies were exchanged with the Eastern Emperor, who permitted a mosque to be restored at Constantinople, while Babar supplied him with a patriarch. Diplomatic and commercial relations were established with Manfred of Sicily, James of Aragon, Alfonso of Seville, Charles of Anjou. To crown his glory, he revived the old Odyssey Caliphate, extinguished at Baghdad by the Mongols in 1258, brought a meek representative of the sacred line to Cairo and housed him in great state in the citadel as a supreme legitimate pontiff of Islam, and humbly received at the caliph's hands the purple robe and black turban and golden chain and anklets, which betokened a sovereign recognized by the spiritual power. Henceforward there was ever a caliph at Cairo, however faineant, till the Ottoman conquest on the assumption of the Caliphate by the Sultans of Turkey in 1538. A great soldier and a consummate and perfidious diplomatist, Baybars was also an able and laborious administrator. Under him, the land was quietly, if not quite godly, governed, and his energy was unbounded. He seemed to be in several places at once, so rapid and secret were his journeys, and it was a favorite device of his to lie hidden in the citadel for days together, watching his deputies, when he was believed to be in Syria all the time. The greater part of his reign was spent in campaigns outside Egypt, but he generally passed the winter months at Cairo, whilst his troops rested and rains or snow hindered marching, and he devoted these intervals to improving the country and the capital. He was not only in founding and restoring mosques and colleges, or rebuilding the Hall of Justice at the foot of the citadel, that he showed his public interest. He enlarged the irrigation canals and dug new ones, made roads and bridges, fortified Alexandria and repaired the pharaohs, and protected the mouths of the Nile from the risk of foreign invasion. He revived the Egyptian fleet, built forty war galleys, and maintained twelve thousand regular troops, not reckoning, one must assume, the Arab and Egyptian militia or occasional levies. His heavy war expenses entailed heavy taxation, and though with a view to popularity he began his reign by remitting the oppressive taxes imposed by Catus to the amount of 600,000 dinars a year, he found himself compelled to increase the fiscal burdens as his campaigns developed. Yet we read more often of old taxes repealed and of fresh duties imposed, and his treasury was filled less by the imposts of Egypt than by the contributions from the conquered cities and districts of Syria, the tribute of vassal states and tribes, and the valuable custom dues of the ports. His government was enlightened, just, and strict. He met the severe famine of 1264 by measures at once wise and generous, 
by regulating the sale of corn, and by undertaking, and compelling his officers and emirs to undertake, the support of the destitute for three months. He allowed no wine, though the tax on it used to produce six thousand dinars a year, beer, or hashish, in his dominions. He attempted to eradicate contagious diseases by scientific isolation. He was strict with the morals of his subjects, shut up taverns and brothels, and banished the European women of the town. Though, personally, he was addicted to the Tatar Kunis, and was suspected of oriental depravity. He was no sybarite, whatever his vices. No man was more full of energy and power of work. If his days were often given to hunting or polo, lance play or marksmanship, his nights were devoted to business. A courier who arrived at daybreak received the answering dispatches by the third hour with invariable punctuality. Sometimes over fifty dispatches were dictated, signed and sealed late in the night, after a fatiguing march. There was a mail twice a week carried by relays of horses, besides a well-organized pigeon post. It was no wonder that such a man was adored by the people, who thought him the ideal of a gallant and generous soldier king, and who still listened with delight to the romance in which the storyteller of the cafes of Cairo clothes the great deeds of the ever-popular Zahir Baymars. Even the devout admired a king who endowed religious foundations and held an even balance between the four contending schools of orthodox divines, from each of which he nominated a separate cadi. Only the emirs and officers dreaded one who, if he was true as steel to a good servant, never forgave a bad one, in whose restless suspicion watched their every move. It was inevitable that some day one of the many grudges should be paid off, and after seventeen years of a resplendent reign, Baybars died in 1277 by a cup of poison which he had apparently made ready for another. End of section 13 Section 14 of The Story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2022. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole. Section 14. Chapter 7. The Dome Builders, Part 2. Baybars was the true founder of the Mamluk power and the organizer of the Mamluk system. Since the day when he led the charge of the Bahri guard against Louis of France at the Battle of Mansoura, he had sedulously watched over the army, stimulated recruiting from fresh blood, and encouraged good service by liberal distribution of fiefs. His was the foreign policy maintained in Egypt for many years, and his court formed the pattern for succeeding kings. A very magnificent and ceremonious court it was, where the sultan sat surrounded by the great officers of state and of the household, viceroy, commander-in-chief, major-domo, captain of the guard, armor-bearer, master of the house, cup-bearer, taster, master of the wardrobe, grand huntsman, polo-bearer, slipper-holder, lord of the seat, the master of the halberds with his gentlemen at arms, the adjutant general with his thirty lords of the drums, each followed by forty troopers and a band of ceremony of ten drums, four trumpets and two hot bois, the eunuch guards, equerries and chamberlains, secretaries and court physicians, judges and divines. All these functionaries had their allowances, fiefs or appanages, a lord of the drums, for instance, would draw an income of about sixteen thousand pounds a year, and the expenses of the royal household may be judged by the estimate that twenty thousand pounds of food were daily prepared in the larder, and that the daily cost in meat and vegetables in the time of En Nasir was from eight hundred pounds to one thousand two hundred pounds. The great officers of the court and of the army were of course the most powerful men next to the sultan, and each deemed himself a fit successor to the throne. On their loyalty, and especially on that of the bodyguard, a brigade of several thousand picked men who held in fief a large part of Egypt rested the safety and power of the sultan, who stood more or less at their mercy. Each of the great lords, were he an officer of the guard, or a court official, or merely a private nobleman, was a Mamluk sultan in miniature. 
he too had his guard of slaves who waited at his door to escort him in his rides abroad were ready at his behest to attack the public baths and carry off the women defended him when a rival lord besieged his palace and followed him valiantly as he led the charge of his division on the field of battle these great lords with their retainers were a constant menace to the reigning sultan a coalition would be formed among a certain number of disaffected nobles with the support of some of the officers of the household or of the guard and their retainers would mass in the approaches to the royal presence while the trusted cup-bearer or other officer whose duties permitted him access to the king's person would strike the fatal blow or administer the insidious cup and the conspirators would forthwith elect one of their number to succeed to the vacant throne this was not effected without a struggle the royal guard was not always to be bribed or overcome and there were generally other nobles whose interests attached them to the reigning sovereign rather than to any possible successor except themselves and who would be sure to oppose the plot then there would be a street fight the terrified people would close their shops run to their houses and shut the great gates which isolated the various quarters and markets of the city and the rival factions of mamluks would ride through the streets that remained open pillaging the houses of their adversaries carrying off women and children holding pitched battles in the road or discharging arrows and spears from the windows upon the enemy in the street below these things were of constant occurrence and the life of the merchant classes of cairo must have been exciting we read how the great bazaar called the khan el khalili was sometimes shut up for a week while these contests were going on in the streets without and the rich merchants of cairo huddled trembling behind the stout gates there were fine doings of this kind when kedbuga disposed the child king nasir for a time the ashrafis or mamluks of the late sultan el ashraf khalil raised a revolt and besieged the citadel then kedbuga's troops rode out to quell the tumult and slashed through the ranks the rebels were blinded maimed drowned beheaded nailed to the gate of suwayla and so a new reign began 1294 a plague followed when seven hundred corpses were carried out of one gate of cairo in a single day a fresh conspiracy was formed kedbuga fled and the viceroy lagin was elected sultan in his place the streets which had lately been shambles were now en fête with decorations for the new sultan was a generous man and promised to remit taxes bread was cheap and lagin was popular the idea of hereditary succession was wholly foreign to the mamluk system yet it presented the only correction to these scenes of violent supersession and after a time some sort of hereditary title seems to have been established Kalaun had been succeeded by his son Khalil, and then by a younger son, En Nasir Mohammed, in 1293, and though the last, as a mere child, was temporarily deposed, he came back in 1298, after the murder of his brother-in-law Lagin. After another trial of usurpation by Baybars Gashnekir, the taster, in 1303, Nasir was restored and began a third reign which lasted thirty-one years, 1310 to 1341 and after his death his incapable descendants sat on the throne with little or no real authority till the close of the dynasty thus from 1279 to 1382 egypt was ruled except for six or seven years by members of one family the house of kalaun the founder of this family, whose history refutes the theory that these foreigners were unprolific in Egypt, was himself a notable figure, a brave general, a prudent statesman, and a great encourager of commerce. His passports to traders were in force as far as India and China, and he did all he could to develop the commerce of Egypt. Like most of the Mamluk sultans, he was a notable builder. It is extraordinary how these men of war, in the midst of alarums and intrigues, took a delight in architecture. The brilliant queen, first of the Mamluks, built, 1250, the tomb mosque over her husband Salih, 
which still stands on part of the site of the old palace of the Fatimids in Bain el Kasrain. Baybars founded a college in 1262 on another part of the palace called the Hall of the Tent, and also a great mosque outside the Bab el Futu in 1267 to 69, both of which still exist, though the college is a ruin and the mosque was used, in fandom, as a bakehouse for the French troops a century ago, and recently as a slaughterhouse for the British Army of Occupation. Kalaun, stirred by a dangerous illness, vowed to build a hospital, and his Maristan is still to be seen in the Nahasin, though no longer used for its original purpose. It was a madhouse less than a hundred years ago. It stands beside his mosque and tomb, the latter notable for its exquisite plaster tracery and red granite pillars, and for the oddly decorated stone minaret and fine inscription. Ibn Tulun and Saladin had built hospitals, and Kalaun carried on the good tradition of these pious benefactors. Cubicles for patients were ranged round two courts, and at the sides of another quadrangle were wards, lecture rooms, library, baths, dispensary, and every necessary appliance of those days of surgical science. There was even music to cheer the sufferers, while readers of the Koran afforded the consolations of the faith. Rich and poor were treated alike, without fees, and sixty orphans were supported and educated in the neighboring school. People still visit the tomb where the good sultan and his son and Nasir lie buried, to touch their clothes in sure belief that they will be cured of sundry diseases and disabilities. The long reign of en Nasir was a golden age of Mamluk architecture. However much the sultan may have profited by the sense of tranquillity which hereditary title inspired, he owed his long tenure of the precarious throne partly to his personal qualities. This self-possessed, iron-willed man, absolutely despotic, ruling alone, physically insignificant, small of stature, lame of a foot and with a cataract in the eye, with his plain dress and strict morals, his keen intellect and unwearied energy, his enlightened tastes and interests, his shrewd diplomacy degenerating into fruitless deceit, his unsleeping suspicion and cruel vengefulness, his superb court, his magnificent buildings, is one of the most remarkable characters of the Middle Ages. His reign was certainly the climax of Egyptian culture and civilization. He carried on the traditions of Baybars and Kalaun, maintained the alliance with the Golden Horde, and married a princess from the Volga, the Lady Tulbiya, whose tomb may still be seen with that of another of his wives, in the Eastern Cemetery. He preserved the normal boundaries of the empire, from the Pyramus and Euphrates to Savakin and Aswan, and arranged, if not alliances, diplomatic connections with the Emperor of Constantinople and the King of Bulgaria, as well as the rulers of Abyssinia and Arabia. He married eleven daughters to the highest nobles, and each wedding cost him half a million. Nasir was not only a statesman, he was a farmer, trainer, and sportsman, who would pay four thousand pounds for a horse, kept a systematic stud book, knew all his horse's pedigrees, prices, and ages, and broke in three thousand fillies every year with Bedawi grooms, for the races in which he and his emirs took the keenest possible interest. He kept thirty thousand sheep, and imported the finest breeds from abroad, and like most of the sultans, he was devoted to falconry. Ibn Battuta, who saw him in 1326, describes Nasir as a king of noble character and great virtues, beneficent to pilgrims and assiduous in his duty of sitting in appeal twice a week to hear causes and complaints in person. Under his rule, Egypt thrived, vexatious taxes were repealed, a new survey of the land was made, Millers and bakers who tried to raise prices in bad years were scourged, and when his son-in-law, the great Emir Kusun, was reported to him for extortion, the sultan smote him with the flat of his sword and flocked his factor. Prices were kept down by his vigilance, 
wine-bibing and immorality were severely punished, and if Nasir recouped himself by sweeping confiscations among the nobles and cut down the tall poppies remorselessly, the people gained by the new method and prospered exceedingly. Even to the Copts Nasir was indulgent, though the Christians were never so well used under Mamluk rule as they had been under the Fatimids and in the time of El Kamil. At the time of Saladin's invasion, there had been a great destruction of churches, due rather to the burning of Misr and the turmoil of war than to any fanaticism of the conquerors. Saladin himself was no friend to Christians. He was too rigid a Muslim to be tolerant, but he did not persecute them. The flight or expulsion of the Armenian patriarch and his followers was more probably the result of the close association of the Armenians with the Fatimid government than of religious bigotry. But the holy war in Palestine, though waged against the Latin branch of the Church Catholic, reacted unfavorably upon the Copts, and Saladin's brother El Adil was stern and tyrannical towards his Christian subjects. His son, El Kamil, often interceded for them successfully, and when he came to the throne of Egypt himself, he displayed a spirit of toleration rare indeed in that age. He received St. Francis of Assisi courteously, when the good friar came to teach him the truth as he perceived it, and the Christians of Egypt unanimously regarded Kamil as the kindest ruler they had ever known. His son, as Sali, seems to have followed in his steps during his short reign, for he wrote to Innocent the Fourth to express his regret that he could not converse with the Dominicans by reason of his ignorance of Latin. The crusade of Louis the Ninth naturally upset this amicable relations, and it is not surprising that the Muslims wreaked their vengeance upon many churches in Egypt. Nor was the temper of the succeeding Mamluk sultans, excited by repeated victories over the remnant of the Franks in Syria, conducive to a good understanding with their Christian subjects. The new colleges, founded by Saladin and his successors, were working a change in Cairo, and a fanatical spirit was encouraged by the teachers of these divinity schools, whose influence grew stronger as time went on. In 1280, all the Coptic scribes employed at the war office were dismissed, and their places supplied by Muslims. In 1301, the old, humiliating, sumptuary rules prescribing distinctive dresses and the like were revived. In 1321 occurred a series of outbreaks which brought terrible persecution on the Christians. The disturbance began when En Nasir's workmen, digging a lake called Nasir's Pool near the Lion's Bridge, west of the Luk and close to the mosque of Tabars, undermined the church of Ez-Zuri, which en Nasser had commanded to be respected. Without the knowledge of the government, the people rushed to the church one Friday after prayers and utterly demolished it. Thence they went to the church of St. Mina in the Hamra and sacked it, and did the like to the church of the maidens by the seven water-mills, dragging out the nuns and pillaging and burning everything. The sultan was indignant when the smoke of the burning churches told the tale of disaster and sent troops at once to coerce the mob. Meanwhile, news arrived of the destruction of two other churches in the quarters of Suveila and of the Greeks, and it was found that the mob was attacking the Moalaka in the fortress of Babylon. Here the sultan's troops happily arrived in time to protect the church. There was evidently a popular excitement difficult to quell. Wild fakirs got up in the mosques and shouted, Down with the infidels' churches! To the foundations! To the foundations! The same thing was going on all over Egypt, at Alexandria, at Damascus, at Kus. Churches were burning. A month later, mysterious fires began to break out at Cairo. One after the other great conflagrations burst forth, and a strong wind carried the flames far and wide. People went up the minarets and cried to God, thinking that the whole city would be burnt down, and there was groaning and weeping over the loss of homes and possessions. Every effort was made to extinguish the fires. 
all the water carriers were impressed, and twenty-four emirs of the highest rank worked at the head of the lines of men carrying water from the baths and cisterns, and demolishing acres of fine houses to clear a space round the burning buildings. The street from the Dalem quarter to the gate of Suvela ran with water like a river. No sooner was one fire extinguished than another began. Almost every day witnessed a fresh conflagration. It was noticed that these fires were apparently aimed at mosques, and that they were the work of incendiaries was evident from clothes soaked in oil and pitch and naphtha that were discovered. A Christian was caught at the mosque of Es Zahir with packets of naphtha and pitch, which he was lighting in the mosque. Put to the torture, he confessed that the conflagrations were the organized work of Christians. Two monks, under torture, admitted that they had set the fires afoot to avenge the destruction of the churches. The Coptic patriarch was called in, and, with tears, denounced the incendiaries as wild enthusiasts who were paying off the foolish church destroyers in their own coin. He was sent back to his house in honor. The populace, however, were in no mood to see a patriarch respected, and would gladly have torn him in pieces, but for the sultan's guard. As it was, they burned four monks from the Melekite convent of the mule, El Kuseir, in the Mukatam hills. Two Christians caught in the act of arson were by the sultan's orders burnt alive in a pit in the presence of an exulting multitude, and an innocent Coptic secretary, passing by, only escaped being thrown to the flames by hasty apostasy. The mob was becoming dangerous, and the sultan, who, though much alarmed, had done his utmost to calm the people, took strong measures. Troops were sent through the whole of Cairo with orders to charge the crowds and spare none. The news had preceded them, and they found the bazaars closed and the streets deserted. Not a man was to be seen between the citadel and the gate of succor. Some two hundred were arrested near the Nile and brought before the sultan, who ordered them to be executed or to lose their hands. In vain they pleaded innocence. Even the emirs interceded for them, and Nasir was resolved to make an example of somebody. Gallows were set up all the way from the gate of Suwayla to the Rumeyla, and there the unlucky Muslims were hung by their hands in order to teach other people not to raise an uproar. The result of this excitement was the revival of the old regulations as to dress which Nazir had endeavoured to drop since 1301. Any Christian found riding a horse or wearing a white turban might be killed at sight. The Copts were compelled to wear blue turbans, to carry a bell round their necks at the baths, and to ride only the ass, and that with the face to the tail. The emirs were not allowed to employ Christian servants, nor were the Copts any more to hold posts in the government offices. They hardly dared to show themselves abroad, and a great many became Muslims. This was probably the worst persecution since the days of El Hakim, three centuries before, but it must be admitted that there was grave provocation on both sides, and that the outrages sprang from popular fury, not from the fanaticism of the rulers. Similar persecution though scarcely on so large a scale, went on throughout the Mamluk period, and the Copts, who had perhaps waxed overfat and kicked during the tolerant epoch of the later Fatimids, paid dearly for their past favour. They were gradually reduced to the state of suffering insignificance, from which they are only now being, to some extent, raised. Whilst churches were being thus destroyed, mosques were rising with amazing prodigality. There never was such a harvest for the builder and the architect as in the reign of En Nasir. The sultan set the example himself. He was a man of fine taste and high culture, the patron of scholars, and the intimate friend of the learned historian Abu al-Fida, whom he restored to the princedom of Hama, which had been held by his family since the days of his ancestor, Saladin's brother. It was an age of brilliant artistic production, and the immense sums spent by the sultan and his emirs on building and decorative works show that the wealth of the country was vast and was nobly expended. 
Some of Nasir's own furniture has been preserved. There are two exquisite inlaid silver tables of his in the Arab Museum at Cairo, and his two chief buildings, the college in Bain el Kasrain, 1304, next to the Maristan, with its Gothic gateway brought from Akka by his brother Khalil, and the old mosque, 1318, in the citadel, are worthy memorials of his taste, though unhappily they show but few traces of their original splendor. The great dome which once surmounted the citadel mosque has fallen in, and most of the marble mosaics which adorned the Qibla have vanished, as well as the iron grill which enclosed the sultan's place of prayer, Maksura. There is still a range of clerestory windows all round the mosque, but the tracery and stained glass is almost all gone. Yet the ten great granite columns and the marble mosaics on the south wall and other relics show what the mosque must once have been. Its most remarkable feature is the coating of the minarets with green tiles, which may probably be ascribed to the Tatar influence of Nasir's wife, who belonged to the royal family of the Golden Horde. That the Citadel Mosque is not wholly destroyed is due to the care of Colonel C. M. Watson, C. M. G., who rescued it from the degradation of an army storehouse and removed the wooden partitions which had been set up when the beautiful building was converted into a prison. There was once a hall of columns belonging to Nasir's striped palace of black and white stone in the citadel, which cost, it is said, twenty millions, but the figure is incredible, which still stood three quarters of a century ago. The fortress was largely rearranged and added to in his reign, and the aqueduct which brought the Nile water to the citadel, though commonly ascribed to Salatin, and probably a reconstruction of some Ayubid conduit, was Nasir's work, 1311, afterward restored in stone by El Khuri. He also built a mosque beside the shrine of Seyida Nefisa, the Kubat en Nasser near the Red Hill, and other chapels. Where the sultan led, the court followed. The emirs of that day were never content till they had built a mosque, a college, or a tomb chapel to celebrate their piety and lay up riches where they stood most in need of a balance. The Moorish traveller, Ibn Battuta, who was at Cairo in 1326, was impressed by the zealous emulation of the emirs in founding mosques and monasteries for recluses, such as the Khanka or convent of Baybars, Gashnekir, still standing, and he gives a curious account of the monastic rules. One cannot count the colleges, medresas, he says, and he is lost in admiration of the great hospital of Kalaun, with its excellent apparatus and drugs, and its revenue amounting, he was told, to one thousand dinars a day. More than forty mosques and colleges were erected between 1320 and 1360, more than a fourth of the total number recorded from the Arab conquest to the time of Makrisi, and many of them still survive to bear witness to the munificence of the great nobles of the time. Such are the mosques, Gami, of the Emir Hossein, founded Anno Hajeri 719, Anno Domini 1390, Almas the Chamberlain, 730, Kusun, 730, Beshtak, 736, Altun Buga el Maridani, the Cupbearer, 740, Aslam the Armorbearer, 746, Aksunkur, 747, Argun el Ismaili, 748, Mangak the Proconsul, 750, Sheikhu, 750, the Colleges, Medresa of Al Melik, the Polo Master, 719, Sengar el Gawali, 723, Ahmad, the Master of the Ceremonies, Mihmandar, 725, Akbuga, the Major Domo, 734, Sargitmish, Captain of the Guard, 757, The Monasteries, Khanka of Kusun, 736, El Gawali, 723, Sheikh Q, 756. Besides the mosque of the Lady Miska, a slave of Nasir is named Hadak, 740. The college of Nasir's daughter, the Lady Tatar el Higasiya, 761. 
and the great mosque of his son, Sultan Hassan, facing the citadel, 757 to 60. To describe these mosques of the Nasiri epoch in detail would demand a whole volume. Some of them indeed are sadly ruined and present but fragments of their original building. Some, like Aksunkurs and El Ismailis, were restored, the one with much taste by Ibrahim Aga in 1652, the other with none, fifty years ago, by one of the Khedivial family. But even in what remains of the original work of the twenty-one mosques enumerated above, there is so much variety in plan, in treatment of the parts, and in decoration, that no verbal description can take the place of ocular study on the spot. Almost every one of these buildings deserves separate and attentive examination. Three features, however, may here be signalized as characteristic. The old mosques had no external decoration. Their enclosing walls were plain, and only in the late Fatimid Mosque El Akmar do we find the beginning of a façade. The Mamluk mosques, copying no doubt the buildings of the Crusaders in Palestine, generally present fine façades, with sunk panels, portals in recess, and decorative cornice and crownwork. The next characteristic is the development of the minaret, which becomes more graceful, is built of well-faced stone, and shows delicate articulations and gradations of tapering from the square to the polygon and cylinder, with skilful use of stalactite, or pendentive treatment of angles and transitions, and supports for the balconies. The third is the construction of large domes. Hitherto small cupolas over the mihrab, or above the entrance, were the utmost achievements of the earlier architects. The feature of a great dome was introduced by Saladin's successors, for example in the dome of the tomb mosque of esh Shafi in the Karafa, and probably in other edifices, but too little remains of the Ayyubid period to permit of very exact definition. The Mamluks were dome builders par excellence. A large proportion of their mosques and colleges were also the founders' tombs. The tomb chapel adjoined the main building, and the dome, as we have said, is pre-eminently a sepulchral canopy. From the Mamluk period begins that adornment of the city with those beautiful bulbs which still form its dominant architectural note. From the plain dome with a small cupola on top comes the fluted dome, and next the dome covered with ornaments, chevrons, arabesques, or geometrical entrelacs, all chiseled in the stone. The most elaborate ornament belongs to the work of the Circassian sultans of the 15th century, but already in the 14th the dome had taken its place among the leading features of Saracenic architecture. As an example of the 14th century style, we cannot do better than take the great mosque of Sultan Hassan, which includes most of the characteristics of the Nasiri epoch, and displays them on the grandest scale. Sultan Hassan, who sat on the throne from 1347 to 1351, was deposed by the emirs, and then restored from 1354 to 1361, was far from an interesting or estimable character, and his mosque was his one good deed. It was built between 1356 and 1359, Anno Hajiri 757 to 760, and it is said to have cost him 1,000 dinars a day, but one distrusts the round figures of eastern chroniclers. The sultan was so charmed with his masterpiece that he cut off the architect's hand in the vague idea that its loss would cripple his genius and prevent his repeating his success. The mosque is of the usual form of medresa, a cross formed of a central court and four deep transepts or porticos, and the founder's tomb may be compared to a lady chapel behind the chancel or eastern portico. The outside does not, of course, reveal the cruciform character of the interior, since the angles are filled with numerous rooms and offices. The prevailing impression from without is one of great height, compared with other mosques. The walls are 113 feet high and built of fine cut stone from the pyramids, and have the peculiarity, rare in Saracen architecture, of springing from a socle. 
windows, two with horseshoe arches, the rest simple grills, slightly relieve the monotony of the broad expanse of wall, but the most beautiful feature is the splendid cornice built up of six tiers of stalactites, each overlapping the one below, which crowns the whole wall. There are some graceful pilasters or engaged columns at the angles, and a magnificent portal set in an arched niche, sixty-six feet high, vaulted in a half-sphere which is worked up to by twelve tiers of pendentives. Bold arabesque medallions and borders, geometrical panels and corner columns with stalactite capitals, enrich this stately gate. Inside, the first impression again is of size rather than detail. The great span of the four arches, that at the east is ninety feet high and nearly seventy wide, is unmatched in Cairo, but the plaster coating of the interior of the transepts detracts from the general effect. Nor are the mosaics and marbles, handsome as they are, equal in delicacy of design or harmony of colour to many others in the mihrabs of earlier and later mosques. The black, white, and yellow panels are too garish, and so is the colouring of the pulpit, but the concave niche itself is singularly rich in decoration, and the tribune, instead of being as usual an unpretentious wood platform, stands upon graceful stone columns of alternate drums of coloured marbles. A fine Kufic inscription forms a frieze round the top of the walls. The tomb chamber, entered from the sanctuary by a noble door plated with arabesques in bronze, is surrounded by a marble dado twenty-five feet high, above which is the throne verse from the Koran carved in wood, whilst the angles are gradually worked up to the circle of the dome by stalactites also carved in wood and much decayed. In the centre is the plain marble grave of the founder. The dome itself is comparatively modern, and quite unworthy of the great mosque. The original great dome, admired by Pietro della Valle in 1616, collapsed in 1660. There were to have been four minarets, but scarcely was the third built when it fell, 1360, crushing some three hundred children in the school below. Thirty-three years later, Sultan Hassan was murdered. Of the two that then remained, one minaret became ruined and was rebuilt too short in 1659. The great bronze lanterns and many of the enameled glass lamps are preserved in the Arab Museum, and the fine bronze-plated entrance door was removed by El Muayyat to his own mosque in 1410. The mosque of Sultan Hassan suffered greatly from its position. Its wide terrace roof was an excellent post of vantage for cannon and musketry during the constant emeutes of the Mamluk period, and shots were frequently exchanged between it and the citadel down to the time of Muhammad Ali. Some of the balls may still be seen in the masonry. Barkuk found the mosque so dangerous as a place of attack that he demolished its handsome steps and closed the great door. At one time it remained closed for half a century, and the students and worshippers had to slink in by a window or a side door. The tall binaret was even used in the middle of the fifteenth century to support a tightrope stretched to the citadel, on which a European gymnast disported himself to the tremulous delight of the populace. In a quieter situation, the mosque might have escaped injury, but even as it is, scarred with bullets and lopped of its original dome and minarets, it remains the most superb, if not the most beautiful, monument of Saracenic art in the fourteenth century. End of section 14 Section 15 of The Story of Cairo This is a LibriVox recording. All the Brivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2022. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole. Section 15. Chapter 7. The Dome Builders, Part 3. 2. The Mamluks of the Fort. 
when the feeble descendants of en nasir after enduring rather than enjoying a mock sovereignty for forty years under the tyranny of a series of powerful emirs kusun sheku sarkimish and the rest gave way to the usurpation of the emir barkuk in 1382 the change made little difference in the government of egypt the hereditary principle was gone indeed and was never reaffirmed until the latter part of the nineteenth century and the new dynasty consisted of isolated emirs who sometimes bequeathed their throne to a son until some other emir deposed him but who never founded a royal house like that of kalaun the new line was known as the burji mamluks or slaves of the fort because they belonged to a brigade of troops which had been quartered in the citadel river ever since their original enrolment by kalaun a century before they are also called the circassian sultans from their common race for none of them were turks though two were greeks there was little to choose however in character between the circassians and their turkish predecessors and the change on the whole was for the worse the sultans of the new line were even more at the mercy of the leaders of military factions than before the mamluk guard of each king formed a distinct party calling itself after his throne title as ashrafi muayyadi nasiri and after his death or deposition they remained a separate factor in politics and contributed to the bloodshed confusion and intrigues of the period the sultans could scarcely restrain their own soldiery much less these formidable relics of their predecessors and the frequent changes of rulers show how unstable the royal authority had become six of the twenty-three burgi sultans reigned for one hundred three out of the total of one hundred thirty-four years covered by the dynasty leaving but thirty-one years for the remaining seventeen or less than two years apiece the character of the rulers was much the same as before but everything was on a meaner scale there was hardly one warrior king among them and this accounts in a large degree for the lack of the prestige that had kept a soldier like Baybars or Kalaun on the throne. The Circassians were not soldiers, but schemers. They relied less upon success in war or personal courage than on ruse, chicanery, and corruption to retain their hold of power. The Greek Kushkadam excelled the rest in his adroit management of the contending factions and the heavy bribes he extorted in the sale of public offices the governorship of damascus cost its possessor forty five thousand dinars in fees to the sultan and his previous post was sold to another man for ten thousand ministers of state were put out of the way if their enemies made it worth the greeks while and the ceremonious visits of this ingenious sultan were apt to be expensive to those he honoured with a call throughout the dominion of the circassian dynasty corruption reigned unchecked justice was bought and sold and even the sheikh el islam the religious chief justice stole trust money the soldiers who were purchased white slaves greeks circassians turks and mongols ran riot in the streets insomuch that decent women dared not leave their houses and the fellahin feared to bring their stock to market lest it should fall a prey to the mamluks or the government in the country the population diminished under the oppression of the troops in the capital there was seldom peace or order and sometimes rival factions pounded each other from the citadel ramparts and the opposite roof of sultan hassan's mosque barricaded the streets and made cockpits of the bazaars where processions of rebels nailed to camel saddles till they died were no uncommon sights in spite of this corruption and violence the burgi sultans contrived not only to preserve the power of egypt but even to enlarge its dominions and greatly extend its trade they withstood the invasion of tamerlane boldly in thirteen ninety nine though in the end they found it politic to accept his terms but at least the great conqueror never ventured to attack egypt they fought several campaigns in asia minor where for some time they secured the submission of karaman caesarea iconium and larenda 
they even conquered Cyprus, a nest of the pirates who disturbed the Egyptian shipping, in 1426, with a fleet of galleys built at their port of Bulak, not long risen from the Nile, and King James of Lusignan, captured at the Battle of Chiarositia, was brought in triumph to the citadel of Cairo, with the crown of Cyprus and his disgraced standards, and made to kiss the ground before the Sultan Bars Bay. He was ransomed by the Venetian consul and European merchants, and rode through the streets and bazaars in great state, after becoming a vassal of the Egyptian king. Cyprus paid tribute until the end of the Circassian dynasty, but several attempts upon Rhodes in 1440-44 to 44 were successfully repelled by the knights. To the end of the dynasty, the Egyptian frontier still extended north as far as the Paramus and Euphrates. Among the strange anomalies of Oriental history, none perhaps is more surprising than the combination of extreme corruption and savage cruelty with exquisite refinement in material civilization and an admirable devotion to art which we see in the Mamluk sultans. The Circassians were not inferior to their Turkish forerunners as great architects. Personally, some of the second line of sultans were men of considerable culture. Barkuk, Muayyat, Gakmak, and Kaid Bey were fond of learned society and literary talents. Bars Bey, though he knew little Arabic, liked to listen to Turkish histories read to him by El Aini, and Timur Buga the Greek was a philologist, historian, and theologian. They were also good Muslims, fasted regularly and even supererogatorily, abstained from wine, made pilgrimages, and ensured their place in the next world by building mosques, colleges, hospitals, schools, and every kind of religious establishment in this. El Muayyad, for example, though utterly unable to control the disorders of his time, was personally a devout man and a learned, a good musician, poet, and orator, scrupulous in the observance of the rules of his religion, very simple and unpretentious in his dress and mode of life, bearing himself in all religious functions as a plain Muslim among fellow worshippers, and robing himself in common white wool in mourning for the pestilence that ravaged the land. The eastern arcade of his splendid mosque, 1415-21, to 21, is still preserved in the Sukaria Street, and a number of boys may there be seen at their lessons under the brilliant gold inscriptions and frescoes of the sanctuary, which has been carefully restored by Hertz Bay, who discovered traces of the original polychromy beneath the whitewash of ages. The minarets of the mosque are built on the flanking towers of the Suvela Gate. There is also a ruined hospital, El Maristan El Muayadi, 1418, near the citadel, that commemorates his pious benefactors. Bars Bay's great mosque, the Ashrafia, 1423, is still a place where congregations meet, at the corner of the Musky, where one turns into the Kuria. Bar Cook built, 1386, an exquisite medresa in Bain el Kasrain, which has recently been restored by Hertz Bay, and his tomb mosque with the two domes, begun by himself but completed by his son, the Sultan Farak, in 1410, is one of the most picturesque features in that beautiful group of fawn-coloured domes and slender minarets, the Eastern Cemetery. But the gem of the group is the perfect tomb mosque, 1472, of Kayit Bey, which represents the highest achievement of the later Mamluk school. The admirable arabesques of its shapely dome, the skillfully graduated transitions of its stately minaret from square to octagon, and from octagon to circle, with every ingenuity of stalactite concealment of angles, and the fine inlaid marbles in the Liwan, are treasures of indestructible beauty, even after centuries of neglect and spoilation. Kaid Bey, whose long reign of twenty-eight years, 1468 to 96, was phenomenal in this quickly changing dynasty, had worked his way up from the usual humble beginning. Bought by Bars Bey for twenty-five guineas, 
he had passed from master to master and rank to rank till he became commander-in-chief under the greek timur buga of an army which cost the state nearly three hundred thousand pounds a year a very large military budget for the fifteenth century he was an expert swordsman and an adept at the javelin play his career had given him experience and knowledge of the world he possessed courage judgment insight energy and decision his strong character dominated his mamluks who were devoted to him and overawed competitors his physical energy was sometimes displayed in flogging the president of the council of state or other high officials with his own arm with the object of extorting money for the treasury such contributions and extraordinary taxation were absolutely necessary for the wars in which he was obliged to engage not only was the land taxed to one-fifth of the produce but an additional tenth half a dirham per ardep of corn was demanded rich jews and christians were remorselessly squeezed there was much barbarous inhumanity innocent people were scourged even to the death and the chemist ali ibn el marshushi was blinded and deprived of his tongue because he could not turn dross into gold the sultan had the reputation of miserliness yet the list of his public works not only in egypt but in syria and arabia shows that he spent the revenue on admirable objects his two mosques at cairo one outside among the so-called tombs of the caliphs 1472 the other near ibn tulun 1475 and his wekalas or caravanserais are among the most exquisite examples of elaborate arabesque ornament applied to the purest saracenic architecture he diligently restored and repaired the crumbling monuments of his predecessors as numerous inscriptions in the mosques the schools the citadel and other buildings of cairo abundantly testify he was a frequent traveller and journeyed in syria to the euphrates in upper and lower egypt besides performing the pilgrimages to mecca and jerusalem and wherever he went he left traces of his progress in good roads bridges mosques schools fortifications or other pious or necessary works no reign save that of en nasir ibn kalaun in the long list of mamluk sultans was more prolific in architectural construction or in the minor industries of art the people suffered for the cost of his many buildings but a later age has recognized their matchless beauty in the buildings of Kaid bey and his contemporaries we see the perfection of the art of pure arabesque and elaborate geometrical ornament in the early days of saracenic architecture the ornament was worked in soft gypsum or plaster and the use of a tool never a mould in the soft material gave extraordinary freedom and boldness to the lines for example in the scroll work of the mosque of ibn tulun plaster continued to be the base of decorative friezes and borders throughout the fatimid period it may be seen in the original arcades of the Azhar and in the eastern sanctuary of El Hakim. The most exquisite specimen of plaster ornament, however, is seen in the tomb mosque of Kalaun, where the borders of the arches that supported the original dome and of the clerestory windows above are formed of a delicate lace-like tracery in plaster foliate designs, broadly treated and worked into a pattern so continuous that it is almost impossible to break off at any middle point after en nasir who also used stucco however it was generally abandoned in favour of stone though we still see admirable examples of plaster decoration in the dome of aksun kur and the beautiful designs in the cupola of el fadawiya in the mosque of the sultan hassan all the sculpture except the cufic frieze is in stone and as the material is unyielding we find at once a certain hardness of treatment a loss of freedom in the lines and a tendency to substitute geometrical design for the pure arabesque of earlier work the stone pulpit erected by kaid bey in fourteen eighty three in barkuk's tomb mosque is one of the finest examples of geometrical chiselling in cairo its side view is triangular like the wooden pulpits of other mosques 
but instead of carved or inlaid wooden panels making up the designs on each side the whole is of stone slabs admirably joined and chiselled with geometrical figures produced outwards so as to cover the whole surface with a network of interlacing lines forming a star-like pattern the interstices of which are filled with floral arabesques similar carving enriches the walls of the staircase and the canopy of this unique pulpit kaid bey was the most scrupulous of all cairo architects he allowed no detail of his numerous edifices to be neglected and the wealth of ornament which he lavished upon them was all cut in limestone or marble one may realize the richness of this decoration in his mosque within the city near ibn tulun's where the chief arch is formed of twenty-three blocks of stone on each side alternately red and white and every one of the white blocks is covered with arabesque or geometrical designs no two of which appear to be alike the arabesques consist of the usual trefoil surrounded by very beautifully intertwined foliage conventionally treated the geometrical patterns though at first sight composed of irregular pentagons and hexagons are all symmetrically arranged and form one elaborate design on the spandrels of the arch will be noticed medallions there are many such in cairo containing the name of the sultan and the benediction upon him a broad band of koranic inscription separated by arabesque patterns runs as a frieze under the sculptured cornice the general effect of the whole is wonderfully rich and there is hardly a space that is not filled by some delicate design even in his wakalas or inns Kaid Bey was no less careful in details. Few buildings in Cairo are more fertile in varied designs than his Wekala in the street on the south side of the Azar. The interior, unhappily, is deserted and in decay, but once, no doubt, it was richly ornamented. The façade is still in good preservation, and deserves careful study by all who wish to understand arabesque and geometrical ornament at its best. When we say at its best, some objection may be taken to the fact that certain designs are systematically repeated in reverse, in contrast to the honest way of the older artists who scorned to repeat themselves. But by the time of Kaid Bey the beauty of uniformity had been realized, and it was seen that a certain symmetry and recurrence of the designs really improved their effect. This change was part of the general tendency towards symmetrical finish and architectural proportion which distinguishes the later from the earlier Mamluk style. There is, however, abundant variety in the numerous panels of arabesque and geometrical ornament which form the borders above the thirteen shops of the inn front, in the superb arched gateway of the centre, and in the beautiful engaged column in the corner, next to the sibyl or fountain, with its carved drums and stalactite capital. In its original state this Wekala must have been a noble building, even as it is, one may call it almost a textbook of Saracenic decoration. Indeed, the epoch of Kaid Bey was almost a repetition of the great building epoch of En Nasir. The Circassian mosques are usually the favourites with architects as well as with the unprofessional sightseer, their exquisite proportions, delicate minarets, beautifully sculptured domes, elaborate stalactites in portals, cornices, and wherever angles had to be masked, and their rich marble mosaics and incastrated kiblas are perfect in taste and disposition. Besides the two exquisite mosques of Kaid Bey, those of the emirs Esbek el Yusufi, 1495, Kerbek, 1502, and the master of the horse, Emir Akhor Kanibek, 1503, are full of fine work, whilst for a little gem of the best Circassian type, nothing is better worth seeing than the medresa of Kadi Abu Bekr ibn Musir or Masar, 1480, which has been restored with exceptional skill by the Commission for the Preservation of the Arab Monuments, whose architect, Herz Bey, has devoted the greatest pains to tracing the original colours and designs and faithfully reproducing them. 
Another careful restoration is that of the mosque of the emir Kagmas el Ishaki, 1481, and both show conspicuous improvement upon the earlier experiments in restoring the Barkukia Medresa. It is to be noticed that, in the majority of the Medresas of the 15th century, the original cruciform shape is considerably modified. The Medresa, though still a college, gradually usurped the position of the Gami, or Congregational Mosque. Friday prayers were held in the Medresa, since few new Gamis were erected. The most important were those of Muayat, Bards Bay, and Esbek, and the court and the eastern transept, sanctuary or chancel, were enlarged, whilst the side transepts became smaller and even dwindled to mere recesses. Probably the reduction of the side transepts was due in some measure to the fact that only two of the four orthodox schools, the Shafi and the Hanafi, had any great following in Egypt, and there was thus no necessity for the retention of the original plan of four separate lecture halls. The result is that we find under the Circassian sultans that a compromise has been made between the Gami and the Medresa, and the form of the latter has been modified to suit the requirements of the former. This modified Medresa form is almost universal in the Circassian period of architecture, and the salient features, the enlargement of the sanctuary and the diminishing of the side transepts, is particularly conspicuous in the Medresa of Kagmas. Even to the end, when the Ottoman conquest was obviously at hand, the Circassian Mamluks retained much of their vigor and all their aesthetic powers. There are few more interesting figures in their line than the old Sultan El Guri, called to the throne in 1501, after four incompetent rulers in as many years had succeeded Kaid Bey. He was a man of bold decision and boundless energy. He restored order in the anarchy of Cairo, levied ten months' taxes at a stroke to replenish his treasury, taxed water-wheels, boats, camels, Jews, Christians, servants, every possible source, increased the customs dues, confiscated vast estates and levied enormous death duties. Having restored the revenue and earned an evil name for extortion, he proceeded to spend it on great public works. Canals, roads, fortifications on the coast, the strengthening of the citadel of Cairo, the improvement of the pilgrim's route to Mecca, these were among his good deeds. His college, 1503, and tomb mosque, where, however, he is not buried, still face each other at opposite sides of the street that bears his name, the Guriya, though badly mauled by the injudicious restoration of thirty years ago. He also built a minaret for the Asar, the mosque of the Nilometer on the island of Roda, the Seville el Muminin, or Fountain of the Faithful, in the Rumela, the watermills at Masar el Attica, and restored the aqueduct to the citadel. He was sumptuous in his court and generous to poets and musicians, whilst he mulcted the ears of his nobles and robbed orphans of their dower. Fully alive to the importance of the Indian trade, then menaced by the Portuguese, he furnished a fleet in the Red Sea and sent it to India, where with the help of the governor of Diu, it defeated the interloping seniors under the younger Almeida in an engagement of Chol in 1503. Finally, but too late, he led his army into Syria to do battle with the advancing Ottomans, and fell fighting at the age of seventy-six on the fatal field of Mark Dabik, near Aleppo, where the desertion of the two wings under Keirbek and El Ghazali left the old sultan alone with his bodyguard to be trampled under the horses of the troopers he vainly tried to rally. 24th of August, 1516. An engagement near Heliopolis to the north of Cairo completed the rout of the Mamluks. Tuman Bey tried to make a stand against the invaders at the Bab en Nasser, but Selim took him in the flank, and after hand to hand fighting in the streets, the citadel was stormed, Tuman was crucified at the gate of Suwela, and Egypt became a province of the Ottoman Empire. End of section fifteen.
Section 16 of the Story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole. Section 16. Chapter 8 The City of the Arabian Nights. Part 1. In the preceding chapter, we finish the story of Cairo as the capital of an independent state and describe some of the beautiful buildings with which the Mamluk sultans and nobles adorned the city. But the life of a town does not consist in the doings of the court, and we should form a very incomplete picture of medieval cairo if we looked no deeper than the sultans and their mosques and colleges and tombs though trampled under the hoofs of the dominant troopers the city had a vigorous life of its own a life of prosperous commerce of social enjoyment and of literary culture cairo society was no longer the limited palace coterie cooped up within the high walls of the Fatimid palaces. It spread on all sides save the east. It had flowed out beyond the northern gates and formed the new suburb of the Hoseiniya, where many mosques and chapels grew up. It had spread to the west over the space between the old Fatimid wall and the Nile, and the river had conveniently receded and allowed the new port of Balak and a whole colony of houses to be formed on what had been the Nile bed till the wreck of the good ship Elephant helped to make a sandbank called the Elephant's Isle, Gezerat El Phil, which altered the river's course and provided an excellent building site. To the south, the space between the Fatimid walls and the citadel and the mosque of Ibn Tullin, where only gardens and summer villas and pools flooded at high Nile had been seen in Saladin's day, was now covered with houses, among which rose the domes and minarets of the Mamluks. The expansion of the city may readily be traced in the topographer's careful record of the building of mosques, which necessarily implies a neighboring population. The mosque of Yunus, C. A. H. 719, and of Ibn et Tabak, the son of Nasir's cook, 746, in the quarter of el Luk, pointed to the recession of the Nile, which formerly ran close by. In the same way, the foundation of the mosques of Ibn Ghazi, 741, and Det Tawashi, 745, on the outside or west of the old Babel Bar and the Zawiya of Abbas Suid, around 724, outside the Bab el Kantara point to a westward extension, though here the land was not formerly under water the great expansion to the north caused by the upheaval of the elephant isle before twelve hundred a d and the emergence of block a century later may be fully traced in the annals of the mosques macrizzi tells us that the elephant isle was flooded only at high nile and during the rest of the year it was a lynx of sandbanks and coarse grass where the Mamluks used to practice archery in their unhappy ignorance of golf. But as the Nile receded, quote, people began in 1313 to erect houses in consequence of the improvements made in that part by N. Nasir, end of quote, who had dug the new canal, then known as the Kaleg An Nasiri, and now as the Isma Ilia, which drained the tract. Quote, 
and a proclamation was made in Cahira and Misser, inviting everyone to build there without delay. So the emirs and soldiers and merchants and common folk built houses there, and Balak was created at this period. End of quote. He adds that water was drawn from the Nile by a Sakaya wheel, which stood on the spot where the mosque of El Katiri was afterwards built, which shows that the river has not retreated much since, for it still runs very near this mosque, which was founded by I Demir in 737, on a site which was under water thirty years before. Other mosques at Balak were those of Ibn Sarim and El Ba City, eight seventeen. Behind or east of Balak, on what is now called the Abbasaya Road, was a plot of land beside the Elephant's Isle, known as Ard et Tabala, or the Demene of the Tamburina, because it was presented by the Caliph Mustansir to a singing girl who celebrated the glories of the Fatimids to the accompaniment of her drum. There also houses began to be built, and the mosque of el Kemakti was founded there on the new canal in a h seven ninety before this another mosque that of el asiuti had been erected about seven forty on the elephant's isle as well as that of saruga on the new canal near the pool of er erratli still further to the east we find a number of mosques rising in the new quarters outside the old city walls such were the gamis of al malik seven thirty two and ibn el felek in the hosea quarter those of akush and ibn el magrabi on the canal outside the convents of yunus al gebuga around seventeen fifty and ibn gurub seven ninety eight and the zawiyas of el gabari around six eighty seven nasser around seven nineteen el kalendaria around seven twenty two and el kilati around seven thirty seven outside the bab and nasser all of which testified to the expansion of the city towards the north cairo had in fact attained much the same dimensions as it measured fifty years ago before the new european suburbs near the nile were developed there was probably little difference either in outward aspect or in the life of the middle and lower classes between the cairo of the fifteenth century and the city which europeans such as wilkinson burckhardt lane john philip and hay visited and described or painted in the first half of the nineteenth some of hayes and his companions o b carter's drawings sketched about eighteen thirty are here reproduced and they may fairly be taken as true representations of a town which still retained its essential mediaeval characteristics how different cairo must then have appeared to the newly arrived visitor who landed at Balak after coming through the mahmadaya canal from alexandria and then ascending the nile there was a mile's ride from the river bank at Balak to the bab el hadid by which you entered cairo at the northwest corner and instead of the crowded villa suburb of to-day there was scarcely a house to be seen quote, two principal roads writes lane of nearly the same length led from Balak to cairo the northern which is somewhat irregular but is the chief route of commerce there were of course no railways then leads to the bab el hadid and the southern after having crossed two canals enters the western side of the Ezbekaya. we pass the picturesque mosque of abu ola on our right as we enter the latter road the french during their occupation of egypt raised this road intending also to continue it through 
the town as far as the citadel it is straight and wide but very uneven and wanting a row of trees on its southern side to shade it it is raised a few feet above the level of the plain so as to be above the reach of the inundation on either side during the inundation are marshes and inundated fields these as soon as the waters have subsided are sown with corn beans tree foil etc here and there are clusters of palm trees and a few sycamores and acacias the plain was formerly bounded on the east by extensive mounds of rubbish doubtless the ruins of mox behind which the capital was nearly concealed the road crosses two canals over each of which is a stone bridge along the western side of the second canal on the right of the road is a long ridge of rubbish from the top of this ridge about a quarter of a mile from the gate of the Ezbekaya, we obtain a view of cairo this was how one approached cairo in the first half of the nineteenth century the description reads drearily enough but it has the merit of showing what the place was like before the european builder took it in hand when the traveller plodded along the uneven road between the bean fields in eighteen thirty five he was traversing precisely the same scene as had been trodden by the mamluk horsemen for centuries and he was approaching a city which was still to all intents the city of the arabian nights there is no manner of doubt from internal evidence that it was in cairo that these famous tales took their definite shape their origins have of course been traced to a large extent in persia and india but their final form and colour are egyptian though many of the scenes are laid at baghdad where the famous harun ur rashid played so conspicuous and erratic a part it is obvious to any student of the topography that the writers were very imperfectly acquainted with the caliph's city it is cairo that they know and describe whatever names they please to give to their scenes there are incidental touches that make it probable that the arabian nights assumed their present form in all essentials before the middle of the fourteenth century the latest historical personage mentioned is saladin and there are many reasons for believing that the tales were collected and written very nearly in their final shape during the revival of letters that ennobled the golden age of mamluk civilization on the nile the society they describe is precisely what we know of mamluk times it is orthodox muslim society of the kyrene type it may be wondered that there should be any speculation at all about the date of so famous a book but the explanation is simple scholars and learned men in the east have always looked with contempt upon stories such as these which are wholly devoid of the literary preciosity which was the special pride of the true man of letters hence they did not deign even to mention the thousand and one nights save in two or three slight references which do not determine the date of the existing redaction the nights were written for the people for the audiences who gathered in the coffee shops to listen to the professional reciter for the large uneducated middle class of cairo this is what constitutes their special merit in the eyes of the student of mediaeval egypt the doings of the kings and emirs we learn from the detailed pages of makrizi and many other scholarly writers it is from the thousand and one nights that we gain our insight into the life of the people a life divided from that of the great by a gulf over which the oriental historian rarely leaps the tales are above all the adventures of merchants and shopkeepers we are introduced no doubt to caliphs and sultans and viziers as well as to the jinn efrits and marids and other members of the spirit world but the real actors in the stories are traders men who keep shop and who have ventures upon the seas and often make voyages themselves Sindibad might easily have heard many of his own adventures from the lips of the motley crowd that gathered on the quays at misr from all parts of the known world 
ibn said stood and watched the shipping in twelve forty six and noticed the vessels arriving from all lands Quote, as for the merchandise from the mediterranean and the red sea that comes to misery it is past describing here is it bonded not at cairo and hence it is distributed throughout egypt End of quote. what was true of miser the mox was also true of their successor the fourteenth century port at balak it was from balak that ali of cairo after spending all his inheritance making merry with his wife on the island of rhoda took ship for dabietta and set forth on his quest of a new fortune the constantly recurring references to commercial voyages and great profits are exactly what would occur to a people whose wealth was made not only by a prodigiously fertile soil but by a copious foreign trade what the transit trade of egypt was worth in mamluk times may be judged from a few facts a single vessel clearing cargo at alexandria paid twenty one thousand pounds in customs the great italian republics found it necessary to maintain consular agents in egypt and that there was a wealthy colony of european merchants is shown by their being able headed by the consul of venice to guarantee the king of cyprus's ransom of one hundred thousand pounds the venetians had enjoyed special privileges in egypt since the time of el adil in twelve o eight who allowed them to build a mart funduk of their own at alexandria the pisans had a consul there and the concessions to venice were renewed in twelve thirty eight on the other side in the red sea there were the ports of suez tor coser eid hob delek and sawakin where the mamluk sultans levied customs of a tenth ad walorum the indian trade had greatly developed under the later mamluk sultans and there was much rivalry and a tariff war between the arabian and egyptian ports in the red sea in the effort to secure the heavy customs dues which were pressed beyond the customary tenth in fourteen twenty six we read of forty vessels from india and persia paying thirty six thousand pounds in duties at gidda the port of mecca which like yenbu was then egyptian nor were the government duties limited to importation there were certain monopolies sugar pepper wood metalwork could be sold only at government warehouses at government prices subject to duty a consignment of pepper that was bought at cairo for fifty dinars was sold to europeans at alexandria for one hundred and thirty under government regulations the venetians after vain consular remonstrance sent a fleet to alexandria to bring away all their merchants and bars bay was obliged to reduce his exorbitant terms how much store the circassian sultan set by the transit trade between india and europe has been seen in the vigorous effort made by el guri to crush the portuguese in the arabian sea as soon as he realized the dangerous rivalry of the cape route indeed the transit trade must have been a chief source of wealth as mr cameron our consul at port said has well put it the mamluk sultans quote, masters of both egypt and syria held the ports and caravan routes between europe and her indian trade and levied customs dues on every bale of oriental produce which arrived from the persian gulf and the red sea for transferred to the harbours between alexandria and alexandretta and for transshipment to venice until the discovery of the cape route in fourteen ninety eight and its subsequent development they enjoyed the monopoly of the entire volume of indian trade with the levant and venice by her commercial capitulations with them was their sole agent on the continent let us try and estimate what this monopoly meant an arab merchant like sinbad the sailor buys ten thousand pounds worth of raw silks nutmegs pepper indigo cloves and mace in persia or at calicut and lands them at basra or suez the sea route up the persian gulf would be shorter than the voyage up the red sea but the caravan road from 
basra to aleppo would be more perilous than the short journey across egypt at landing the customs would amount to some four thousand pounds this is much above the mark and the goods would then be worth say twenty thousand pounds a second arab merchant on the mediterranean coast or perhaps at the wharves of Balak, would sell the consignment for thirty thousand pounds to the venetian who would have to pay another five thousand pounds customs dues before he could clear his cargo thus whether in customs or in tolls or in presents to local governors and escorts a quarter of the thirty five thousand pounds paid by the venetian would go to the mamluk sultan and aristocracy merely for the privilege of transit End of quote. it was not the government alone that made the profit the cairo merchant who brought the precious bales from india and the spice islands or at least bought them from the indian traders at the red sea ports made his fortune too the thousand and one nights are full of such successful ventures did not the second sheikh who led the two black hounds describe how quote, we then prepared merchandise and hired a ship and embarked our goods and proceeded on our voyage for the space of a whole month at the end of which we arrived at a city where we sold our merchandise and for every piece of gold we gained ten end of quote. such fortunate speculations were no doubt of everyday occurrence and the trade represented by these ventures did not all go out of the capital a large part found its way into the bazaars to be retailed to the good people of cairo and to minister to the luxurious tastes of the thousands of hangers-on to the mamluk court we can form but a meagre notion of the mediaeval funduk from the present bazaars a funduk or khan or wakala there is little difference between the three terms is a great collection of warehouses and shops generally surrounding a court but sometimes more like a covered arcade where the merchants keep their reserves of stores and where the traders find lodgings for themselves and stabling for their beasts between their journeys one great mediaeval khan is still familiar to every tourist the khan el khalili or turkish bazaar built by garkas el khalili the master of the horse of sultan barkuk in fourteen hundred on the site once occupied by the graves of the fatimid caliphs whose bones were dug up and carted away on asses to the rubbish mounds outside the eastern gate another khan the ham sawi or cloth market is also well known and two of kai bays wakalas the facades of which are finely ornamented with arabesque panels and intricate geometrical designs and wooden medallions carved with the sultan's name still remain beside the azar and the in the surugaya when lane described cairo in eighteen thirty five there were about two hundred wekalas and even now one can scarcely pass down a street without finding one of these big courts surrounded by rooms the inn of the east opening out through a tall gateway in the fifteenth century the khans of cairo were busy marts of the merchants and the mamluk emirs who had clear ideas as to the value of house property emulated one another in building handsome wakalas every room of which might be expected to bring in a substantial rent there was the khan of masrur one of the most famous the young man in the story of the humpback quote, put up a, end of quote, there and stored his merchandise and after a night's rest took some of his goods and went to the quote, k saria of garcas end of quote, another famous market of mediaeval cairo dating from fatimid days to sell to the merchants quote, do his other merchants end of quote, said the sheikh of the brokers to the stranger quote, sell thy merchandise upon credit for a certain period employing a scrivener a witness and a money changer and receive a portion of the profits every thursday and monday so shalt thou make of every piece of silver too besides thou wilt have leisure to enjoy the amusements of egypt and its nile End of quote. so the young man followed his advice 
and left his goods to be sold for him whilst he lived joyously at the khan a mess rear, breakfasted on wine and chicken and mutton and sweetmeats and perfumed himself elegantly till he met the damsel at the shop of better eddin the gardener and there happened what fate had decreed to be a warning to such as would be admonished that the young man should have his hand cut off by the executioner at the gate of zuwela was exactly what might be expected in the days of the mamluks this khan of mesrur or rather two khans one large and the other small was built on a part of the site of the fatimid great palace where the slaves used to be sold by mesrur a favorite slave of saladin who left it as a legacy for the benefit of the poor the larger building had a hundred rooms and was the chief resort of merchants from syria quote the most renowned and greatest of the khans end of quote says the topographer but its prosperity declined after the tribulation of syria at the hands of tamerlane quote its honor departed and many of its apartments were ruined end of quote another famous khan was that of bilal a slave of s sali the grand-nephew of saladin so favored that the sultan kalan used to say quote, god have mercy on our late master as sali i used to carry the slippers of this eunuch bilal whilst he went into the presence End of quote. the slave was very rich and abounded in good deeds many poets praised him and were amply rewarded and among his worthy acts was the building of the khan where the merchants would deposit their chests of great value quote, i used to enter this bundak says macreasy and lo around it were chests piled little and great so that only a small space was left in the middle and these chests contained gold and silver enough to amaze one End of quote. then there was the khan of the subal outside the babel futa founded by saladin's vizier karakush for quote, sons of the road end of quote. poor wayfarers who were received without payment and the wakala kusan built by nasir's son-in-law near the mosque of el hakim where syrian merchants stored oil and sesame and soap and preserves and pistachio nut almond syrups and the like every storeroom being let by the emir's order at no more than five dirhams of silver without extortion and no one being turned away it was a busy place in macreasy's time very popular on account of its cheapness full of people and bales of goods and noisy with the shouts of the porters there were three hundred and sixty lodgings above the storerooms all occupied and four thousand people lived there the tater devastation of syria ruined this khan too opposite the suwela gate stood the fruit market where the produce of the gardens round cairo was sold it was roofed over like most of the bazaars in former days to keep off the rays of the sun and the fruit which smelt like the gardens of paradise was tastefully arranged and decorated with flowers and sweet herbs there were many more great buildings of this kind the history of which is related by the laborious topographer whose descriptions enable us almost to reconstruct in imagination the city of the fifteenth century cairo was a sumptuous and beautiful place in those days the old mamluk palaces of which we have but relics in the huge blank walls of beshtak's palace the fine gateway of yeshbek's dar next to sultan hassan's mosque and the better preserved mansions of Kayat bey and of the emir mame known as the bet el kadi were then in their full glory the various quarters were still separated by their strong gates barred at night the sucks were shaded by matting or wooden roofs and the lattice windows with their delicate tracery overhung the streets macreasy enumerates and describes thirty-seven horrors or quarters thirty districts coot sixty-five streets darb twenty-one by-streets and alleys sukak and kalka forty-nine squares or places rabba fifty markets suk twenty-three great markets ke saraya 
eleven hostelries khan fundak wakala fifty-five famous palaces and mansions kasa dar forty-four public baths haman twenty-eight closes and gardens hakar bustam eleven race courses maidan and numerous pleasure houses or belvedere's manzara many of the streets still run in their old places and some of their names survive such as the saliba or crossways ben el kasrain ben s surain harat bargawan suk es sila khan el kalili darb el asfar haban naya kurun fish the old quarters of cairo have changed much less than the old parts of london but the reason is melancholy london has changed because it has grown cairo remained comparatively unaltered because it was slowly decaying the loss of much of the indian trade the dependence upon turkey the misrule of pashas and mamluk bays all tended to reduce the prosperity of the city which had flourished exceedingly under the turkish and circassian sultans End of section 16 Chapter 8, The City of the Arabian Nights, Part 1 Section 17 of the Story of Cairo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the story of cairo by stanley lane pool section seventeen chapter eight the city of the arabian nights part two with decline of trade came decline in the arts there is still a little good work made in cairo in brass chasing jewelry and silk weaving but it is a poor relic of what once went on there one has only to visit the arab museum to realize what magnificent work the artists of cairo produced in the mamluk period the arts were closely related to the mosques which attained their greatest perfection of ornament in the same period and the chief objects in the museum were once parts of the decoration or furniture of the mosques the beautiful inlaid and chased silver and brass tables with delicate designs in open tracery koran cases lamps and chandeliers bowls censers candlesticks enameled glass lamps with inscriptions in blue picked out with carmine and gold generally came from mosques and centre round the fourteenth century the carved panels inlaid with ivory and ebony and choice woods once enriched the doors and pulpits of the mosques and the cast bronze bosses and cut brass filigree work belong chiefly to the same period there are many admirable examples of these arts in the south kensington museum and the british museum possesses an unsurpassed collection of a saracenic metal work there is unhappily no market of the inlayers now at cairo as there was in macrizi's time this silver and gold inlay of arabesques and inscriptions on a brass base was one of the most elaborate and characteristic of saracenic arts it was not egyptian in origin but derived from the old sasanian silversmiths of mesopotamia the oldest specimens we know came from mosul on the tigris which was a famous home of metal workers within reach of the mines of the taurus country no doubt these mosul smiths were attracted to cairo in the flourishing days of the mamluk sultans or even earlier at least it is certain that some of their finest work was done for the egyptian market and even bears the names of well-known cairene rulers and emirs there is the casket for example engraved with the name and titles of el adil the second saladin's 
grand nephew who sat on the throne of egypt from twelve thirty eight to twelve forty and was succeeded by s sali the husband of spray of pearls it is in the mosul style of the earliest period the sides are ornamented with dotted eight foils exactly resembling the ornament on the silver coins of the family of saladin containing hunting scenes a combat with a lion a horseman with falcon on wrist which is covered with the falconer's glove etc the intervening ground is decorated with fine arabesques and an inscription on the bevel of the lid gives the name and titles of the sultan on the top are personifications of the six planets of arabian science surrounding the sun the seventh the moon a seated figure holding a crescent mercury with his writing materials venus a woman playing on the lyre mars a warrior brandishing a sword and holding a bleeding head jupiter a throned judge and saturn patron of thieves with his bludgeon and purse outside these is a band of the twelve signs of the zodiac represented much in the usual manner on the bottom of the box is an inscription stating that it was made quote, for the royal wardrobe of el adil end of quote. the hunting scenes and representations of human figures and animals are characteristic of mesopotamian silver work and we see medallions of two-headed eagles on a splendid inlaid perfume burner in the british museum made as the silver letters inform us quote, by order of his excellency the generous the exalted lord the great emir the honourable master martial warrior for the faith warden of islam mighty heaven supported victorious full moon of the faith bey sari mamluk of ez zahir bey bars end of quote etc the date must be before twelve seventy nine and the vessel carries us back to the days of kalan and the beginning of mamluk splendor Sari was one of the greatest and most sumptuous of the early mamluk emirs and his perfume burner was typical of the luxurious refinements of his palace he valued his comfort more than ambition and twice refused the precarious honour of the throne during the unsettled period succeeding kalan's death when the sultanate was open to the strongest emir even so he could not escape the consequences of being wealthy and distinguished and in spite of his retiring character he was suspected of pretensions to power fleeced of his treasures and often confined to the dungeons of the citadel his palace which stood in bain el kasrain covered four acres and possessed the richest mosaics and the handsomest carved doors in cairo better ed din Besari was indeed the most sumptuous man of his time he loved to surround himself with beautiful things and his slave bodyguard was the best appointed of the day no fortune could support his lavish extravagance he not only spent upon himself but gave prodigally to all who asked him hospitality was his foible and his gifts to the poor ran in round sums of five hundred or a thousand dirhams say francs to each applicant he would daily distribute three thousand pounds of meat and a single present consisted of a thousand pieces of gold five thousand bushels of corn and a thousand hundred weight of honey one of his mamluks used every day to draw ninety pounds of meat and seventy rations of barley which it is to be presumed neither he nor his horses could possibly digest naturally Sari was perpetually in debt the constant amount of his liabilities was placed at four hundred thousand dirhams for as soon as one debt was paid off the generous soul hastened to contract another of the same figure a considerable part of his expenditure must have gone in table equipage for it is recorded that he never drank twice out of the same cup and as macreasy mentions that at one time this thirteenth century epicure was wholly given over to wine and hazard of the number of cups required must have been considerable but a great and cultivated emir 
needed more than cups for his comfort he must have in laid tables on which to put the broad brass tray encrusted with chased silver and gold which carried his service of the forbidden fruit of the grape he must have his beautiful hall lighted by candles placed in elaborate stands covered with silver inlay his very tubs and cooking-pots must be chased with arabesques and complicated designs and his palace must be perfumed with incense rising from perfume burners on which the artist had engraved representations of horsemen at the chase hounds and quarry falcons and waterfowl and all the decorative subjects of the saracen silversmith the earliest and finest examples of metalwork connected with the names of cairo kings and nobles are of mosul origin though very probably made in cairo in the market of the inlayers by artists who had been attracted to the court there was undoubtedly an early fatimid art of a similar character but beyond a very few rare examples such as the bayot casket at paris and some specimens of cut crystal at venice we know almost nothing of its style under the mamluk sultans however cairo soon acquired a school of her own which seems to have possessed traditions coming from a different source than that of mosul the cairo style is what we see on the numerous trays bowls cups censers and other vessels of the mamluks of egypt of the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries preserved in our museums and private collections some points of resemblance to the mosul work may be noticed but the new elements are very distinct the figures of horsemen and seated princes have for the most part disappeared as it was natural they should when the turkish princes became habituated to the puritanical prescriptions of islam concerning the treatment of living things in art but borders representing beasts of the chase and a ground covered with wild duck and other fowl still remain the prevalence of the duck which was easily explicable in the swamps of mesopotamia finds another raison d'etre in egypt for the founder of the line of sultans who ruled in cairo for nearly a century was a turk of kipchak whose name kalan means in his native mongol tongue duck we may compare abbot islip's plastic puns on his own name in his chapel in westminster abbey the ornament of the mamluk metalwork is essentially different in style from that of mosul the inscriptions are arranged in broad bands with large surfaces of silver inlay divided by medallions filled with the sultan's name on a fess or else by some heraldic coat of arms borne by the owner among which the cup and polo stick indicating the court offices of cupbearer and polo master the lozenge and a curious imitation of a hieroglyphic inscription common on the ancient monuments of egypt but doubtless unintelligible to the copyists are the most usual round the medallions are belts of flowers and leaves reminding one of the designs of damascus tiles and similar leaves and flowers interspersed with birds cover the ground the execution is no less admirable than the design there was no scamped work among these saracen smiths they cut away the whole design in the brass and undercut the edges to hold the thin plates of silver or gold to be hammered and burnished in which formed the design and they chase with the graver every plate of silver were it only a pin's head in size with wings or eyes or floral scrolls a work of infinite labour and then they cover the interstices where the brass showed with a black bituminous composition which set off the precious metal to advantage much of the silver and coating has been lost by wear and time and it is difficult to realize the beauty of the original state of most of the vessels and trays that have come down to us but a careful examination only reveals more fully the exquisite skill care and fine honest workmanship that no time or injury can destroy this art of silver inlay like architecture in wood and ivory carving and every other variety of aesthetic expression culminated in the wonderful efflorescence of art and culture in the reign of n nasir kalon's son in the first half of the fourteenth century whenever in any museum we see a fine specimen of metalwork we may be almost sure to find the name of a nasiri emir that is a courtier or mamluk of n nasir 
in its inscription and sometimes even the name of the sultan himself the topographer tells us that in his day in the early part of the fifteenth century this beautiful art had fallen into disrepute it used he says to be a favourite taste and quote, we have seen inlaid work kept in such quantities that it could not be counted there was hardly a house in cairo or miser that had not many pieces of inlaid copper End of quote. he means brass a stand of inlaid bowls and plates ranged on a frame of carved wood and ivory was a usual part of a bride's trousseau and cost as much as two hundred dinars but he adds quote, the art is now lacking in miser the demand for this inlaid copper work has fallen off in our times and since many years the people have turned away from buying what was to be sold of it so that but a small remnant of the workers of inlay subsists in this market End of quote. the art was not dead however it had merely passed on elsewhere the heritage which cairo received from mosul was bequeathed to venice we have seen that the venetians were the european agents of the egyptian merchants and it is not too much to say that venice was half an oriental city italy was full of eastern influences we know that a twelfth-century poet lamented that pisa was quote, delivered over to moors indians and turks end of quote. that there was a via saracena at ferrara and lucera was deeply tinged with muslim traditions dating from frederick the second's importation of saracen archers but venice felt this influence most of all her commerce and colonies brought her merchants into relations with the artistic work of the east her ambassadors brought home the splendid gifts of the mamluk sultans and she soon began to import the artist as well as the art the opus salominis or jew's work was the name given to the saracenic style often referred to in early romances chaucer had heard of it for he writes in sir topas quote, and over that a fine hauberk was all he wrought of jew's work End of quote. especially did venice excel in the chasing of great salvers in the saracenic manner though with considerable differences both in design and in technique the silver is applied chiefly in narrow threads instead of broad plates and the designs are chiefly arabesque whilst the forms of the vessels show marked improvement upon the somewhat crude outlines of the cairo silversmith native italian artists began to copy the art introduced by mahmoud the kurd and his saracen comrades they called themselves azamin that is workers in the persian style al ajemina for it has long been the fashion to miscall every form of saracenic art persian and we read of italian artists such as giorgio ghizi azimina of mantua and paulus ajemenius who excelled in the art which have been imported from egypt we have singled out the silver inlay from among the arts of mediaeval cairo because it is a branch in which the development can be traced with certainty by a series of dated examples but the chief decorative arts of the mosque builders were wood carving and marble mosaic the beautiful panelled work of mosque pulpits and doors originally suggested no doubt by the necessity of small surfaces in a hot climate where warping had to be prevented are among the most characteristic forms of cairo ornament and the use of variegated marbles in the mirabs of the mosques produces a rich of sometimes rather glaring effect which was imitated in the dados of the house of the nobles now unhappily for the most part destroyed the extensive use of wood in cairo architecture is the more remarkable when it is considered how little suitable wood grows in egypt on the other hand the dry climate though it warps preserves timber for centuries the original wooden ties of the pillars of ibn tullin's mosque have stood for more than a thousand years and are still sound and a portion even of the ceiling of the arcades has been preserved this wooden ceiling shows that in the ninth century the same method was used as is seen in all periods of saracenic art previous to the introduction of european styles it consists of joists of palm trunks sawn in two with the three exposed sides faced with planks to square the outline 
the hollows between the squared joists were divided by cross pieces into shallow compartments or coffers in private houses the joists were often left uncovered in their natural half-round shape whether planked or left in the round the joists and the coffers between were coated with plaster generally laid on canvas and the plaster was painted with arabesques in deep blue carmine and gold these coffered ceilings which may still be seen in many houses have a wonderfully rich effect with their deep tones of red and blue lighted up by gold outlines and the transition from the ceiling to the walls is skilfully masked by arching and stalactite pendatives richly painted with similar designs inferior to the coffered ceilings but still very effective are those composed of boards nailed flat across the joists and covered with a thin coating of stucco worked into arabesque and floral patterns and then painted and gilt or with a geometrical design formed by appliqued strips of wood gilt shaded with red the interstices being filled with arabesques and painted stucco wood carving had ample opportunities for display in the pulpits koran desks interior doors and cupboards of mosques some of the oldest examples from the mosques of ibn tullin and el hakim may be seen in the arab museum at cairo and the deep volutes carved in the panels are clearly of byzantine origin resembling the still earlier but undated panels found in the tract of ein s sira south of cairo in the thirteenth century the style alters instead of the bold foliate designs we find more intricate and delicate ornament distributed in much smaller geometrical panels a peculiarly beautiful example is the sheikh's tomb casing of twelve sixteen of which one side is in the museum at south kensington and the other three in the arab museum another is the carved casing of the tomb of s sali ayeb twelve forty nine Quote, the little panels are formed into hexagonal stars and delicately carved and here appears the representation of fruit stalks which is a common feature in thirteenth-century wood carving the mirab or prayer niche from the chapel of sayida rakaya which belongs probably to the same century deserves special notice for its characteristic ornamentation of stems branching out of a vase End of quote. but it was under the mamluk sultans and especially in the great period of an nasir that wood carving attained its most exquisite development woods of different colors were employed to produce the effect of relief and inlay was largely adopted in place of carving in the solid block sometimes each little carved panel was set in a frame of ebony beading which was itself carved and often consisted of two or three distinct frames one outside the other whilst the central design was hardly ever the same in two panels out of many hundreds the amount of careful work demanded in carving and putting together a large surface of this intricate panelling must have been immense many beautiful examples may be seen in the mosques and even finer are the carved doors in wood and ivory panelling in the coptic churches of babylon from which there can be little doubt that the moslems learnt the art but to see mamluk carving at its best one need not leave london a large number of the very finest specimens were taken away from their lawful guardians during the reign of the khedive ishmael and even earlier have found their way to the museum at south kensington there we may study at leisure some of the rich yet not over elaborate arabesque carvings abstracted from the pulpit set up in the mosque of ibn tullin by lagan in twelve ninety six others of extraordinary beauty from the mosque of el maradani thirteen thirty nine absurdly set in the top of a french table others probably from the pulpit of the mosque of kusan also set in coarse modern framework but preserving all the delicate grace of the arabesque carvings absolutely intact and finally the complete pulpit bearing the inscription of kayat bey but from what mosque is not known the whole forms a singularly rich and beautiful exhibition of saracenic wood carving of the best period there are differences and even decadence in the series however and a careful study of the designs will show that the art reached its highest point in the carvings of el maradani that is immediately after the reign of en nasir sheikhu's pulpit of 
thirteen fifty eight is not so good sultan hassan's is of stone el bayad's of fourteen twenty is distinctly inferior and even kayat bey's prince though he was of cairo builders is not to be compared with the work of the middle of the fourteenth century the designs have become less spontaneous the lines are harder and more mechanical and as in stone carving there is a tendency to repetition utterly foreign to the earlier work part of this may be explained by the introduction of ivory as the material for the inlaid panels for ivory though capable of even more delicate carving is less easy to work in flowing lines but the main cause was probably the preponderating attention given to carving in stone no sooner does stone become the predominant material for decoration than wood carving like stucco tooling falls into comparative neglect the middle of the fourteenth century was the parting of the ways stone became the favorite material and the carvers of wood if they did not lay aside the graver for the stone chisel at least moulded their style upon the harder outlines of the sculptors and the result was deterioration if wood carving decayed after the middle of the fourteenth century another branch of woodwork was notably developed one charming feature of the exterior of a cairo house is the mesh rabaya of delicate turned tracery there is no reason to doubt that this kind of work is very old but whether by reason of its fragility or the frequent conflagrations that afflicted the city no ancient examples have been preserved the few wooden lattices that still remain in the older mosques are of quite a different style they are made of stout clumsy quarterings divided into compartments filled by square or round upright balusters such as are seen in the tomb of Kalan. others are mere grills of large open squares with no pretension to artistic design a finer kind is seen in lagin's pulpit in the mosque of ibn Tullin twelve ninety six where the mesh is close and the knobs are inlaid and carved it is curious that the true mesh rabaya with its varied designs and lace-like effect first appears in the screen of the sanctuary in the mosque of el maradani which also shows the highest development of wood carving as the one art decayed the other improved there are fine examples of mesh rabaya work of the early part of the fifteenth century as in the pulpit of el mayyad but it attained its greatest perfection in the age of kayat bey of which a fine specimen is preserved in the pulpit of abu becker ibn muzer most of the house mesh rabayas are comparatively modern though it is impossible to fix their precise date their inevitable disappearance is an aesthetic loss that nothing can replace but it must be admitted that they form the most dangerous conductors of fire from house to house and street to street that the ingenuity of man could well devise there is this to be said about every branch of artistic work of mediaeval cairo whether it be architecture carving in wood or stone metal chasing or glass it is always distinctively original the saracens brought no art with them indeed they appear to have been singularly lacking in the aesthetic sense they learned their arts from their foreign subjects yet they invariably introduced an element of differentiation which marks their work as characteristically saracenic they learned their metal chasing from persia but they soon made it their own they copied byzantine and coptic wood carving and added the essential personal equation which constitutes a distinct art they found glass making and blowing in egypt acquired the secrets of enamelling and gilding from constantinople and then produced a style of enamelled lamps totally unlike any other in the world it is not only a variation in design or shape that makes the difference the whole character of the work in every branch of saracenic art is distinct and absolutely sui generis they were not only wonderful assimilators they also had the genius of development on original lines perhaps the strangest part of the matter is that the highest development was achieved in the troubled times of singularly uncultivated and sanguinary foreign masters yet the age of the mamluk sultans was the saturnian age of mohammedan egypt in art and also in literature for it must not be forgotten that some of the greatest names in muslim theology jurisprudence criticism and history were associated as qadis or professors with the mosques and medrias of cairo and that the mamluk period produced or encouraged such writers as ibn khaldun nawayri ibn dukmak makrizi 
ibn hagar el aini ibn arab shah abu el mahasan s su yuti and ibn ayas who either were born in egypt or like abu el fida spent many years in cairo the fifteenth century was perhaps the most prolific period in egyptian literature and this activity was more than rivalled in the neighboring province of syria under the same sultans End of section seventeen. Section eighteen of the story of Cairo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org the story of cairo by stanley lane pool section eighteen chapter nine bays and pashas part one no one has had the heart to write the history of egypt during the three centuries of its subjection to the sultans of turkey from its conquest by selim the grim in fifteen sixteen to muhammad ali's foundation of a virtually independent dynasty in eighteen o five the annals of this period are monotonous and the great figures of the earlier mamluk period are wanting the whole action seems to be played upon a smaller stage by inferior performers the incentives to public spirit supplied by foreign wars were withdrawn from a merely provincial government and the profuse expenditure and sumptuous luxury of a sovereign court no longer stimulated art and handicrafts or quickened the emulation of the emirs the cramping influence of dependence and the grasping physical policy of the ottoman empire destroyed much of the old magnificence of the mamluks yet there was no such vivid contrast between cairo under the pashas and the city that macrizi describes as has sometimes been imagined everything in the east changes by almost imperceptible degrees and the mills of god in egypt grind with the tedious slowness of the creaking sakayas of the country deterioration there was but it came very gradually the emirs were still the dominant power and the chief difference was that instead of a sultan elected by themselves they had over them a pasha appointed by the sublime port the pasha's authority was checked by a council of mamluk emirs or beys as they came to be called and he was frequently deposed by them or by the intrigues of the mutinous soldiery though a pasha might arrive with a suite of twelve hundred persons and scatter handkerchiefs full of gold coins on festal occasions he could seldom make head against the military oligarchy the chief mamluk or sheikh el beled mayor of the city as he was entitled was a far more powerful personage than the pasha the emirs were much what they had been under the circassian dynasty they were not the same men because selim had massacred as many as he could catch but they were similar turks georgians circassians risen from slavery to office and rank and they maintained great state in their palaces beside the azbakaya lake or on the burkit el fil in the crossway or the street of arms were followed by large bands of retainers and carried on their jealousies civil wars and street fights with as much fervor as before a new element of discord was introduced by the turkish battalions of azabs and janizaries in the citadel barracks and the commanders of these troops became the most powerful emirs in egypt but these two were of precisely the same character as the earlier mamluks and save for the absence of a controlling influence such as a strong sultan sometimes exerted but a delegated pasha almost never there was little to choose between the state of cairo under the new regime and its anarchic condition under the impotent direction of most of the later circassian kings egypt in fact was still ruled by 
mamluks its pashas were perpetually changed and lived in terror of their own garrison the emirs held the real power and used it in the old way for their own benefit and for the ruin by exile or execution of their rivals they formed themselves into powerful cliques such as the kasumis and the fakaris and their retainers fought each other in the streets and besieged the government azab troops for months together they had already discovered that the citadel could be commanded by artillery on the hill behind we read in gabarti's chronicle of bands of troops fortifying themselves in the mosques of ibn Talim, Almas, maham madaya and so forth in discharging cannon-balls from the adjacent minarets the anarchy at times was indescribable streets were deserted houses plundered and no man dared to go as far as bullock or old miser then followed an interval of tranquillity assured by the temporary supremacy of some great lord it is difficult to discover any very notable distinction between these later emirs and those of the golden age of mamluk civilization their opportunities were less because they could no longer carry on wars in syria or asia minor in their own behoof for the contingents that were constantly drafted in egypt for foreign service were merely employed as an insignificant part of the ottoman armies but their characters occupations and tastes appear to have been much what they had been for the preceding two centuries there was a difference in degree but not in kind they were not as a rule such big men with large opportunities as their forerunners but in race in character and action they were the same indeed some of them were remarkable personages fit to compare with those of the old school Othman, Bey, du el Fakar, for example in the first half of the eighteenth century after playing a bold part in the faction fight that centred round his patron du el Fakar, bey and jerks bey and seeing eleven emirs of rank done to death in the palace of the deaf tudar himself narrowly escaping with a sabre cut in his turban became the most eminent noble in cairo with power to raise his own mamluks to the rank of emir he was chief of the pilgrimage emir el hag one of the most coveted posts in egypt in seventeen thirty nine and when ali el gelfi the deputy footnote by deputy is meant the ket kuda commonly pronounced kiaya or in egypt kikaya who was the deputy of the pasha and often corresponded loosely with what we should call minister of the interior or home secretary in the footnote was assassinated othman bey deposed the pasha and appointed rud wan to be deputy over the azab battalions othman was the first emir who ventured to invite the pasha of egypt to a feast in his palace and the other nobles were completely subject to him he held a court in his own house to decide causes of complaint and incorruptible himself he severely punished any cases of extortion or oppression that came before him watched the market inspector closely prescribed a fixed tariff for bread and other necessaries of life and insisted on the due payment of pious benefactions to their proper uses lofty in character of noble ideas and thoughts just able disinterested of honest life and proud as lucifer he left such an impression behind him when the intrigues of his rivals banished him from egypt that he created an era one heard people say quote, such a thing happened so many years after the departure of othman bey end of quote. or quote, i was such and such an age when othman bey left end of quote. Rudwan, el gelfi just referred to was another notable figure of the eighteenth century whilst he and another deputy ibrahim held office the country enjoyed absolute peace food was cheaper than was ever known before and plenty reigned in all classes in those days every great man kept open house twice a day noon and evening in a spacious hall to which all might enter the lord and his guests sat at the head of the table and his mamluks and followers lowered down as it were quote, below the salt end of quote and it was held disgraceful to refuse admission to any stranger who presented himself on feast days great dishes of rice and honey or milk were distributed to the poor and sweetmeats were served on fridays and festivals one of rudwan's houses was on the 
as bakaya on the border of the lake as it then was at least at high nile its halls were surmounted by cunningly designed domes in which gold arabesques on a blue ground harmonized with stained glass of many colours in charming combination he built kiosks in a garden beside the canal where he had laid out a lake and cascaded there when his ambition was satisfied he took his pleasure which savoured it must be confessed of debauch indeed rudwan was no stern moralist like othman bey but allowed a considerable license to the fair ladies of cairo the police had his orders not to disturb them or balk their admirers and quote cairo then resembled a land of gazelles a paradise of hurries and darlings its inhabitants drank their fill in the cup of delight as though there were no reckoning to be paid on the day of judgment End of quote. no wonder that poets sang his praises in such verses as quote, the empurpled wine End of quote. and quote, the perfume of paradise End of quote. rude wan's palace is no more to be seen in the ezbekaya but his gate the bab el azab leading into the citadel from the rumela preserves his memory his end was tragic conspirators surrounded his house in the street of kusan and bullets began to pour in whilst he was engaged in the meditative process of having his head shaved he fought while he had strengthened them with a broken leg struggled on horseback and fled to die in upper egypt he was the last great commander of the azabs it was not only the emirs who owned such splendid houses as rudwan another house on the Hezbekaya belonged to a famous merchant ahmad esh sharibi the apothecary whose family had produced emirs and owned mamluks they possessed immense wealth and they used it as high-minded honest gentlefolk learned men frequented their house which was full of rare manuscripts as well as ordinary works of reference whatever book was in the market if it was not in their library they bought it regardless of the price and once there it was immediately placed at the disposal of every visitor a scholar was sure to find any book he required in the Shaurabi library and he was at liberty to carry it off on loan or even to keep it altogether for the princely merchants would never think of asking its return but would merely seek out and buy another copy from the scholar's point of view it seems impossible to improve upon this system the members of this family were more than enlightened book collectors and book lenders they were strict observers of the austere rule of the malikis tenacious of sound morals and exclusive in their connections they married only among their own large family circle and their daughters never left the house except when they were married or born to their grave it was well to be cautious in days when the luxurious rude wan was encouraging amatory adventures and when a party of high-born dames riding out to smell the air as cairo ladies do now at the proper season was set upon near the ezbekaya and stripped of their jewels and every garment they had on but the sharibi folk though strict could unbend when marriage feasts were afoot for example they gave splendid entertainments but so careful were they of their daughters that they waited till all the guests were safely engaged in prayer at the mosque of ezbek footnote pulled down in eighteen sixty nine it was built by the famous emir ezbek ibn tutash from whom the ezbekaya took its name End of footnote. opposite the house and then hurried the bride off to her husband's abode under guard of a discreet body of matrons after which there was plenty of gun firing and torch waving and all was merry the family had the custom of appointing one of their number trustee of all their property and business it was his duty to collect the rents gather the harvest and crops receive the profits of their ventures and pay all expenses including the family's dress and pocket money at the end of the year he drew up in his balance sheet and paid each member his share this excellent plan was not likely to last for ever and one is not surprised to learn that at last the younger members quarrelled over the accounts and the joint stock company broke up in disorder this was no doubt an exceptional family but there were many of the kind and there are some yet in cairo sterling honest folk who walk in the old paths and guard a severe self-respect the zeal for books despaired by this family casts an interesting light upon the education and learning of the times during the earlier mamluk days many important libraries had been formed in cairo partly from the spoils of syrian mosques and if we are to take as evidence the long 
biographies of numerous sheikhs professors divines historians and poets related with enthusiastic admiration by el Gabarti. there was a vast deal of intellectual energy expended in egypt in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries though perhaps it was hardly in the first rank of original genius he reports a curious conversation however in seventeen fifty between ahmad pasha a governor of mathematical tastes and the sheikh abdallah esh shabrawi of the azar the pasha remarked that he had continually heard of the wonderful merits of egypt as the home of learning but he would like to see the results quote, true o oh my master end of quote, replied the sheikh quote, egypt is as you have heard the mine of sciences and knowledge end of quote. Quote, but where are they end of quote, asked the pasha quote, as far as i could see you know nothing but law and metaphysic and other less important studies and disdain practical science altogether end of quote. the sheikh had to admit that at the azar they did not teach mathematics beyond arithmetic which was useful for the law of inheritance quote, how about astronomy end of quote, suggested the pasha quote, it is needed for the hours of prayer times of fast and many other things end of quote. the sheikh admitted that few studied astronomy which demanded special aptitudes and instruments and physiological conditions and a quote, sweet and tranquil disposition end of quote, for its proper pursuit but he said he could find the man whom the pasha wanted though not in the azar when the man appeared it seems his arithmetical problems delighted the governor who gave him a fur cloak which the sage afterwards sold for eight hundred dinars he drew beautiful sundials on marble to show the hours of prayer with the appropriate mottoes and two of these were set up in the azar and on the roof of the mosque of the iman esh shafi footnote Monsieur von bertram describes some curious sundials in his notes d'archologie arabe eighteen ninety two thirteen to eighteen one was set up in the mosque of ibn tullen in six ninety six twelve ninety six by lagen another may still be seen in the mosque of kusin and his date is seven eighty five thirteen eighty three a third exists in the tomb mosque of inal and bears the date eight seventy one fourteen sixty six end of footnote one gathers from this anecdote as well as from the lists of works described by the historian that study in cairo at that time was rather zealous than profound and that learning was decidedly in its decadence religion on the other hand was more powerful than ever the annals of the pashalik are full of references to the influence of the azar professors and of the seyyids and we hear of something very near a revolution when a turkish preacher got up in the mosque of el mayad and fulminated against the invocation of saints a popular accretion which is certainly no part of the creed of mohammed the preacher urged the crowd to demolish the cupolas over the saints tombs and the orthodox professors of divinity had much trouble to silence him and appease the crowd there was often a very severe regulation of public behaviour in deference to religious notions and we find for example a stern prohibition of smoking in the streets police marched up and down three times a day and if any smoker was caught he had to eat his pipe bowl an old custom mentioned by nasir e Crusoe, above page one hundred and nine was still in force a man who had falsified documents was paraded on camelback through the streets whilst a crier proclaimed quote, behold the punishment of forgers end of quote. the Kyrenes were clearly very superstitious and when in seventeen thirty five a circumstantial rumour went round that the resurrection would certainly take place on the next friday in two days time they bade each other last farewells and wandered about the fields and roads saying good-bye to the land they loved whilst the people of giza moved by a superstition which ran in their minds from ages long before islam was discovered bathed hysterically in the nile both men and women there was nothing but panic and repentance and prayer till saturday when behold nothing had happened an age that attached so much importance to religion was not likely to neglect its shrines it is a mistake to ascribe the ruin of so many of the mosques of cairo to the period of the turkish pashas on the contrary the danger was that they might be quote, restored end of quote, out of all knowledge cairo is full of quote, turkish end of quote, mosques that is turkish of the othmanli style which if they cannot compare with the buildings of the earlier mamluks are nevertheless very creditable examples of their kind 
and far superior to anything built say in england during the past century indeed the mosques of sayyida sabaya sixteen o four and of mohammed abu Dhabhab, 1774 are exceedingly noble buildings and that little gem of turkish mosaic work el burdani is beautiful in its own way the architects of the ottoman period abandoned the madrasa style introduced by saladin which as we have seen had lost much of its original cruciform plan when the madrasas were used as congregational mosques under the circassian mamluks but whilst reverting to the older and simpler plan of the gami they modified it by substituting cupolas of mezzantine form for the level ceilings which formerly covered the sanctuary in fact the ottoman mosque is practically a basilica a special feature of the mosques and restorations of the Othmanli period is the introduction of by and the madrasa of aksankar was restored by ibrahim aga in sixteen fifty two and the whole east wall covered with fine blue tiles chiefly of the damascus style with a few so-called rhodian probably from constantinople it was not often that restoration proved so successful and one has frequently to deplore the patching of turkish additions upon the old masterpieces ahmad pasha restored the then dilapidated mosque of el mayad in sixteen ninety another pasha built the arbar in mosque by the kara maiden gate in seventeen o four ahmad the deputy restored the fatimid mosque of ez sabfir known as el fakahani in seventeen thirty five but the prince of restorers was abd er rahman kidhuda who enjoyed great influence before the time when ali bey himself the restorer of the dome of the tomb mosque of imam shah fi and builder of the balak bazaar deposing the reigning pasha made himself king of egypt from seventeen sixty eight to seventeen seventy two abder rahman's father Othman ket huda had architectural tastes out of his very ill-gotten gains he built his mosque school and fountain by the Esbekaya lake and on the day of opening filled the great central basin and all the ewers he could collect with sherbet for the congregation he also built the school for the blind at the azhar and other benefactions his son however far surpassed him every tourist knows his little sibyl elegant like its founder who was dainty in person and dress and very fair at the end of bain el kasrain with its tiles and open arched school above but this was the least of his works he built a mosque outside of the babel futa and another by the babel yib with a cistern fountain and school a great reservoir with fountain and school near the ezbekaya cemetery for the sakos or water carriers rebuilt the chapels of sayyida zainab and sayyida sakina and erected others near the karafa gate in the musky in the hose naya quarter and in the abdin street etc of his restorations the best known is that of the azar which owes its present aspect largely to abd ur rashman's work he put in fifty marble columns supporting groins of face stone covered with costly woods erected a new mirab and pulpit built the two archways one with a school for orphans above it and the other with the minaret set up a tomb in the court added libraries reading-rooms kitchens and other apartments for the benefit of students from upper egypt enlarged the tabar saya and akbur gawaya medrasas attached to the azhar and built a splendid portal between them opposite the wakala of cape bay furnished rewaks or partitions for students from mecca and from the soudan and settled rents and trusts for the maintenance of these benefactions besides giving every day in ramadan to the azar kitchen a large quantity of rice butter oil and meal for the evening refreshment of the students after the day's fast abid ur rahman also restored the mosque of the imam shafi and paved the corridor with variegated marbles repaired the tomb of sayyida nafisa and the maristan of Kalan in a madhouse but after pulling down the dome he neglected to rebuild it and merely boarded it over and so it remains to this day he took great pains to trace the bequests left by the founder and his successors to the hospital and succeeded in recovering the title deeds and restoring the revenues by whatever means he acquired his wealth and it was said the means were not above suspicion there was no end to this man's charitable acts 
at winter time he distributed woollen clothes to crowds of the blind who always abound at cairo and also to the muzans to protect them from cold when chanting the nightly calls to prayer the poor clamoured about his door in the evenings of ramadan waiting for the plates of food which were never refused after the meal they went away happy with two loaves and two pears ready for the next day's breakfast altogether abd dur raman kaya built or rebuilt eighteen mosques besides chapels fountains schools bridges and every sort of edifice he had an architectural passion and fortunately excellent taste in its gratification and the people well named him quote, the great benefactor end of quote. he died at cairo in seventeen seventy six at a great age after twelve years exile in arabia for all his charity could not protect him from the suspicions of ali bey all the ulema professors students and poor of his numerous benefactions escorted his splendid funeral to the azar where he lies in the tomb which he had built near the south gate the last great mosque built during the period of the pashalik was that of mohammed bey known as abu dabar dahab or father of gold or quote, father of gold end of quote, from his munificent way of scattering gold coins among the crowd he was the favorite and trusted mamluk of the great ali bey and he rewarded his patron by manoeuvring his downfall and exile and finally accomplishing his death he was a brilliant soldier fought successful campaigns in arabia and syria for his master and achieved extraordinary popularity by his delightful manners and open hand egypt had peace whilst he held the reins of power and the sublime port whilst appointing pashas as before wisely left the real authority in the hands of the capable and popular emir in seventeen seventy four mohammed bey founded his handsome madrasa opposite the azar and there he lies in his tomb it was built on the plan of an earlier mosque at bulak the semanaya and was quote, a marvel of architecture and richness gilded ceilings marble porticos and stupendous dome with bronze dormers admirably worked into quote, etc there were porticos for the hanafis malakis and shafis and celebrated doctors came to profess the law there and contrary to the usual custom received salaries some as much as one hundred and fifty paras a day you could sometimes buy a pound of meat for two paras and none less than ten paras a day and an annual gift of fifty bushels of corn on the day of opening the great man clothed the divines with cloaks of sables or white fur according to their rank a handsome form of university hood mohammed bey's is the last of the great mosques of cairo with the exception of mohammed ali's sumptuous and very effective mosque in the citadel where it forms a conspicuous feature in the view from every side this however is too obviously a foreign importation a child of stamboul to harmonize with the true cairo style and though it is perhaps a narrow prejudice we confess we can never quite reconcile ourselves to ottoman architecture in the old mamluk city End of section 18section 19 of the story of cairo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the story of cairo by stanley lane pool section 19 chapter nine bays and pashas part two enough has been said to show that it was not during the rule of pashas and bays that the mosques of cairo suffered damage or demolition they were well cared for their evil day came when mohammed ali a second but more successful ali bey made himself master of egypt and inaugurated a new regime compared with which the rule of the sternest of the mamluks was mildness itself it was mohammed ali who in eighteen o eight to eighteen ten laid hands on the the walk of or religious endowments which the piety of many centuries had placed in trust for the maintenance of the mosques and colleges of egypt and amidst the tears and curses 
of all the ulema of cairo deprived them of the right to control the sacred monuments confided to their charge from this act of confiscation when title deeds were lost or destroyed and trust funds confused and malversed dates the most serious decay of the monuments of cairo the europeanizing movement of the nineteenth century inevitable and in many ways most desirable as it was brought with it a large destruction of mosques and other historic buildings which impeded carriage traffic or stood in the way of the new streets and squares which the viceroys of egypt planned with little or no regard to existing antiquities the sharif muhammad ali was the most flagrant example of a street cutting its way remorselessly through historic monuments but similar vandalism occurred in almost every part of the city and the department which attends to the alignment of the streets has often exercised its powers in the narrowest spirit of county councildom that much worse has not happened is wholly due to the vigilance and firmness of the quote, commission for the preservation of the monuments of arab art end of quote, an official body in which happily large powers are vested and to which we owe the maintenance of a multitude of saracenic monuments of every class and all periods which but for its timely interposition would now have disappeared or have been on the high road to ruin it is impossible to overestimate the excellent and patient work of the commission the seventeen annual reports it has issued solid volumes with plans and illustrations form a library of valuable information and testify in every page to the care and sense of responsibility shown by the members it may here be permitted to quote a report on the results and methods of the commission which i made at earl cromer's request in eighteen ninety five and which was published in his annual survey of the progress of egypt presented to parliament in eighteen ninety six the athenaeum london december twelfth eighteen ninety five quote my lord in accordance with your lordship's invitation i have the honour to submit a few remarks on the work of the commission for the preservation of arab monuments of which i made a detailed examination in the summer of this year the commission was instituted by decree of his highness the late khedive on the eighteenth december eighteen eighty one its duties were one to make an inventory of the arab monuments of egypt which possessed historical or artistic interest two to watch over the preservation of these monuments and report to the minister of wakfs such repairs as were considered necessary for their maintenance three to prepare plans for such repairs and scrupulously superintend their execution four to see that plans of all the work executed should be preserved in the ministry of wakfs and to indicate any fragments or detached objects which should be transferred to the museum of arab art political disturbance prevented much being done before the close of eighteen eighty two but when i made a general inspection of the arab monuments of cairo in january to march eighteen eighty three the commission was in working order i was then able to see the beginning of its labours and am therefore in a position to compare the state of the monuments at the time when the commission first took them as seriously in hand with their present condition after the commission has been over twelve years at work i can state with confidence that comparing the general state of the mosques in eighteen eighty three and eighteen ninety five they are in a far safer and better preserved condition now than they were twelve years ago several monuments that then seemed inevitably doomed to destruction have been strengthened and supported and generally speaking weak places have been detected and repaired whilst a more vigilant supervision and protection against vandalism and robbery now prevail these happy results are especially due to the energy in archaeological or technical knowledge of the late rogers bay of franz pasha and of his excellency jacob artin pasha whose name will always be honourably associated with the intellectual progress of egypt some of their 
french colleagues have also rendered useful services from time to time and the presence on the commission of successive under secretaries of public works and notably at the present time of mr now sir w e garston has proved a valuable source of strength the most vital appointment under the commission is of course that of the architect who surveys the monuments recommends such repairs as are necessary or desirable and personally superintends their execution since the creation of the special department bureau special of the commission which was separated at the beginning of eighteen ninety from the bureau technique of the wax mr max hertz hon f s a has been the architect in charge of the work of the commission and it is bare justice to say that to his industry and considerable technical and archaeological attainments much of the present improved manner of supervising and preserving the monuments is undoubtedly due hertz bay joins to technical training of an architect a familiarity with the history of erebart together with a genuine enthusiasm for his work his quote, catalogue of the arab museum end of quote, published this year in french but shortly to be reissued in an english translation published eighteen ninety six furnishes proofs of an extensive study of the periods of development of arab or saracenic art and of the literature arabic and european relating to this subject and the complete restorations he has made of a few of the smaller mosques are evidence of his insight into arab construction and decoration of his technical skill and of his scrupulous fidelity to the original design on this vexed subject of restoration however i shall have something to say later but whatever may be thought of the principle it is impossible to doubt that in the appointment of hertz bay the commission has been exceptionally fortunate preservation it must never be forgotten that the prime duty of the commission is the preservation not the restoration of the monuments a fairly complete list of the monuments which on historical or artistic grounds ought to be preserved has been drawn up by subcommittee one and the first obligation laid upon the commission is to watch over the preservation of every monument in this list so far as my observation went its members are clearly alive to this obligation and have endeavoured to fulfil it as far as their limited funds permitted to enumerate the long catalogue of repairs from the establishing of the entire walls of a mosque to the removal of white wash or dirt from a carved inscription or a mosaic would extend these notes to an undue length the details may be read in the excellent annual reports of the commission which if they are scarcely as prompt in their appearance as they might be leave little to be desired in point of accuracy or completeness much more however remains to be done and many of the repairs already executed can only be regarded as temporary cheap makeshifts pending the possibility of more thorough works when finances permit the adequate and enduring preservation of the monuments is essentially a question of money the commission and its architect know what ought to be done but they cannot do it without an increased staff and a larger budget meanwhile there are two or three points to which the attention of the commission should i think be especially and immediately directed since they can be dealt with even on the present insufficient annual grant one in cases where a thorough repair would be too costly to be undertaken on the present budget there is a mode of preservation in a literary and artistic sense which ought to be invariably adopted when there is any risk of further immediate decay the great mosque of sultan hassan is an instance in point in such a case where many thousands of pounds would be required for substantial preservation the commission cannot at present entertain the plans which have been drawn up for so elaborate a work but what they can do is to prepare an exact record of the present state of the mosque to draw full architectural plans and elevations photograph every detail of ornament or inscription reproduce mosaics and other coloured decoration in the colours of the originals and generally to make it possible at any time to reproduce the entire mosque in its true proportions and exact details of ornament footnote this has been done in the case of sultan hassan in the sumptuous work le marquet de sultan hassan au caire par max hertz bay published by the commission eighteen ninety nine end of footnote 
to students of the history of arab art such a record would be invaluable whilst it would make the task of preservation possible even should want of funds postponed the work till the mosque had fallen into much more lamentable decay to prepare such records would necessitate an increase in the staff of the commission but if the memoirs were published with adequate historical introductions and explanations the sale would probably repay a large part of the expense at the same time these records should not of course be regarded as a substitute for actual preservation or as a reason for deferring necessary repairs they should be used merely as a safeguard against the total or partial obliteration of a monument by a sudden catastrophe which might happen any day to one of the minarets of sultan hassan not as a ground for refusing to avert the ruin two another and much simpler precaution should be taken in the case of the numerous small mosques of cairo which are more or less roofed in these have generally windows of open tracery or grill work and often a small opening in the centre over the court the central opening should be covered with glass to keep out the weather and the open windows should invariably be furnished with wire netting outside to exclude the birds which do much mischief in the interiors all covered in mosques require frequent inspection with this view and every cranny which could admit rain or birds should be carefully stopped three a more expensive but absolutely necessary step is the compulsory expropriation of the shops or booths which cling like limpets to the facades of many of the mosques the proprietors of these shops use the mosque behind as dustbins and throw their refuse and broken crockery through the windows the appearance of the mosque both inside and out is seriously impaired by these excrescences which narrow the street for example the souk and nahasin impede traffic and prevent the facades of the mosque being seen in their true proportion and effect in order to avoid the risk of any historical monument being overlooked and neglected it would be well if the commission were to divide cairo into a certain number of definite quarters and that the scheduled monuments in each quarter should be periodically visited by the sub-committee of inspection and the architect at least once a year the number of monuments in the list is so large that it might be impossible to arrange more than one or two inspections of each in every season such visits should be recorded with notes on the condition of each monument in a special book an important question is that of the private monuments whether mosques houses sebels vacalas or other buildings the government apparently has no power either to compel owners to maintain and preserve the historical buildings which they inhabit or let or to force them to sell the few mediaeval houses still standing in cairo are artistically more valuable than the mosque maintained by private walks or they form almost the sole remaining examples of the domestic style of arab art it is greatly to be wished that they could be bought under the control of the commission and if due compensation were made for ejectment or interference the owners would have little ground for complaint restoration the commission has not confined its labor strictly to preservation it has also undertaken the complete restoration of several monuments there is a well-founded prejudice in artistic and archaeological circles against restoration of any and every description but i believe that an examination of some of the recent restorations carried out by hertz bay would remove these natural and generally just apprehensions this architect's principle as he explained it to me appears sound and reasonable it is this no unique monument for example the mosque of ibn tullin or a monument belonging to an architectural period of which there are very few examples for example the fatimid mosques must on any account be restored preservation is the only possible treatment for such cases and nothing more must be done than is absolutely necessary for the stability of the building and its security from weather and other injury but when there are numerous mosques of the same period nearly resembling one another in style and often even in detail of ornament for example in the period of cape bay then a few may safely be selected for complete restoration at all points so as to present as nearly as possible their original appearance as when first opened for public worship hertz bay has given a few examples of his theory of restoration of mosques of a well-represented period they are not equally successful and it is evident from the latest specimens that experience has taught him much especially in regard to colour but i think the most rigid opponent of restoration would find very little to criticise in the careful and beautiful manner in which the little mosque of kadi abu Bekr ibn muzer in the bargawan has been restored to almost its original condition 
and whatever may be said about the tempering to which the mosque of el mayad was subjected under a former regime there is no doubt that the inscriptional frieze and the painted ceiling have been restored as perfectly and as scrupulously as skill and knowledge could attain i can assert from personal observation that nothing can exceed the care and precautions which are observed by the architect of the commission in order to make sure that he has really discovered the original design and colouring beneath centuries of dirt and whitewash or the pains he takes to reproduce them faithfully and i may here observe that the staff of the commission includes workers in metal and wood who are able to copy the design so accurately that it is almost impossible to distinguish them from the originals they are not yet successful in stained glass however this merit has the obvious drawback that unless great care is taken the details of the monuments for example the bronze bosses and plaques on doors or the wood and ivory carvings and inlaid work of doors and minbars may be falsified in recent restorations of arabic inscriptions the inscription itself is made to tell the date of its restoration but many small details of ornament are not distinguished at all from the original work whose gaps they supply this defect calls for immediate correction before the distinction is forgotten by the restorers themselves every plaque of metal or panel of wood or mosaic should bear an unmistakable distinguishing mark such as the date of restoration in arabic ciphers and detailed plans of all restored monuments should be preserved in the archives of the commission in which the new portion should be clearly distinguished by colour or shading if this rule is carefully observed i confess i can see nothing but advantage in the complete restoration of a limited number of mosques under the restrictions already mentioned when the work is executed with the skill and honesty which one observes in the case of the mosque of abu bekr ibn muzer there is no falsification but rather preservation in the most complete and satisfactory sense the beauty of these restored mosques seems to appeal to the eyes of the worshippers and there is no doubt that the mosque of el mayad has been far more frequented for prayer since its lawan was restored to something of its original beauty and richness of gold and colour this is a consideration to which the ministry of wax can hardly fail to attach considerable importance at the same time there is possibly some risk of the vital work of preservation being sometimes neglected in order that restorations which are naturally more interesting and effective to both the architect and the public should be carried out at present there are five mosques in course of restoration footnote all these are now completed into footnote viz those of zain ed din yarya near the musky gam el banat of asan buga in the darb es saada and of kagmas el e shaki besides el bayad and abu bekr ibn muzer which may be regarded as finished two of these mosques however are private walks and are being paid for by private persons still in my opinion enough restoration has been undertaken for the present and the chief attention of the commission should be directed for the next two or three years to a fresh and complete examination of all the monuments on their list with a view to their thorough preservation at all events the selection of a new mosque for a complete restoration should be a subject of anxious thought and should not be lightly undertaken restoration it must be remembered is costly and cannot judiciously be embarked upon so long as the funds of the commission are scarcely sufficient for preservation alone such my lord are the conclusions which suggested themselves to me after my inspection of the results of the commission's labours i have confined my remarks to cairo because i had no opportunity this year to examine the work that has been done in other towns of egypt in cairo as i have endeavoured to show the commission has done excellent work and has accomplished a great deal in face of inadequate funds and frequent obstruction and opposition the few suggestions and criticisms i have ventured to make are trifles in comparison with the quantity and generally high quality of the work of preservation and restoration carried out under the authority of the commission in my opinion the wax and the public works together should raise the annual budget of the commission to ten thousand pounds and then leave it to manage its own affairs as it is fully competent to do were it possible to create a ministry of fine arts which should include the archaeological directorate as well as the commission the giza as well as the arab museum this would probably be the most satisfactory course but the consideration of so thorough a reconstruction is beyond the scope of the report which your lordship has asked me to submit End of quote. 
to these remarks i have nothing to add all subsequent observation has confirmed the belief that the commission has done and is still doing a noble work for the monuments of cairo the passages omitted in the preceding extracts related to the financial status of the commission and the result of these recommendations as thus stated in lord cromer's covering report which also strongly supported the various suggestions offered for the better protection of the monuments and added some excellent provisions for the inclusion of the coptic churches in the field of operation of the commission lord cromer wrote quote, i have for long been well aware that the grants heretofore obtained from the walk administration were inadequate and that if greater activity was to be displayed in this branch of the administration additional expenditure would have to be incurred indeed one of the main objects i had in view in consulting mr stanley lane pool was to obtain suggestions from him as to the best method of spending more money supposing it to be available on receipt of mr stanley lane pool's report i placed myself in communication with the authorities of the financial and public works department with the result that a proposal was made to the commissioners of the public debt that they should grant a sum of twenty thousand pounds from the reserve fund at their disposal to be spent under the direction of the preservation committee during the years eighteen ninety six and eighteen ninety seven i am glad to say that this proposal was received by the commissioners in a very friendly spirit the money has been granted and the details of their expenditure and now alone remain to be settled i should add that in addition to twenty thousand pounds which is to be spent exclusively on works of different sorts the egyptian government has consented to give a permanent grant of one thousand pounds a year from the treasury in order to provide for the additional staff which will without doubt be required End of quote. the effects of this munificent addition to the funds placed at the disposal of the commission have been far-reaching the list of monuments that have benefited by the timely succor is too long to quote but the repairs effected in the great mosque of el maridani at a cost of four thousand pounds must be specially mentioned it was a work greatly needed and the money has been well spent every visitor to cairo is struck by the difference in the condition of the mosques since the commission took them under its charge many which seemed doomed are now safe others have their lives at least prolonged and no fragment of arab arts no vestige of the city wall no piece of carving or inscription is beneath the watchful care of the commission when a monument cannot be preserved such fragments of ornament or inscriptions as remain are carefully gathered and transported to the arab museum which itself is evidence of the good work that has been done in the past twenty years these years have it indeed been fruitful in serious labor to repair the injury which natural decay and unnatural confiscation neglect and vandalism have worked in the past upon the relics of mediaeval cairo End of section nineteen section twenty of the story of cairo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sonia the story of cairo by stanley lane pool section twenty appendix rulers and monuments of cairo one arab period a d six hundred forty to eight hundred sixty eight a h twenty to two hundred fifty four rulers ninety eight governors under caliphs of damascus and baghdad built mosque of amr in a h twenty one town of the tent el fustat in a h twenty one first nilometer at er roda in a h ninety eight Fobur el Askar in A H one hundred thirty three second nilometer at Er Roda in A H two hundred forty seven two Turkish period House of Trulun A D eight hundred sixty eight A H two hundred fifty four Ruler Ahmad ibn Trulun built Fobur el Katai in A H two hundred fifty six palaces of el katai in a h two hundred fifty six following maristan in a h two hundred fifty nine mosque of ibn tulun in a h two hundred sixty three to two hundred sixty five a d eight hundred eighty three a h two hundred seventy ruler humara weibn ahmad built palaces of el katai 
in AH 270 following. AD 895, AH 282. Ruler, Geish Ibn Humaraway. AD 896, AH 283. Ruler, Harun Ibn Humaraway. AD 904, AH 292. Ruler, Sheban Ibn Ahmad Ibn Tulun. Caliphs Governors. A.D. 905-934, A.H. 292 to 323. Rulers, 13 governors. House of El Irshid. A.D. 934, A.H. 323. Ruler, Muhammad El Irshid. Built, palace in Kafur's garden and at Roda. A.D. 946. A.H. 334. Ruler, Abu Qasim Ungur ibn al -Ikhshid. Built, Maristan at Fustat. In A.H. 346. A.D. 960. A.H. 349. Ruler, Abu Hassan Ali ibn al -Ikhshid. Built, Mosque of El Giza. In A.H. 350. A.D. 966. A.H. 355. Ruler, Abul Miskafur. A.D. 968. A.H. 358. Ruler, Abul Fawaris Ahmad ibn Ali. 3. Fatimid period. A.D. 969. A.H. 358. Ruler, El Moiz. Built, Foundation of El Kahira in AH 358. Great East Palace, etc. in AH 358. Mosque El Ajar in AH 359. AD 975. AH 365. Ruler El Aziz. Built West Palace, etc. Mosque of El Hakim in AH 380 to 403. AD 996, AH 386. Ruler El Hakim built Mosque of Roshida in AH 393 to 395. Mosque of El Mox. AD 1021, AH 411. Ruler El Zahir. AD 1036, A.H. 427. Ruler El-Mustansir built Mosque El-Guyushi in A.H. 478. Bab El-Nasr, Bab El-Futu, Second Wall, Bab Zuela in A.H. 480 to 484. Mosque of Nilometer in A.H. 485. A.D. 1094. A.H. 487. Ruler El Mustali. A.D. 1101. A.H. 495. Ruler El Amir. Built Mosque El Akmar. In A.H. 519. Several Mesgids. Yanis, Kafuri, Babel Khaukha. Mirabs of Ajar and Seyida Rukaya. A.D. 1131. A.H. 524. Ruler El Hafiz. A.D. 1149. A.H. 544. Ruler El Zafir. Built Mosque El Afhar in A.H. 543. A.D. 1154. A.H. 549. Ruler El Faiz. A.D. 1160. A.H. 555. Ruler El Adid. Built Mosque of Es Sali Talai. In A.H. 555. 4. House of Saladin. A.D. 1169. A.H. 565. Ruler En Nasir Salahedin Saladin Ibn Ayub. Built Mosque of Negmedin Ayub. 
in A.H. 566, College, Nasiria, in A.H. 566, College, Komhia, in A.H. 566, College, Kutbia, in A.H. 570, College, Ibn el Ashufi, in A.H. 570, College, Suyufia, in A.H. 572, Citadel and Third Wall begun in A.H. 572, Maristan, in A.H. 575, College El Fadilia, in A.H. 580, A.D. 1193, A.H. 589, Ruler El Aziz, son of Saladin, built Mosque of Ibn El Bena, in A.H. circa 591. College Ushkushia in A.H. 592. A.D. 1198. A.H. 595. Ruler El Mansur ibn El Asis. Built College Rasnavia. A.D. 1200. A.H. 596. Ruler El Adil Seyfedin. Built College Adilia. College Sherifia. In A.H. 612. A.D. 1218. A.H. 615. Ruler El Kamil ibn El Adil. Restoration of Mosque of Shafi. In A.H. 607. Built College Kamilia. In A.H. 622. College Fahria. In A.H. 622. Zavia Kasri. In A.H. circa 633. Mosque Ibn Nashehi. In A.H. circa 633. A.D. 1238. A.H. 635. Ruler El Adil II. Ibn El Kamil. Built College Saira Mia. In A.H. circa 636. College Faizia. In A.H. 636. A.D. 1240, A.H. 637. Ruler Es-Sali Ayub ibn Kamil, built College Salihia, in A.H. 639. Mosque, etc. of El-Roda, A.D. 1249, A.H. 647. Ruler El-Muassam Turansha ibn Es-Sali, built Zawiya Khadam, in A.H. 647. 5. Turkish Mamluks. A.D. 1250. A.H. 648. Ruler Queen Shager Eddur. Built Tomb of Es Sali. In A.H. 648. A.D. 1250. A.H. 648. Ruler El Mois Aybek. Built College Kutbia. In A.H. 650. College Sahibia. In A.H. 654. A.D. 1257. A.H. 655. Ruler El Mansur Ali ibn Ayrek. A.D. 1259. A.H. 657. Ruler El Muzaffar Kutus. A.D. 1260. A.H. 658. Ruler El Zahir Babas. Built College Zahiria in A.H. 660. Meshet El Hosseini in A.H. 662. College Megdia in A.H. 663. Mosque El Afram in A.H. 663. Mosque El Zahir in A.H. 665. College Muheddibia, College Farikania in A.H. 676. A.D. 1277, A.H. 676, Ruler Es-Said Baraka ibn Bebas, A.D. 1279, A.H. 678, Ruler El-Adil Selamish ibn Bebas, A.D. 1279, A.H. 679, Ruler El-Mansur Kalaun, Built College Mansuria and Maristan Kalaun, 
in AH 684. Zawiya el Gemisi in AH 682. Zawiya el Gabari in AH 687. Zawiya el Halawi in AH 683. Convent el Bunduk Daria in AH 688. AD 1290. A. H. 689. Ruler El Ashraf Khalil ibn Kalaun. Built gate from Akka. A. D. 1293. A. H. 693. Ruler En Nasir Muhammad ibn Kalaun. A. D. 1294. A. H. 694. Ruler El Adil Kebbura. A. D. 1296. A. H. 696. Ruler El Mansur Lagin. Restoration of Mosque of Ibn Tulun. In A. H. 696. Built College Tafagia. In A. H. circa 698. College Manguti Nuria. In A. H. 698. A. D. 1298. A. H. 698. Ruler N. Nasir, Second Reign. Built College, Nasiria, in A.H. 699 to 703. College, Karasun Kuria, in A.H. 700. College, Gemalia, in A.H. 703. Restoration of Hakim, Ajar, Talai, in A.H. 703 to 704. Mosque of Taibars, in 707. A.D. 1308. A.H. 708. Ruler El Muzaffar Baybars Gashnekir. Built Convent of Baybars. In A.H. 706 to 709. A.D. 1309. A.H. 709. Ruler En Nasir, Third Reign. Built College Taibarsia. In A.H. 709. Zawiya of El Himsi. In A.H. 709. Mosque of El Gaki. In A.H. 713. Citadel Palace Aqueduct. In A.H. 713. College Saidia. In A.H. 715. Convent of Arslan. In A.H. circa 717. Mosque of Citadel. In A.H. 718. Mosque of Emir Hussein. In A.H. 719. College Al-Melikia. In A.H. 719. College Gawalia. In A.H. 723. Tomb of Al Dutegin. In A.H. 724. College Mimandaria. In A.H. 725. College Buktumuria. In A.H. 726. Mosque of El Khazani. In A.H. 729. Mosque of Almas. In A.H. 730. Mosque of El Barkia. In A.H. 730. Mosque of Kusun. In A.H. 730. Mosque of Saruga. In A.H. circa 730. College Akburavia. In A.H. 734. Tomb of Tashtimur. In A.H. 734. Palace of Beshtak. In A.H. circa 735. Convent of Kuzun. In A.H. 736. Convent at Syriacus. In A.H. 736. Mosque of Beshtak. In A.H. 736. Mosque of Aydemir. In A.H. 737. Mosque of et Turkmani. In A.H. 738. Mosque of El Maridani in A.H. 740. Mosque of Sita Miska in A.H. 740. Mosque of Ibn Razi in A.H. 741. A.D. 1341. A.H. 741. Ruler El Mansur Abu Bakr, son of An Nasir. A.D. 1341. A.H. 742. Ruler El Ashraf Kubuk, son of An Nasir. A.D. 1342, A.H. 742. Ruler En Nasir Ahmad, 
son of an nasir a d 1342 a h 743 ruler as sali ismail son of an nasir built mosque of at tawashi in a h 745 a d 1345 a h 746 ruler el kamil shaban son of an nasir built mosque of ibn at tabakh in a h 746 a d 1346 a h 747 ruler el muzaffar Haghi, son of an nasir built mosque of kuguk in a h 747 AD 1347 AH 748 Ruler and Nasir Hassan, son of An Nasir, built Mosque of Aksunkur in AH 747, Mosque of El Ismaili in AH 748, Mosque of Kutlubua in AH 748, Mosque of El Asyuti in a h circa seven hundred forty nine convent of um anuk in a h circa seven hundred forty nine convent of al gibura in a h circa seven hundred fifty mosque of mangak in a h seven hundred fifty mosque of shehu in a h seven hundred fifty college of el haruba in a h seven hundred fifty cistern of lagin in a h seven hundred fifty College Kaisarania in AH seven hundred fifty one College Salira in AH seven hundred fifty one A D thirteen fifty one AH seven hundred fifty two Ruler as Sali Sali ibn Nasir AD thirteen fifty four AH seven hundred fifty five Ruler Hassan second reign built convent of Sheikhu in AH 756 College Farisia in AH 756 College Sarid Mishia in AH 756 College Sultan Hassan in AH 757 following College Bediria in AH 758 College Higazia in AH 761 College Beshiria in AH 761 College Sabikia in AH 763. AD 1361, AH 762. Ruler El Mansur Muhammad, grandson of An Nasir. AD 1363, AH 764. Ruler El Ashraf Shaban, grandson of An Nasir, built tomb of Tulbia in AH 765. Mosque of Shaban in a h seven hundred seventy one college bubekria asunbua in a h seven hundred seventy two college of gaya yusufi in a h seven hundred seventy five college of bakria in a h circa seven hundred seventy five a d thirteen seventy six a h seven hundred seventy eight ruler el mansur ali ibn shaban built college of ibn iram in AH 782. AD 1381, AH 783. Ruler as Sali Hagi ibn Shaban, deposed 1382, restored 1389 to 90, built tomb of Um Sali in AH 783. 6. Circassian Mamluks. AD 1382, AH 784. Ruler as Zahir Barkuk interrupted 791 to 792 by Hagi, built tomb of Anas in AH 783, College of Aitmish in AH 785, College of Barkuk in AH 788, Mosque of Zainedin in AH 790, College of Inal Ustadar in AH 795, College of Mahmudiya in AH 797, College of Mukbil Zimamiya in AH 797, College of Ibn Rorab in AH 798. AD 1399, AH 
A H eight hundred one. Ruler N Nasir Farak Ibn Barkuk built Mosque of Ibn Abdesair in A H eight hundred three. College of Sudun in A H eight hundred four. College of Mahali in A H circa eight hundred six. A D fourteen o five. A H eight hundred eight. Ruler El Mansur Abdel Aziz Ibn Barkuk built convent and tomb of Barkuk and Farak and College of Farak in A H eight hundred three to eight hundred thirteen. A D fourteen o five. A H eight hundred nine. Ruler Farak second reign built College of Gemal Eddin in A H eight hundred eleven. Mosque of Hosh Citadel in A H eight hundred twelve. A D fourteen twelve. A H eight hundred fifteen. Ruler El Mustain, Caliph, built Mosque of Birket er Ragdi in A H eight hundred fourteen. A D fourteen twelve. A H eight hundred fifteen. Ruler El Muayat Sheikh, built Mosque of Ed Diva Citadel in A H eight hundred fifteen. Mosque of El Basiti in A H eight hundred seventeen, Mosque of El Hanafi in A H eight hundred seventeen, Mosque of Es Zahid in A H eight hundred eighteen, Maristan of El Muayat in A H eight hundred eighteen, Mosque of El Muayat in A H eight hundred nineteen to eight hundred twenty three, College of Abdel Rani in A H eight hundred twenty one. Mosque of El Fahri in A H eight hundred twenty one, College of Kadi Abdel Basid in A H eight hundred twenty three, A D fourteen twenty one, A H eight hundred twenty four, Ruler El Muzaffar Ahmad Ibn Sheikh, A D fourteen twenty one, A H eight hundred twenty four, Ruler Es Zahir Tatar. A.D. 1421, A.H. 824. Ruler Es Sali Muhammad ibn Tatar. A.D. 1422, A.H. 825. Ruler El Ashraf Bash Bay. Built College of Bash Bay in A.H. 827. Mosque of Ghani Bek in A.H. 830. College of Fairus. In A H eight hundred thirty, convent and tomb of Bas Bay. In A H eight hundred thirty five, A D fourteen thirty eight, A H eight hundred forty two, ruler El Aziz Yusuf ibn Bas Bay. A D fourteen thirty eight, A H eight hundred forty two, ruler El Zahir Gakmak, built college of Tari Berdi. In A H eight hundred forty four. Mosque of Kani Bay in A H eight hundred forty five, A D fourteen fifty three, A H eight hundred fifty seven, Ruler El Mansur Othman ibn Gakmak, built mosque and tomb Kadi Yahia in A H eight hundred forty eight to eight hundred fifty, Mosque of Gakmak in A H eight hundred fifty three, A D fourteen fifty three, A H eight hundred fifty seven. Ruler El Ashraf Inal built college, convent, tomb of Inal in A H eight hundred fifty five to eight hundred sixty. A D fourteen sixty one A H eight hundred sixty five. Ruler El Muayat Ahmad ibn Inal. A D fourteen sixty one A H eight hundred sixty five. Ruler El Zahir Khushkadam built tomb of Ghani Bek. In A H eight hundred sixty nine, Mosque of Nur Eddin in A H eight hundred seventy, Mosque of Sudun in A H circa eight hundred seventy, College of Karnim in A H circa eight hundred seventy, A D fourteen sixty seven, A H eight hundred seventy two, Ruler as Zahir Yelbay, A D fourteen sixty seven, A H eight hundred seventy two, Ruler as Zahir. Timur Bura. A.D. 1468, A.H. 873. Ruler El Ashraf, Kaid Bey. 
Built Mosque of Timrath in AH 876. Mosque of Esbek ibn Tutush in AH 880. Palace of Yeshbek in AH 880. Kaid Bey's College and Tomb in AH 879. Kaid Bey's College in Town in AH 880. Kaid Bey's Wekala by Aja in AH 882. Kaid Bey's Sebil in AH 884. Kaid Bey's Wekala Baben Nasser in AH 885. Kaid Bey's Wekala Surugia in AH circa 885. Kaid Bey's Fadawiya Kupola in AH circa 886. Kaid Bey's Palace and Mekan in AH 890. Kaid Bey's Restoration of South Gates in AH 890. Kaid Bey's College at El Roda in AH 896. Mosque of Ghanim in AH 883. College of Abu Bakr ibn Mujir in AH 885. Mosque of Kagmas in AH 886. College of Esbek el Yusufi in AH 900. AD 1496, AH 901. Ruler N. Nasir Muhammad ibn Qaid Bey. Built Palace of Mamai Beit al Qadi in AH 901. AD 1498, AH 904. Ruler Ez Zahir Khonsu. Built Tomb of Khonsu in AH 904. AD 1500, AH 905. Ruler El Ashraf Ganbalat, A.D. 1501, A.H. 906. Ruler El Adil Tuman Bey, A.D. 1501, A.H. 906. Ruler El Ashraf Khonsu El Rui built Tomb El Adil Tuman Bey in A.H. 906. Mosque of Kherbek in A.H. 908. College Kani Bek Emir Akho in AH 908. College of El Rui in AH 909. Two Mosque of El Rui in AH 909. Tomb of Sudun in AH circa 910. College of Kani Bek Kara in AH 911. Restoration of Aqueduct to Citadel in AH 911. AD 1516. A.H. 922. Ruler El Ashraf Tumon Bey. A.D. 1517. A.H. 922. Othmanli Conquest of Egypt. End of section 20. End of the story of Cairo by Stanley Lane Poole.